Welcome back to the blazing heat here in Miami. It's the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. It's the seconds to last day, and it's really heating up also in the standings right now, Tanya. Absolutely, and we can feel all the excitement. Look at this, we're opening up to a live audience for the first time. They're warming up with some fun chess at the back, but it's all eyes on Magnus Carlsen taking on world number four, the youngest ever 2800 player, 19-year-old Ali Reza Firuja. Will we see a devastating attack by Ali Reza or will Magnus outclass him in a strategic fight? So much action coming up. Sorry, let's find out from our audience what they think about this. Let's go. Hey guys, how's it going? Good. All right, one. He took his boot back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one big question: Magnus, Ali Reza, take your pick. Oh, I'm going with Ali Reza today. Oh, Magnus. <laughs> Magnus. Magnus. What about you? Magnus or Ali Reza? Magnus. <laughs> there we have it. It's hard to bet against Magnus. Here we go. The FTX Crypto Cup. This is the type of hustle move. Checkmates. Checkmate, Checkmate incoming. Checkmate free. <laughs> their preparation, their new ideas. This must be a new idea. Their teamwork, their fans. I mean, uh, it's incredible. Verusia, this is why he's so good. He's full of tricks. Unbelievable how he finds that move. We've got to call that prank style. This is a dude that moves and it directs. Wow, he's going straight for the kill. He is out to win this tournament. And what a start. Incredible day, Jess. are blue over the Eden Rock Hotel this uh, Saturday and for the first time ever spectators are entering the arena in Miami for an online chess event and they are in for an incredible drama it's Magnus Carlsen against the two teenagers and uh, it's gonna be two very exciting final two days of chess in the FDX Crypto Cup with the spectators playing chess and enjoying the chess. We're here to take you through all the moves, all the drama. As always, Grandmaster David Howell, Grandmaster Simon Williams, and International Master Ivan Kauska. And David, spectators inside the arena, meters away from the players. How will this be different for the players? Yeah, it definitely adds an extra dimension. Some of the players will be inspired by it. A lot of the players, they are showmen. They want to you know, entertain. They want to create fire on the board. They want to impress uh, all the fans out there in the world. And uh, I think this will make them I'm extra aware of how uh, kind of tense everything is, how exciting everything is, and uh, yeah, I'm hoping that the players they do put on a show for those guys that are watching. Absolutely, and it's so tense in the tournament, on the standings as well. Simon Magnus Carlsen and the two teenagers fighting to win the tournament. What do you expect from the two final days? Um, it's going to be great, isn't it? I mean, we've got some really cool matchups today. Um, there's one which just stands out, and that is uh, Faruja versus Carlsen. Um, Faruja, incredible talent, incredible player. Magnus Carlsen, well, he doesn't need an instruction, does he? So that's going to be a great match. And obviously, Prague as well. Prague's playing Magnus tomorrow. So what, what a matchup that is. And like you say, you've got the crowd there in Miami. You know, it's a, this is the way chess should be played, I think, with a crowd cheering, shouting. Know. You know, it should be like that, you know, passionate. Yeah, it's got to be, we want to see that emotion. So, yeah, yeah so it's going to be great, great weekend. Yeah. But they have to, I mean, even if the players have headsets, the, the spectators, they will have to keep quite quiet when uh, watching. <laughs> but, you know, being inside a chess event, watching it live, it's very intense, right, Ivanka? It is super intense, especially a venue such as this one with the lights, the mirrors, and all that smoke. And to see the players, you know, fast and furious, running free with their emotion. And uh, there we can see the audience gathered. Everyone's so super excited. It'd be so cool, though, if they could listen to us with some headphones. Maybe they can. That's a good idea. The players. Uh fighting to win the tournament. Well, it's a prize fund of $210,000 up for grab, you guys. And in addition, $100,000 worth of Bitcoins. Well, we started with $100,000 worth of Bitcoins on day one, but the Bitcoin, wow, it's uh, fallen a lot and the players will be hoping it starts rising within the next 24 hours. As always, 
This is a seven-day tournament. We have enter entered the two final days in an eight-player round robin. All players face each other in matches consisting of four rapid games, and the winner in a match gets three points. If they are tied after the four rapid games, straight to tie breaks, where the winner takes two points and the loser one point. And day five yesterday, the most exciting day so far. We had technical issues and we had huge problems on the board for both Magnus Carlsen and Pragnananda. Magnus, he's so brave. I would be terrified. I think I wouldn't have even have considered this uh, option. I would just trade it off the rooks and try to curl up into a ball and beg for the draw. But Magnus, he's a far more uh, aggressive, courageous player than most. Magnus, well, can't look his face. Look at his face. I think he might have just. Has he blundered? I think he wanted to go back with his knight and force the draw in the center of the board, but that doesn't work. Magnus, he's reacted. I think he has blundered. He's just, he rushed it. Magnus resigns, about to lose another piece. And what a turnaround. One blunder and Duda took advantage. And uh, no, Ooh. we do see no. aggression. Hello, <laughs> hello. <laughs> that is the kind of move that I like to see. Yeah. Oh, oh, whoa, what's happening on the bar? Uh, Magnus has just gone for it, but I don't know if this is the right moment. He's trying to break yeah. open this line, which is understandable, but um, we did mention the bishop is sitting on this square and it can easily, there we go, get rid of the white knight. Duda has captured. And as you mentioned, Simon, suddenly the placement of white's king, it was safe as anything just one move ago, but suddenly black can crack open the center. We might see the game finish very quickly. Oh. Yeah, threaten, uh, threatening checkmate this last move from Duda. Black's queen just wants to come down and take the white knight. Look at Black's bishop, look at Black's queen. They're both teamed up against that piece. You can't defend it. Huge drama, not only in this match, you guys. It's huge drama in the FDX Crypto Cup. Magnus Carlsen loses the second game in a row to young Christoph Duda. Look at Duda shaking his head. He won the first two games today. He had it all in his pocket. But Magnus winning two games in a row now. It's going to be tie breaks, you guys. Oh my gosh, it's so hard to call this game. Anything could happen. The, look at the bar, Kaya. <laughs> one on one. <laughs> Black king running. But the, the king is safe as houses. Looks safe. After a check first, Magnus looks away. He's just blundered his house. Oh, no. Everything's fallen. Brilliant. Kaya, you're going to reach the end game. Checkmate's going to come. Well done, Duda. White hanging on. Oh, and he oh, just drops a bishop. Dropped his bishop. He's a blunder. Put on a loose square. He just left his bishop on priest. <gasps> a free piece for Duda. And this one is going to be decided. Magnus blundering again. Duda takes it. He holds his nerve. A handshake. It's over. Young Christoph Duda wins the match. Three matches yesterday was finished in only three games. A big one for Ali Reza Fruja taking all three points against Hans Niemann. Pragnananda losing his match against Lee Emle. Zero points for Prag and Ishgiri winning another match. Three points for him against Levon Aronian. But Magnus Carlsen, he lost the first two games against Jan Christoph Duda. A massive comeback, winning two games to take it to blitz tiebreaks by Jan Christoph Duda. He was the sharpest. He won both blitz games and he took two points, one point for Magnus Carlsen. That means Magnus Carlsen is still now in the lead and now in sole lead, 13 points. One point ahead of Pragnananda and now only two points ahead of Ali Reza, Verusha and David. It's been all about Magnus and Prag the whole tournament. Now it's Magnus one point ahead of Prag. What is it about for these two now coming from losses this weekend? Yeah, it's just about recovery. It's about getting back in that mindset. It's the final sprint now before the, before the finishing line. And who has the most energy left? Magnus yesterday getting the one point, attaining that lead, but the lead should have been bigger, yeah. let's be honest. And Prague, it was a difficult day, losing in three. Uh, it's just about whether he can bounce back. It's going to be difficult. We've seen Prague in this situation before. He needs to up that gear. He needs yeah. to find an extra level. Uh, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be a race till the end with these two, but also with Faruja. Exactly. And it's going to be a tough day today as well for Prague. Let's take a look at the matchups on day six, because Prague Nananda today playing Jan Christoph Duda, who no beat Magnus Carlsen yesterday in his match. Match. Anish Giri, he takes on Liam Le. It's also going to be a match between Hans Niemann and Levon Aronian, the two Americans on home soil. A prestigious one. We're going to keep the closest eye on this one. Ali Reza Fruja, 19 year old, two points behind Magnus Carlsen. 
on the standings, what do you expect? Who is the favourite, David? <laughs> it's so hard to call. Um, on general form, you would say Magnus Ferruja, before this tournament at least, had been inactive, not playing his best chess. But the last few days, Ferruja has been on fire. And whenever these two meet, it's always so close. Ferruja, with the white pieces, one of the best players in the world. Um, it's just about whether Magnus can neutralise him there and maybe take advantage. Uh, I'm not even sure. I'm not going to make any prediction. I just can't wait to see the games on all the action. But speaking of that, uh, David, we do have stats. Alireza Ferruja in the tournament. He's on a 78% score with the white pieces. No one has been able to beat him with the white pieces. Explain to us, how big is this stat? That is massive. We should mention that the other players, they have a bigger pool of games. Uh, the average is therefore lower, but anything over 60% with white is just phenomenal, especially at this level where he's playing world-class players. They're all so hard to beat, so solid. 77% uh, for Ferruja is big, and Carlsen has to have that in his mind. He has to uh, play solid with black. He has to just try to survive those games where Ferruja has the white pieces. And of course, Magnus Carlsen, he is an expert with the black pieces as well, scoring almost six. 65% with the black pieces, but it is maybe the black games for him that will be the big challenge. Alirez are so strong with the white. What is the challenge for Magnus in this match? Um, the challenge is, I feel, to hold with black. And then uh, we saw in the stats there, actually, Ferruja's score with black is one of the lowest out of the eight. He's in seventh place there. So for Magnus, it's clear um, when Ferruja's white, just hold tight, play solid when Ferruja's black, then go for him. That's uh, the strategy, I feel. Absolutely. Now, Magnus Carlsen, as you all know, he has announced he will not defend his World Chess Championship title. The question is, would he have done it if Ali Reza Ferruja had won the candidates? Magnus Carlsen said before the candidates tournament that he would like to play a World Championship match against you. But he was not sure if he wanted to play against anyone else. We now know he didn't want to play Jan again. But how do you feel about Magnus saying that you are the one who is worthy? Yes, um, I think when we play, it's always a very special game. Uh, in general, always uh, some interesting game happens in general. So that's very interesting for both of us. And uh, yeah, I think the fact that he didn't want to play against Jan was also a bit understandable. So. For instance, if you want to beat Jan in a match, you have to grind for eight hours, nine hours each game. So, and that's that really takes a lot of energy, and it's very understandable. But uh, yeah, that's his decision, and everybody should respect that. Magnus Carlsen obviously has a lot of respect for Ali Reza Ferruja, and today it is those two up against each other inside the Eden Rock Hotel with spectators on site for the very first time. Tanya, will it be a full house of spectators today? Kaya, it is a full house of spectators today. We are ringside and it's opened up to live audience for the first time. We're waiting for the players to walk in. You can feel the tension in here. The spectators have had a warm up with some banter blitz, chess on the beat. Let's check in with them and find out how they're feeling about being here and rooting for their favorite players, guys. Hey. Hello. Where are you from? I'm from Orlando. And what's it like to be here? I'm very excited. I brought my whole family. My son, he's six, and he lost just my wife. We're very excited to be here. Are you rooting for someone special? Magnus, of course. Magnus has got a fan. All right, let's 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 see what these guys have to say. Hey, guys. Hey. Hi, this is Tejas. Hi, Tejas. And tell us, how's it been in Miami so far? It's been amazing. The organization has been amazing. Feels like chess is going eSport, and it feels great to be here. All right, and who are you rooting for today? Heart says Prague. Mine says Carlson. <laughs> Hard says Prague, mind says Carlson. I love it, Kaya. It's going to be a fun day. Back to you guys. Loving it. And Tanya, a big happy birthday from all of us here in the studio to you. We hope you get a fun day in Miami. <laughs> Thank you so much. I couldn't be I couldn't imagine celebrating anywhere else. <laughs> Amazing. It's gonna be a fun day. The great Tanya Saktev, it's her birthday today. So on Twitter, send her your love and happy birthday. Use hashtag chess champs. Alright, it's getting close, you guys. Day six, round six for all players in the FDX Crypto Cup. Magnus Carlson against Ali Reza Fruja. Let's take a look at their head-to-head -head scores. They are the only two players in the Meltwater Champions Chess Store with a rating above. 2800 is this simon the two best players in the world right now in online rapid chess 
Um, well, I reckon at the quicker time limits, uh, there's certainly two of the better players. I mean, Magnus is number one. Uh, Ferruja is, well, I mean, a bullet chess, one of the best, certainly. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be so exciting. We saw Ferruja earlier on when he was playing a niche in that playoff Armageddon game, just how quick he is. He's phenomenally quick. And that's, you know, if we get to a playoff situation, I, I might even put him as favourite against Magnus. And I probably wouldn't do that with any other player in the world. Oh. So, yeah. And Magnus is arriving. Alireza Ferrucha, he is not still by his computer. We're not used to seeing that. Magnus Carlsen, the first one to arrive in his match. We did see some other players ready for this crucial day six and looking around Magnus noticing the spectators who are present in the arena Magnus he will start out with the black pieces today what kind of an opening should we expect uh, David from Ali Reza uh, Ali Reza he tends to open with his king's pawn uh, with, his, with his king's pawn against the very top players in the world he likes to kind of just get out of the opening transfer the battle to the middle game with as many pieces on the board as possible Magnus, remember, is a big endgame expert, so Ferruja will just be trying to keep pieces on, keeping tension, calculating, going for an attack at some point later. And uh, Magnus maybe has to just try to find some way to take the sting out of anything that Ferruja tries. Anything from that. And, uh, well, Magnus, he's ready for the weekend. It's him against the two teenagers. And let's hear if he stopped for a short comment before it all starts today. Ali Reza has exceptional score with white. Do you take that into consideration today? Oh, well, I didn't know that. Thank you. It's an all-American battle today, Levon. How do you feel about that? Oh, well, uh, I'm, you know, I'm excited to play chess every day because even though I'm playing badly, you know, there are still, uh, you know, there are still rounds to go. So I'm excited about that. Uh, have you paid any attention to the other games when you've been playing, for example, Hans, that have had his ups and downs during this tournament? Oh, no, I didn't really have time to look at the, at the other things. I, I have many events in a row and uh, I'm just more or less, uh, you know, trying uh, not, not to occupy my brain too much with chess. Good luck to you. It's uh, been a little up and down for Levon Aronian in the tournament as well today. Hans Niemann is his opponent. And we're going to follow game one. Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces against Ali Reza Ferruja, who just arrived at the arena. And uh, Magnus with a short comment there. He was not aware of uh, Ali Reza's <laughs> great score with the white pieces. Do you believe that? Uh, just a drip or two of <laughs> irony there, I think, from Magnus Carlsen. Um, they've played each other plenty of times. And when Ferruja made his big breakthrough online, it was actually in the Banter Blitz Cup during the pandemic. Um, and that was on Chess 24 and there Ferruja won nearly every game with white against the world champion. Um, so Magnus knows that this first game is key. It's all about how they start, especially when uh, Ferruja uh, does kick off with the white pieces and okay, some last minute preparation. Just yeah. calling the arbiter here. Ferruja. Calling the arbiter, Ferruja. He did win his match yesterday, Ivanka. Magnus lost his match. Who do you hold as a favorite in their match? As we see a smile on Magnus's face, something funny happening. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, well, I... Do you know what? I'm still going to say Magnus is going to edge it because Magnus is the king of comebacks. He's shown us time and time again that he's able to lose a match and just continue as if nothing else has happened. And so I think that he is the slight favourite. But Ferruja, I have to say, I did check the stats of last year's uh, Champions Chess Tour and he has a better score against Magnus on the, on the tour last season. Ah, interesting. Magnus Carlsen, he is uh, ready. What will be the first move from Ali Reza Ferruja? Talking to the arbiters, maybe something about the spectators. But here we go. Here we go. It is a King's Pawn opening as predicted, and Yvanka is going to be very happy with this one. It's the Karakhan defense. Yeah, I suspected something like this might happen. And, uh, well, Magnus is just uh, simply locking it down. You know, he's going to go for a solid game. I'm always very surprised if Magnus plays the Karakhan because I, I remember in his streams he kind of said well, it was not necessarily an opening that suits him that well. And uh, here we have the two knights defense and uh, oh, this oh. move I have never seen before. So now I, you've caught my attention, Magnus. What have you got up your sleeve? Do you want to know a secret, guys? Yep. Magnus was playing the Karakhan at the Olympiad 
And I think he wants to play this move. I think he had it prepared up his sleeve. Um, it's an idea of Jordan Van Forest, uh, one of his seconds, of course, during the World Championship match last year. And it does ask White the question, how are you going to uh, kind of move in the center? White is, uh, okay, Magnus, is he smiling there? Um, White cannot develop in the way that he wants to. White wants to throw pawns forward in the center. It's not possible. Magnus definitely laughing. He's just happy he got in the first surprise. And already <laughs> Verusha is thinking on move three, move four. Wow. Um, it's a weird move. I'm not sure it's a good move. I looked at it a bit myself a while ago. I think White has various ways to obtain an advantage, but they are not through normal means. Okay. And uh, one of White's best moves here is actually to move the White Queen, bring the White Queen out. Uh, Magnus really looking happy with himself. Yeah. Proud <laughs> of, uh, this Queen sortie. Um, yeah, don't try this at home, guys. Uh, the Black Queen shouldn't re really be developing this early. She might get kicked around a bit later. But uh, it's just the surprise effect, the psychological value here. But is it something Jordan has played before or is it a novelty for Magnus? Uh, Jordan has played it before. Um, okay. I checked this on the database myself a while ago. Um, I think Jordan has played this before in Blitz, in Rapid Chess as well. Uh, it's very much uh, in kind of a speed chess speciality. I think in a long game you wouldn't play this necessarily because uh, with best play, White obtains an advantage. But in Rapid Chess, it might cost Ferruja here, five, six minutes, mm. just to kind of get out of the opening in a situation he's happy with. I think this is the main idea behind the opening. Black now is able to achieve a very typical idea. Black's light squared bishop out on a nice square. And white knight cannot jump into the center. Neither of the white knights can jump into the middle of the board because actually the black queen covers some key squares. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I have to say, you know, as someone who played the Scandinavian a lot when I was younger and also the Karakhan now, this looks like a great hybrid. Um, white hasn't jumped forward and put pressure on Black's position. And if Black is just allowed to continue, just develop the knight, get the dark square bishop out, he's, well, he stands really, really well. Got yeah. the dream caro position. Yeah, Black will be very solid. It will be hard for White to create anything. I'm expecting Farouja at some point to start pushing some pawns uh, in the center. There we go. And yeah, Magnus is going to just put up this wall of pawns. He's going to say, okay, White can do what he wants on his first four ranks, but uh, stepping forward any further will be difficult. I don't like it. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> it's taste. I mean, it I is. think Yvanka, it's that Karakhan and Scandinavian yeah. experience is going to... Magnus is laughing to himself now. Yeah. Really surprising. I mean, we see this when he sits at home in regulars, yeah. but in the arena, I've never seen this. Public yeah. with dozens yeah. of people there in the, in the arena. Uh, oh, the spectators getting value guess, for their money. I'm mm. guessing maybe someone told him something very funny along the way mm. to the venue. Because, you know, I, you know, I had a very interesting chat with uh, his father, Henrik Carlsen, and he was saying that they actually tr make an effort and prepare to put Magnus in a good mood because Magnus in a good mood plays fantastic chess. Okay, so this is a good sign for this the Magnus good, fans. I think so. It uh -huh. means he's relaxed, he's not tense, and uh, he's just going to be enjoying himself. Now, uh, here we have uh, Ali Reza. He's actually gone hunting the light square bishop. He wants to trade a knight for the bishop. And uh, normally, black isn't that bothered, to be honest. Yes, you know, white will get the bishop pair, but instead, the focus will be on just developing the pieces and later on in the game, putting pressure on the semi-open line, uh, the D line. Yeah, I can tell in your voice, Ivanka, you love this for Black. Yeah, and I also I, I found his humour a bit contagious because I just started laughing as well, just because he was laughing. We should mention, though, there is a big trend that when Magnus starts laughing, he ends up blundering or losing games. Uh, and also, when Magnus has the Karakhan, as you mentioned, um, his score is actually not great. Mm. Uh, it's far uh, kind of inferior to his score in the E4, E5 types of openings and in the Sicilian defence. Magnus has lost some key games. His unbeaten streak against Duda uh, ended when he played the Karakhan in the Olympiad. He drew with Black uh, against a lower-rated player with the Karakhan defence. I remember several losses, actually, for Magnus uh, throughout the tour and other events. So he tends to obtain a decent position here. It's solid enough, but uh, does it suit his style? And Simon, you mentioned you'd prefer white. Why is that? Um, well, I certainly prefer white a couple of moves ago, um, just because I was looking at black's development. I mean, look at black's king. Uh, it's going to take black three moves to get castled. Um, you've got a knight and the bishop in the way. You don't want to castle queenside in these positions. I, I wouldn't have thought. 
Uh, and I, you know, for me, with the White King Castle, that's like a bit of a red rag. It's like, OK, uh, I would have been very tempted to push the B-pawn up two squares earlier on, something like this, you know, play, play something a bit more aggressive to try and take, a, take advantage of the fact that black is very badly developed. Mm -hmm. um, now, though, after knight h4, I have to say, uh, I, I don't think black has any problems. Mm -hmm. um, Black's going to get rid of this so-called bad light square bishop. We saw this was a theme yesterday. If that bishop was back on its um, original square, it'd be a tremendously bad piece because it's caged in. But now you're going to get rid of that. Um, so I think, you know, I'm wondering if white's going to try pushing Freddy the F-pawn, but black can stop that idea immediately by attacking the knight that's just moved. But yeah, I mean, I have to say now it looks fine to me. Black's got the typical Karakhan set up, and if you're playing the Karakhan, you, you've got to be happy with this position. Uh, I just think maybe white earlier on could have done something a little bit more aggressive, potentially. Yeah. And uh, this is an interesting uh, bishop move from Magnus Carlsen because the idea that you mentioned, Simon, of pushing the f-pawn just to kind of destabilize, harass the light square bishop, it is a common theme. And uh, often, where you can, you kind of want to develop your knight to the e7 square just to control that uh, f5 square mm -hmm. much more. Yeah, black is rock solid and it's going to be hard to achieve this push. It's going to be extremely hard to achieve this push. Therefore, white maybe has to slow down the pace of the game and just maneuver. And yeah, this pawn push is very committal. I remember Mikhail Tal doing this uh, a few times as white and getting really dodgy positions, but making it work. Instead, Ferruja goes with maybe the more traditional way of pushing pawns and he gains a bit of space here, hinting that he might try and explode open the center. At some point, Yvanka, I think you're right, it's, uh, black might choose this square for the black knight. The reason Ferruja doesn't rush and probably won't rush in the near, near future by taking this bishop is because suddenly black's rook uh, and black's bishop both point down uh, in this direction. It looks a bit scary now for the white king. Uh, so I think he'll delay this capture as long as possible. He'll try and only capture here once the black king has castled on this side. Mm. We'll see a waiting game now, both sides just trying to put their pieces on good squares. Magnus uh, has uh, started a little bit of a think. No. <laughs> Moving his queen back. <laughs> <laughs> Undeveloping pieces. Ooh. I mean, uh, yeah. Don't try this at home. I've got to say it again because uh, he's breaking all the rules, Magnus. He's hitting this knight. He's trying to force a capture of his bishop because, as mentioned, this would open up the rook. Maybe the queen actually wants to jump out now and Magnus wants to deliver some really basic checkmate. Mm. David, sorry, I, I have cheated okay. because I was wondering why the evaluation bar has gone up massively in Fruja's favour. And there's a tremendous move here, wow. okay. a tremendous move, which is actually very logical considering the underdevelopment and the amount of time that Black has simply wasted it's here. Just to blast open the yeah. centre, I mean, because this, this is the most thematic definitely. thing. I, re I reckon this is totally a Ferruja move as well. He loves attacking. This move could cause a lot of problems for Magnus, according to the engine, wow. um, because Black's king is in the middle. This has been the danger, and you're, you're going to get your piece back this way. So, yeah. yeah, sorry, but just this had to be mentioned. It's such a dangerous move. Yeah, and there we see uh, Simon Stockfish, the computer does confirm that this is by far the best move. Retreating the white knight, for example, uh, even capturing the bishop or stepping back, those are decent too, but this is the strongest. And you mentioned white will gain the piece back. You're giving your knight away on the edge of the board for free. But uh, after a capture, I'm guessing this way, suddenly white's queen is the one unleashed against this bishop and you have a threat against the black knight. So one of those two pieces would drop. For example, pawn takes pawn and the white queen jumps in and uh, yeah, black's position is just in ruins. The king's stuck in the middle. Uh, so will Ferruja find this really, really strong idea? He no. doesn't. But, but he might uh, combine this idea and now perhaps yeah, just try to blast open the center. He could still try, I guess, maybe slightly less effective now because uh, there could be a trade. At the very least, black can block it up. You still have to worry about the queen coming in. He has played this, however. We are going to see fireworks. Ferruja on the attack already. All right, the action has started inside the arena. But uh, Tanya, we're also very excited to meet some of the spectators that have taken the trip to Miami to follow these top players. <laughs> Absolutely, Kaya. As the fireworks are on over the board, we can feel it with our spectators. There's a lot of discussion going on and they're whispering to each other uh, because we can see it is getting hot on the boards. Well, there's one family that's driven five hours to come and watch their favorite players in action. And let's find out what it's like to be here. Hey, guys. Hi, how are you? 
I'm good. All right, tell us a little bit about uh, you and you play chess. Yeah, so I've been playing for seven years, so I first figured out my passion for the game when I was six in school where we had a tournament. Well, I did pretty good, and then I saw that maybe I do have like the talent for this game. Wow. And Anya, what about you? Are you excited to be here? I'm super excited. I've been watching Magnus Carlsen's game, and when I started watching them and started going to tournaments, I actually started getting at least five or six points. And I started playing six months ago watching my brother play. That's so cool. And what's it like to actually see them live in action here? Super exciting. <laughs> I love it. So safe to say you guys are rooting for Magnus? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> All right, well, enjoy the games. It's getting pretty intense in there. As you can see, everyone from across the country is here to enjoy the chess. Back to you guys. Uh, we love it, Tanya. Thank you so much. So cool to see everyone traveling uh, to Miami to uh, see these players. And of course, we also love everyone around the world watching this from at home. Yeah, absolutely. We really love having your support and the players do as well. So today for our selfie competition, we are asking, how are you cheering for your favorite player? Do you have your foam fingers? Mm -hmm. Do you have some special hats? Oh, special, I don't sign? know. Signs yeah. could be anything. Uh, well, anyway, we want to see. We want you to show us. As always, you can tweet your selfies using the hashtag chess Jam and one winner will get one year's Chess24 premium membership. So look forward to seeing yeah. who are you cheering for and show us how. I'm thinking also like chants, like you would have in a football soccer arena. Oh my God. Songs for the favorite players. Can you guys come up with some cool, you know, Magnus Carlsen or Ferusha uh, songs? Our, our viewers are just incredible. Yeah. I mean, they really just completely blow me away with their ingenuity. So I can't wait to see what they're going to come up with. I reckon there will be rhymes, there will be songs, there will be signs, there will be big foam fingers. Yeah. What else? Something to have Magnus Carlsen smile. He is smiling. Still, Magnus Carlsen, he's having a lot of fun in the start of this game. But uh, the bar is not overly excited about his uh, position on the board. Does it have anything to do with the game, David, that he's smiling? Or do you think it's something completely else? Um, who knows at this point? I don't think I've ever seen Magnus this happy. And uh, I don't think it's the position. The position is still complicated enough uh, to make Black sweat a bit, uh, especially while, as Simon mentions, that Black King is a massive target in the center. Uh, maybe it's to do with the music he's listening to or mm. something connected with this opening. We have seen Magnus kind of freestyle with some weird, wacky openings in the past and it tends to kind of get him in a good mood. Uh, so I have, I have a feeling it's more to do with the opening or the music rather than the current position on the board. Mm. But uh, what do you guys think? It does look a bit scary still for Black. It does, I yeah. I mean, my initial thought is what if Black goes to checkmate? Mm -hmm. So maybe we can share this line because it's the most forcing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it works out very well, but um, we, we can share it. So you could, as black, try to use the placement of the rook and throw the queen in. Uh, and this threatens checkmate. Um, there's only really one decent way of stopping that. You've got to move the pawn. Mm -hmm. And now it might be, oh, can, can black win a, win a pawn here? Uh, but this is going to backfire massively. Uh, and if black tries to win a pawn, I think he's going to get his queen trapped uh, at the end of it. Uh, so there's, there's like little tricks here and this just shows that black at the moment can't go on the offensive if you know this bishop move here just trapping the queen the queen has no squares to go to so it's it's more like there are some quite big issues to solve in the center of the board for magnus i mean uh, i'm sure there's a way to do it but it, it's very unpleasant i would be very unhappy here trying to i wouldn't be smiling as much as magnus i feel mm. uh, trying to trying to just work out how do i get my king safe because uh, that that is numero problem Ooh. Actually, problem numero one. OK, he threw the queen in. Um, and maybe that's all right on its own. That's certainly probably not a terrible move, but you, you don't want to take the knight next move. Is he, he can't cast the queen side. So I'm just really interested to know, how, how's he going to stop these issues Yeah. at the moment? I, I, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, David mentioned trying to close down the centre. Is that the way to do it? That would be the normal way to try and play, try to close the area of the ball where you're getting attacked down. He's so. actually captured with the other pawn. Mm -hmm. OK, interesting. So he's taken with the pawn and he has blocked it. Um, maybe he just wanted to keep his bishop open on this diagonal. Um, it felt a bit loose somehow, uh, but I guess the reason he put his queen on this square is that the white knight can no longer kind of go and um, kick away the blockader of white's past pawn in the middle of the board now. As long as black gets kind of two moves, if black can get his knight out and castle, probably on the king side, he'll be happy. 
It's just about whether Faruja gives him that uh, that time, that luxury. Yeah, and uh, the thing is, he has to put the king, the knight on that uh, particular square, because uh, so if you put it, say for instance, on the e7 square, I know it's white to play, the bishop will actually come out to b5 and pin the knight and say, well, you know, maybe, king is going to stay in there. Maybe you, can do, maybe you can do that anyway, Yvanka. I mean, that, that looks like the logical move to me with a check coming up next. I, I don't see how black's going to easily get castled after that bishop comes to that X square. And I think it is, you know, you, you've got to be quite aggressive here with the white pieces because, David, you pointed out, if black castles, he's fine. He's got a blockade on in, in the position. So you, you want to try to play very aggressively here as white, I think. Stop that casting, at least uh, discombobulate black a little bit mm. in, yeah. in the position. I mean, if black is forced to, for example, meet a check with just a king move, then at least these two rooks will never be connected. They'll never join up. And the Black King will always feel a bit uncomfortable. Likewise, uh, I like this move, Simon, uh, just because you're kind of trying to ask Black to castle on the other side of the board, but here it's much more open, the Black King. There are kind of squares around it, it's a bit airy. Um, you could definitely imagine White kind of pushing pawns later to explode open lines uh, towards this piece. And yeah, that, that, that looks natural, that looks strong. Uh, very logical as well, just trying to go for this Black King while there's an opportunity. But he needs to be quick, Faruja. He can't let... Uh, he just can't play slowly and let the Black King castle this side to safety. Then I think Magnus will start doing Magnus things and uh, kind of start outplaying his opponent simply because this pawn will become more of a weakness than a strength if Black's King gets to safety. Look at that. It's packed inside the Miami arena. The spectators sitting only a few meters away from the players fighting in the tournament. Do you think they're noticing them, Simon? Um, I, I doubt it in some way because they're kind of like really focused. You get in the zone when you're playing. I mean, all these guys, we've got to remember, they are used to playing with big crowds. They've just come from the Olympiad in, in India where you, where you, I mean, David and Yvanka, you were there, but you, you said it took you half an hour to get to the board yeah. because there's so many people. So it's like they're, they're, they're used to having a crowd there and you, you kind of, you know, you zone out a little bit for, for the people there. Uh, I love the idea that Yvanka mentioned earlier of giving the crowd the headset so you could yeah. hear. Because they had that once in the 93 World Championships, uh, Kasparov wow. versus Nigel Short. And I remember I was there and they had to actually stop the commentary because uh, they were cracking so many jokes that the crowd would just all of a sudden start laughing and <laughs> Nigel would be like, they're not la they laughing at my move. <laughs> like, like, you know, what's going on? And like, you know, because of the commentary. But um, OK, we have another move uh, mm. on the board now, which seems very slow, but it's maybe getting the rook around, I guess. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, White's rook in the corner would have taken kind of ages otherwise to activate it. It's just going to slide up two squares and maybe swing across somewhere. But as you mentioned, Simon, it's slow and maybe Black's King can now uh, kind of hurry away to safety on that side of the board. Uh, so, yeah, I'm expecting Magnus without too much thought to bring his knight out, the knight that's not developed. And Castle with haste. Yeah, I mean, that move, it does... It's slightly slow. It just doesn't feel like it hits the nail on the head. It feels like the action should have been taking place in the centre. But, uh, OK, we can't be too critical. It doesn't worsen White's position at all. One thing Black shouldn't be tempted to do is what you said a couple of moves ago, Simon, take that White Knight with the Black Bishop. Black's Bishop is actually the key piece sitting in front of White's pawn in the middle. He's got to be a blockader. And, uh, OK, Magnus thinking, however. Yeah, maybe but, Magnus was taken by surprise by that move because we weren't expecting it. it didn't seem to us the most logical move which was to introduce pieces into the attack Still smart, but he's like yeah, laughing yeah, away like, you know. uh, i mean and with that hair he reminds me of john travolta in greece with that <laughs> going forwards yeah. he's latin now. yeah <laughs> people have mentioned him and neiman might have the same hairdresser <laughs> I don't know. The, the... <laughs> Do you think they have that much hair? Hans <laughs> <laughs> Niemann, he is uh, fighting today against Levon Aronian. It's a prestigious one. All American against Levon Aronian playing in Miami. Levon must be said to be a big favorite. Hans Niemann still on zero points in the tournament, but he has given us a lot of entertainment and he has had some great moments. He did win a game against Magnus Carlsen. Magnus actually has lost a few of the first round games this tournament. Is this a big chance for Ali Reza in that first game when Magnus is maybe a little out of focus in the start of the day? Yeah, there is this saying that Magnus starts slow. Mm. Uh, he always finishes high. He always, when he needs to, he tends to win. But in these first games, maybe just kind of getting into the zone takes a while for uh, for Magnus. 
And uh, yeah, I think this first game is key. If Ferrucia takes a lead, I think we're going to have a really dramatic match. Uh, Ivanka, you spotted something. No, I haven't spotted. No. I was just looking at Magnus is like laughing. Why is he laughing so much? I mean, it's like Ferrucia really, is right? just doing like some kind of dance. Ferrucia is definitely <laughs> listening to like, some, rap music. some kind yeah. of, I don't know, but he's digging whatever he's listening to, and I, I, I like it. And uh, chill the, vibe in yeah, Miami today. Definitely. Yeah. The, I mean, these are cool dudes, and uh, you know. <laughs> On the subject of uh, chanting, you kind of asked Kaya whether our uh, viewers could come up with chants. Well, Swapnil Valvi says that uh, here's a chant for Prague Chess. We've got the King Prague. I just don't think you understand. He's a South Indian pal. He's better than Tao. We've got the King Prague. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I kind of had to take a breath though that was my problem that's why i paused no, for the last bit very nice presentation of that yeah. <laughs> very good yeah not bad, yeah. Not bad at all. Yeah. he's good at chanting the english rose rapper Yvanka huska <laughs> well you've already had the house <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I think i think we should you know get a little chess album out anyone else think that Yvanka? <laughs> Yvanka's raps yeah, you bet, yeah, so, yeah, I need to get my breath work though, because, you know, it kind of, you've got to get the momentum going because yeah. otherwise you have to go, and then, yeah. yeah. I think every player in this tournament, all eight of them, they deserve at least one chant today. I, I think yeah. that should be the goal for the uh, spectators out there, yeah. our viewers, yeah, definitely. Uh, try and come up with a chant for each player. Yeah. I'd love to hear one for Hans, wouldn't you? I mean, like, you know, Hans has been a bit of the you know, star away from the board, isn't he? So, yeah. what, who can make a good chant for hands? I can see this David immediately start thinking yeah, about yeah, it. What rhymes with hands? Yeah. Dance. Bands, bands, dance. Bands. Yeah. Loads of, loads of words. Yeah, quite a lot, you know, so, yeah. We well, can't wait to see what the viewers come up with, but meanwhile, what an ugly move by Magnus. Um, OK, maybe it's not so bad, the computer doesn't like it either, but he's giving away all the light squares on this left side of the board. He's stopping white from advancing further, with uh, his flank pawn, uh, his A pawn. So he's blocking things up. Magnus loves to do that. He hates his opponents gaining space on the side of the board, but he's yeah, giving away the light squares when you have no light squared bishop. So that's my first instinct, at least. He's still laughing, Magnus. What's going on still today? Just not focused. No, I don't... not at all. Is he listening to a podcast or something? That's really, I mean, like, but that last move, to my eyes, looks disgusting. Yeah. I mean, because <laughs> we wanted to move the bishop next, and yeah, here, here, the bishop can now sit there forever. Uh, it's even better now because the other rook. I, I, I mean, he did some very peculiar things yesterday. And some of the moves from the world champion uh, in this tournament yesterday and today are shocking me more than I've ever seen in any other tournament he's played. Uh, I just that move just looks so ugly to me. Yeah. What am I missing? What am I missing, guys? I mean, am I, I missing something? Don't see it either. I, he must have been really scared of White pushing. Maybe his. Uh, if we show this on the analysis board, um, I guess the only explanation for Magnus's kind of pawn push here is that if he had developed he was afraid of white stepping forward the black king castling and maybe the white rook stepping up to kick away the queen and the queen actually lacking squares the queen's only safe square is actually in the corner or one of these two squares not ideal so maybe this was uh, what scared magnus this kind of rook swinging across the board so in that regard perhaps uh, this is something that he wants to avoid but as you say simon after this pawn push black doing the same uh, we do have a couple more moves, but this is an eternal outpost. White's bishop will love life on this square for the rest of the game, uh, pinning down on this diagonal. And, wow, I mean, you mentioned shocking moves. Magnus has just planted his king in the middle of the board. I mean, this is a bit of an odd scenario at the best of times, but if White can somehow magic his pawn off the board, then suddenly the black king is just going to be toast in the centre. Mm. Um, White lifting his rook up now, very logical from Ferrugia, maybe aiming to kind of swing across and start attacking stuff, uh, defending his knight across the board as well. But uh, after the white knight comes out, uh, we see an offer of a trade from Magnus. And the rooks do leave the board. I'm expecting now Magnus to kind of change his mind, take with the king and start running this way. And uh, there we go. Magnus's king has done some serious exercise in the last few moves. But long term, he's still in trouble. Uh, White has a passed pawn. White has a bind on the light squares on the queen side. What is Magnus going to do? He just has to tuck his king away and hope for the best. Yeah, I have to say it does. I mean, I feel like, and and I'm going to quote a character from Catherine Tate, Nan. Someone has taken liberties, <laughs> and I mean, he's just moved his king twice. He's moved his queen like one, two, three, three times, and then. I, I, just, I just feel you can't play chess like that. You can't just get the rule book, rip it up, burn it. 
Yeah. There's, they're there for a reason. Big threat, I guess, on the board. White's Rook wants to do the same uh, kind of threat against the Black Queen. If the Black King moves now, this is a matter of urgency. It needs to run away. Then suddenly, where's your Queen going? Uh, Magnus, you don't really want to put your king, uh, your queen kind of on a passive square in the corner of the board. No queen wants to be sitting on a corner. Uh, if you put it here, still no active squares to come. Black could be playing without a queen. I mean, there's going to be ideas of white's bishop coming out, white's rook swinging across, trying to trap this queen. It looks terrifying now for Magnus Carlsen. He's got two problem pieces. And as Yavanka mentioned, these problem pieces have moved already several times. Look, it's time. Look at the time as well. He's is this going right? away again with his king. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I mean, this is just <laughs> shock a minute stuff. Uh, White's rook now forcing the black queen into the corner. Uh, have you ever seen a worse queen? Have you ever seen a more misplaced king? I've... If black survives this, if Magnus survives this game, it's going to be a miracle. Look, David, can we just like do the, the journey of this queen? Like, it started to get... <laughs> It went to a5, and then it went back, and then it went all over to h h4, and then it's gone back, and now it's probably going to end up on e8, where the king and the queen have kind of switched places. Yeah. I haven't, haven't really seen that before. Yeah, this is uh, uh, maybe what Magnus is laughing about. He sees that he's actually going to, for example, um, let's say white just plays around a move. If he puts his queen on this square, he is actually going to have swapped around his king and queen. How often do you see this in chess? It's kind of a troll type of opening to play this in blitz games, bullet games, but Magnus has done it the long way around. He's swapped those guys, uh, swapped those pieces. I have no idea what he's doing. Creative, uh, but uh, playing uh, with uh, <laughs> playing with fire. It just seems kind of like, I, j I just don't understand this game. <laughs> I really, I really <laughs> don't understand it. I mean, this idea of the rook coming up, I have to say I missed, uh, you know, with, with Ali Razor's idea of pushing the, the pawn on the side of the board. It's a really good idea that you point out there, David, but this this is just so ugly. Putting your queen in the corner, putting your king somewhere, moving it around. I, I, I don't understand it at all. And White's moves are very natural. White is just making normal, good moves. He's got some great squares for his bishop pair. He's got the long-term advantage of his uh, this pawn in the middle. Um, and, and all of his pieces look very, very nice. The knight yeah. might better jump in. Yeah, his knight's going to jump in next move, probably. I mean, it kind of looks like it should maybe be losing should for, be. For, it, it, for Black, simply just losing. Yeah, it feels like uh, if Magnus survives for five more moves, it will be a miracle. I mean, where's the queen go now? You can't even move it yeah. to the to the troll square. <laughs> um, I mean, it can't even go there. And, the square's covered. Uh, and White's going to just look at this. The knight comes in. You're going to win at least the bishop pair with a great position. I, 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 yeah. I mean, taking that bishop is a major threat. It's actually threatening to win the game uh, immediately, I feel. And, and I, I don't, yeah, like you say, Ivanka, I don't think Magnus is going to last. And this is only move, like, what is it, move 24. 24. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He gets so, to move 30, yeah. I, I think yeah. he'll have to thank the chess gods for Magnus. Wow. Doesn't really deserve to the way he's been playing, unfortunately. I mean, Jordan van Voris's queen a5, can we blame it on that move? No, I don't think we can blame it on that because I think the position he got was OK. We can blame it on the queen retreating. I mean, he could have just done normal stuff, which was just develop the pieces, get the king to safety. That's how the classical way of playing chess. This way was just weird. He's running the whole way across the board with his king. He wants to keep heading across. He maybe wants to move the king across one square and plant it in front of his rook. You can't even do that, can he? Because you're going to lose your queen. I mean, you can't... Where's that king going? You can't put the king on a dark square because you lose your queen or lose a piece. I mean, yeah. I don't understand where... I, I, this is really one of the most be be bewildering... Yeah. can't even say the word now. It's bewildering bizarre. games that I've seen. And it's so it's, weird to see Magnus smiling as well. He's yeah. usually very critical. OK, there we have it. Now he's not happy. That's the first shake of the head we've yeah. seen today from yeah. Magnus, and it won't be the last shake of the head in this game because it's just all gone wrong. All White needs to do is, I mean, I like your idea, Simon, at some point in the next move or two, trade off Black's Bishop. Black's Bishop is the only thing holding uh, the position together. Trade that one off for White's Knight, bring the White Queen into the attack. Uh, at some point, there will be some deadly checks against the Black King. Black is playing without his Rook. <sighs> I mean... The problem for Ferruja here is that there's too many tempting moves. Mm. You could capture the black knight, you could capture the black bishop, you can just bring the white queen out immediately. 
I think, every, I think everything's winning. Yeah. I honestly just think nearly any move here is winning for White, and it's as simple as that. Because Even if White takes a timeout and just kind of shuffles yeah. the White King somewhere pointlessly, he's probably still winning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I yeah. was just tempted by capturing the Knights. Mm -hmm. And then win a pawn, yeah. put either. the rook on the bottom row. You know, there's going to be a check with the queen on the light square. I just don't know. I mean, she doesn't actually have any squares. I don't know what his next move and is either. And played knight takes yeah, knight. Come for a simple. And, say, yeah. and now you can win the queen for a bishop yeah, and rook if you gonna, want to. He's which... going to have to go for that, right? Let's show this on the board. That's a few moves there. Um, so white did indeed win a pawn on the f6 square and. As you guys are advocating, the queen is now actually trapped. After moving, what is it, five, six times this black queen, she's trapped on her own back rank. Nowhere to run to. Um, you have to give her up just for a rook and bishop, which isn't sufficient compensation. Um, here you have some kind of blockade, at least, with these pieces. Uh, they're kind of at least on stable squares, on dark squares right now, but as soon as the white queen joins the action, I mean, this is just going to be game over. How are you going to hold these pawns together long term? Eventually, as well, white has a three versus two advantage on this side of the board. One of the white pawns will become passed later on. And uh, if you look at the kind of current position as well, black's queen has kind of spent, what was it? Yeah, around six moves uh, this game so far. White's queen hasn't moved at all, but white's queen is still better than the black queen. White's queen is still more flexible. So basically, white has used those extra six moves that black has wasted uh, really productively. Also, how many times has the Black King moved? One, two, three, four, five times? I mean, you don't even need to that win the Queen well. immediately, I was, do you? I, was I mean, you can. That as well, you, you know? You, 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 that Rook move is, is not going anywhere because yeah. Black can't really move anything. Yeah. Uh, there's no squares for the Black pieces. Just White's like, Bishop dominate. Yeah. You can maybe bring your Queen out first here. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. this is honestly one of the, mo the weirdest games I've seen in my time commentating here on the tour. Um, uh, everyone has a bad day, everyone has a bad game, so I, I guess we can put it down to that, really. Uh, you know, ev everyone, it happens to everyone. And but it's strange with all the, the smiling and the laughing and... Yeah, um, it is. ...not concentrated at all. Yeah, that, 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 is that is what makes it even weirder, right? I mean, he's, he's laughing his way no, to a terrible well. loss. So, um, I, 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 you know... And maybe it's an embarrassment thing now that, you know... But uh, he was smiling long before he had a lost position, though. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, but I, I, and he's still... He's still, still grinning. Yeah, yeah. So what's going on then, guys? Why, why, why? Can someone I mean, explain this is to me what's so happening? unlikely, Magnus Carlsen, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like you said, Simon, everyone has one bad day. You can't help it. We yeah. thought that day was yesterday for Magnus, where he was just making these uncharacteristic one-move blunders. But uh, to start today in a similar fashion, it's not even one-move blunders. It's just playing bizarre decisions that are almost inexplicable. Yeah. And uh, the only reason for Magnus Carlsen to smile right now is that uh, it looks like Jan Christoph Duda is winning game one against Pragnananda, the bar all the way over to his side. Now we have some waving. Hi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they could see us waving back. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. They're waving to the camera. It's a full house in the Miami arena with spectators coming from all over the US to watch the top ch chess players in action. Maybe disappointed right now. Magnus Carlsen is not playing a good first game against Ali Reza Ferruja. And the one who has a really big reason to have a big smile now is Ali Reza Ferruja. Because, uh, well, if Prague loses his match and Magnus loses his match to Ali Reza Ferruja, then he will be in the lead, the Frenchman, with uh, one day to go. <clears throat> yeah, We're getting a great start to the day, drama-wise. Yeah, huge drama, and that would be almost decisive. I mean, Ferruja, he's already played his two big rivals. He's already played Prague. Today, he will have played Magnus. So if he wins today's match, he's uh, got it all in his own hands. Yeah. And, OK, now Black's queen attacks the white rook. Again, Magnus just wants to give up his queen. He's just saying, take my queen. It's trapped. Uh, White's rook can just step one square up the board. And that whole kind of exchange, that transition will happen. Here we go. Uh, the Black Queen is lost. And after the Black Queen disappeared, White's Queen has gone to win a pawn. This one is just uh, a matter of technique now. It should be relatively straightforward for Ferruja. Uh, White's Queen just needs to move out the way. So at some point, uh, that Black Knight is pinned, tied down. Black Bishop is fixed on its square, pretty much. Black's Rook is active, at least. That's the one positive for Magnus uh, for the world champion right now. Credit to Ferruja, he's kind of played really smoothly. He hasn't been disturbed by his opponent's really surprising moves. Uh, sometimes when your opponent plays a bit uh, provocatively, you get really disturbed. And the White's Queen comes back. Yvanka, you were... Yeah, I was kind of hoping that uh, Ferruja might play it in a flashy way with uh, the bishop coming to the c6 square. 
But that would have been a bit much, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, White's Queen changes direction instead, maybe trying to go all the way up to the top of the board. Uh, there are entry squares in Black's camp. You can't keep the white queen up forever. No, you problem. can't. Fortresses yeah. don't exist in this position. I mean, the one thing that Ferruja has to be careful of is that simply, you know, the white king could be potentially vulnerable to a back rank checkmate. Uh, but that's something that's pretty elementary, and uh, Ferruja will not be so careless to allow such, such a thing like that. I don't know. I wouldn't rule it out the way this <laughs> game's going. I mean, I'm not, not sure I'm watching these two play or if I'm watching their a game, uh, you know, <laughs> primary school. If we didn't know the so, two players, know. Simon, if you just if someone submitted know, the score sheet yeah. and showed you the moves, you would, someone, yeah. Yeah, someone... you would say, I mean, you, so you, you would say like, yeah, white, white's playing good natural moves, but black's played some really strange, you know, you, you honestly would, wouldn't you? I yeah, mean, yeah. Uh, you'd probably say 1800, maybe not 2800. <laughs> Not uh, even 1800. Without being harsh, you yeah. think lower. I, I, I mean, yeah. this whole queen journey is just so atypical because mo uh, most players know, you know, you've got to develop your pieces. But like Simon says, everybody has an off day where somehow you think you can be creative and you think you can. But he's still do laughing. Things. What's going on? I don't I know. I don't get it. I mean,. He... I can't explain oh. it, Simon. Does he just want to give himself a challenge, just kind of throw away the first game and come back like he did yesterday against Duda? Uh, he was two points down yesterday against Duda. I don't know. He has, it's a bit unlike Magnus. I, I say it's a bit. It's really unlike Magnus. Exactly. And now Black's Rook is asked a question. Black's Rook can actually take the pawn uh, in front of it, White's H pawn. So the Black Rook could get greedy, but it would end up on a really bad square. And White's Queen is ready to come up to the top of the board and start attacking the Black Knight, attacking some pawns. I think that would be disastrous, almost. Magnus, I think he's more likely to bring the Black Rook somewhere on the fourth rank just to activate it uh, or bring it back. This does stop at least White's Queen entering the position. But, I mean, if we do a quick material count, White has a Queen and two pawns. Black only has a Rook and Knight in return. So Queen and two pawns, that's worth 11 points. Rook and Knight worth eight. It's uh, plus three on the counter in terms of material. Now the White Queen, this is how versatile she is. She just checks, forces the Black Knight back to a bad square, hits the Rook in the corner. Now the Black King is the target. Now the Queen's going to come in and yeah. start taking yeah. those Kingside pawns. I mean, Dropping. it's completely over. I, it has been for a while. I mean, it's just like trying to plot, maybe trying to plumb the game to uh, move 30. Uh, it's the only thing I can think. And OK, that's wow. it, basically. Yeah. It's over. Magnus Carlsen, he loses game one, playing a horrible game here, the world number one, and laughing while doing it. It's very strange, but Ali Reza Ruja, he takes the lead in this very crucial match in the FTX Crypto Cup. I'm very curious to see if we will see reactions in Miami, especially from Magnus. It would be nice to hear what this was all about. Nope. He, uh... Yep, we will have a reaction. Let's go to Miami. What, what, what was it about? Oh, he played well. Uh, it was a good game by him. Got to do better. Huh. This is very strange, you guys. What is Magnus Carlsen up to? It's just hard to explain. Yeah. Uh, I'm speechless, to be honest. He seems in a good mood still. Um, he's still capable of fighting back, of course. He's got white next. Ferruja is notoriously good with white, as we mentioned earlier. So a loss might have happened anyway, but that style of loss, he's just boosted Ferruja's confidence as well. Mm. It's uh, surprising stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose, you know, Ferruja did play very well, um, but his moves, you know, weren't particularly hard to find in the middle game. Uh, he did this like Rook's pawn we were talking about, but I don't know. I suppose if we, if we think about Magnus in that game, like, and we talk about it, it's like, okay, he played a, like a series of three or four bad moves, um, and then he was kind of hopeless situation. But it just it was very bizarre, yeah. very bizarre game. So yeah. and you guys were not a big fan of the game, so we'll just skip analyzing it. Uh, we don't want to learn from that game, I guess. But uh, this one is also so important, you guys, for the tournament situation. Pragnananda. First game against Jan Christoph Duda. And is Duda winning this game one? It's looking good for Duda. If we do a quick count, both sides have the same number of pieces, but Black has an extra pawn, and it's not just going to be one pawn, it's going to be a second extra pawn incoming. Um, White's pawn on the C file there um, is going to drop to the Black Rook or the Black Knight. And two pawn advantage here, it looks pretty much decisive. There we go, it's two pawns up now for Duda. White's bishop is not participating in the battle. 
the Black Knight looks very good right now. Black's pawns are perfectly placed. Black's king, rook active. It's all stacking up in the Polish player's favor. I think Pragnananda, the only chance of saving this game is to somehow get his rook, ac rook active, win a pawn back. But uh, yeah, he's reliant now, Prag, on some serious blunders from Duda. And you can tell on his body language, he's, uh, he's distraught. A more normal game, this one, but just looks like uh, mm. the older player here in, in Duda, in this case, has outplayed his young opponent. Yeah, and uh, I think we are looking at the end because Black's Knight is probably going to dive in to the d3 square and start attacking some pawns. And there's just really not that much that Prague can do to stop any of this. And uh, he gives a check. King is probably going to take a step back, attack the rook. Yeah, that's what we call a spite check. It doesn't really help the position. It's just you want to throw in one check before you resign. And uh, the Black King defends all its pawns, gains time against the White Rook. Yeah, Black's about to win a third pawn when that White Rook moves. And therefore, Pragnananda gives up, he resigns, and Duda takes the win. Wow, he lost his match yesterday, Pragnananda, and a horrible start to today. He is one of the players fighting to win the tournament, but a great win for young Christoph Duda. He started out with a win against Magnus Carlsen as well yesterday, and here he is, winning game one against Prague. Will we see a reaction? from Prague in Miami. Nope. He wants to go back to his lounge and uh, prepare. And uh, we came in very late in this game, David, but uh, where did Prague lose it with the white pieces? Yeah, Prague actually lost it. He lost the thread of the game towards uh, the end, just as we approached the end game. And um, there's a nice tactic that we will show. Is Duda going to stop for a word with us? I bet he, after a win, of course he will. How would you summarize? Yes, uh, I mean, the game was actually uh, very smooth. It was kind of surprising. Um, yeah, actually, I don't know what, uh, where uh, my opponent did, uh, did wrong, uh, what, what he did wrong. Like, um, it seems he should be better after the opening because I'm kind of undeveloped. But once the Queen's traded and the position became... I, I, I mean, he didn't have anything direct. And also, this before move was uh, highly weakening for him. And that was basically the reason why he lost the game. It's safe to say that you found your form. Uh, it's just the beginning. Um, it's pity, you know, that I started playing relatively, uh, I mean, successful chess only at the end. Good luck. Thank you. Obviously, very happy young Christoph Duda. And uh, yeah, David, where did he win it and where did Prague lose it? Yeah, I just have to show the moment that Prague lost the thread. Um, Duda mentioned it was a very smooth game, but it was with a bit of assistance from Prague uh, that he managed to win as black. And uh, after a very balanced opening where Prague was trying to put pressure, Duda defended well. It was this position as white where Prague had his final opportunity. He ended up retreating this knight, which is attacked. He stepped it back and after a trade uh, of knights, Black eventually won this pawn. We saw Black pawn up in the endgame and he went on to win. Uh, but instead of this retreat with White, he could have actually sacrificed his rook. This is a very tricky tactic. We can't blame Prague for missing it, but this would have turned the game potentially in White's favour, still roughly in the balance. And uh, the whole idea is that after you've given up a rook for Knight, you just retreat and a fork is incoming. The Knight is guaranteed to land on this square next move and Black's king and the two Black rooks are going to fall. Uh, they will be attacked and uh, you can't save both the two black rooks. For example, if the black king moves, white takes this pawn with a fork, you regain the material with interest. So a missed opportunity for Prague there uh, to at least fight harder in the game and Duda, once he got the advantage, never let it slip. Coming up, Magnus Carlsen, he laughed his way all through the first game and he lost it to Alireza Ferruja in 12 minutes. He will have the white pieces in game two and he ha has to make a comeback and he has to start getting serious because he is down in this crucial match. The drama continues in the FTX Crypto Cup. We'll take a quick commercial break and we'll be back in a few minutes. those of 
you who are uh, striving to get a double edge. In this video, we're going to look at the latest developments in the Six Bishop G5 Knight Rook. I'm going to start with uh, sort of my first official Stonewall game. The idea is not to fight against uh, any opponent move, uh, prevent everything, defend and so on. It's, no, it's just to move. Air quality isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things. Tari, Hammer, Ursgrau, Christensen, Fresine, Mozart, Lagarde, uh, Androsi, I'm, I'm just going by team now. Um, Sindarov, Yakubayev, um, Abdusatarov, Vakidov, uh, Vakidov, Giri, uh, Barmedam, Forest, Smates, Bok. Ah, uh, for me... Okay. Magnus Carlsen doing okay in the FTX Crypto Cup Challenge. Not doing well in the first game today in the uh, day six in the FTX Crypto Cup. He has to make a better uh, performance in uh, game two coming up in nine minutes. Uh, but before that, uh, we're going to go down to uh, Miami and talk about social media. Always interesting to see the social media leaderboard. I'm standing here with Zubair Timul, the vice president of Meltwater, who's now been a presenting partner for two years of this Champions Chess Tour. It must be exciting for you as well to see how much things have evolved. Yes, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, it's fantastic to be here in Miami and to bring the sport of chess to a truly global audience. As you can see around us, there's palm trees, there's a beach, and there's just such a fever of excitement around this topic. For Meltwater, it's a very natural partnership in terms of the data that we provide and how we're helping grow the sport of chess. And it's something that is uh, really, it feels generic when you're actually working on the same page, uh, a partnership that is truly a partnership. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of synergies between Meltwater and chess. At its essence, what we provide is information. That's what chess players have. It's how you utilize that information that has an impact. So Meltwater does that both at a local and a global level. And it's been really interesting to be part of that journey where we've been growing the sport of chess from something that was really small, to something that's much bigger now. And you guys are actually taking an active part in the Champions Chess Tour and you have a social media leaderboard. Can you explain a little bit about this? Yes, absolutely. So Meltwater has been very hands-on in terms of utilizing our social data to help create a footprint for this particular tour. So what this means is that we're tracking multiple data points throughout the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. So this time around at the FTX Crypto Cup here in Miami, we're looking at the data coming through and during the early stages here, it's really interesting 
interesting to see. India is the number one most talked about country. That doesn't come as a surprise, given Prague's sensational victory over Anish Giri. You also see the United States, more familiar countries such as the US and Norway. But one thing that might be interesting to the audience is that Venezuela has cracked the top 10, right? Which we think is really interesting. And beyond that, Armenia as well. So the running joke is that we know the Kardashians might be interested in chess. We know that they have Armenian heritage as well. But it's great to see so many fantastic countries being represented in this sport. So the fact that Levon Aronian one day was actually the number one athlete in Armenia, that is really pushing. And it's fun to see how you guys can track this real time. Uh, you guys were even tracking emojis. Yeah, I know. I mean, the emojis is just such a popular function of this tour, right? In the past, we've had the famous burrito bowl versus burrito wrap. This time around, what you're seeing there is a trending in relation to the key. And that's a direct reference to the FTX crypto key, where we're enabling participants all across the world to bring them a little bit closer to the tournament. So if you're participating in this tournament, uh, get your access to the FTX crypto key and throughout the Mount Twitter Champions Chess Tour, you'll be unlocking various different privileges. Obviously, Magnus Carlsen is making a splash. You mentioned Pragnananda hitting a whole new market. Who else is standing out here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the top two are Prag and Magnus Carlsen, but number three is Hans Neiman. And as you probably <laughs> saw during that launch event, Hans went very strong with his comments, and now he's gone viral, he's a meme, and I think it's great to see different personalities project themselves at this stage. So not only chess speaks for itself, like Hans Neiman would say, I think Meltwater is speaking for everyone. Absolutely, and no doubt uh, Hans Niemann is becoming a fan favorite. Let's take a look at uh, some of his ups and downs in the FTX Crypto Cup. Well, it's completely ridiculous that uh, the laptop is just running out of power. The fact that the laptop runs out of power completely threw me off, and it's just completely ridiculous. It should not be happening. Like, plug the laptop in, matches it over. Thank you. Let's do the winner. How much of that second game, Hans, would you attribute to the first game and what happened? Oh, completely, thank you. You start out with a masterpiece, how would you summarize it? Chess speaks for itself. Is it something special doing this against Magnus, Hans? I don't see Anish, I just see someone who's, who's going to face the wrath. I think some of the decisions I made were just absolutely insane, like to go King F3 to E4. Yeah, I was just trusting my instinct. Uh, this, uh, this position quite, uh, like it, I did not let it get any... No, I've actually blocked all social media. I don't use social media. Really? Yeah, yeah. Like, the fact that I'm alive at this moment is, 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 a, is a miracle, because after I lost this first game, f***ing ridiculous, I think I was really just ready to just go into the ocean and uh, never, never come back. Thank you. What a character, Hans Niemann. Thank you to TV2 Norway for uh, sharing this video with us. And let's uh, go back to Miami. Uh, Tanya, are there any Hans Niemann fans in the building? <laughs> all over regardless of how he's playing we love us some hands and i have to say we are outside in the mix zone right now spectators are here we're catching up with grandmaster alejandro we've had four decisive games the players are playing to the galleries oh absolutely especially in this game anish with the white pieces against liam he uncourts this beautiful attack starts with the move knight takes h7 and this is a great masterful moment that Liam actually misses. The entire white attack is based on the weak light squares around the king. So this bishop is the key to the attack. What could he have done? This beautiful move, rook c2, traps the queen. And the point is that if you take on c2, this bishop is suddenly unleashed. You go d3 check, the king has to move. That's the rules of chess. Take on c2, you hit the rook, you hit the knight, and it's actually white that is in a lot of trouble. Liam misses that and instead ends up playing the move bishop takes on d1, and after bishop g6, he was in a huge attack, but Anish spent too much time and ended up losing because he couldn't find the decisive blow later. Wow, that is some inspired chess there by our players. A round two action coming up. Before that, guys, can we hear it for the FTX Crypto Cup? Super tournament. There you have it. Back to you guys. <laughs> Very cool. It's so nice to see spectators in the building in Miami cheering for their players. They have to do it outside because obviously inside the arena, it's kind of important to stay quiet. And as Tanya and Alandro mentioned, 
four decided games in round uh, one here today. Let's take a look at the results. Ali Reza Farusha, that big win against Magnus Carlsen playing a very poor game. Lee Emle winning game one against Anish Giri. And a big win for Jan Christoph Duda against Prague, who now has to make a comeback. Hans Niemann winning game one against Levon Aronia. We didn't look at that game. Was it a good game by Hans, a good win? Yeah, he started another day in good form. It's just about whether he can maintain that and uh, maybe avoid uh, too many emotions. Hans starting well. And we did uh, see uh, some of his ups and downs, a lot of interesting interviews by Hans this tournament. And we have another interview by Hans after winning game one against Levon. Hans, that is a great start for you today. How are you going to follow up this game? Hopefully winning, yeah. Does it mean something special to you that it's an all-American battle now? No, it doesn't matter. I don't really care. You said yesterday winning is what gets you away from a bad rhythm. Uh, is this the start of that journey? Well, there's been many matches where I've won the first game. Uh, <laughs> I think the majority of the matches I win the first game, but uh, it's what happens after that which is the problem. So I'll try to, to break the curse of uh, winning a game and then playing quite badly. But uh, I'm very happy with how I, how I just played. So it seems like... Uh, I'm not, I, I could avoid disaster. Good luck in the next game. Thank you. Tough start, Levon. Uh, how do you strike back from this? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, he played very well. Uh, at some point, I think I uh, underestimated. So, well, I got uh, just got to step up, play better. you feel that your opponent today brings a little bit of all or nothing? I, I don't know. Uh, I only played him once, so I don't really know his style yet. Look forward to seeing you playing your game, Levon. Thank you. It was a loss for Levon Aronian in game one against Hans Niemann, and it was a loss for Magnus Carlsen in game one against Ali Reza Ruzha. Now with the white pieces, Magnus Carlsen, is this looking better? After only one move. <laughs> so far. Yeah. But uh, it's about how Magnus focuses, I feel, in this game, whether he can avoid those kind of external thoughts. And uh, laughing, in general, we love to see it but not maybe throughout the entire game. <laughs> yeah. uh, so he does start with the English opening Magnus, and then uh, after a bit of thought, he brings his knight out. So this could transpose into a variety of openings. It could transpose to the Queen's Gambit, the Catalan. Okay, this is still well-known stuff. Magnus now will push one of the white pawns in the center. And okay, still much more steady at least than the last game in terms of the opening. Magnus though, he's back at his old tricks, laughing again. He captures a pawn, uh, trading off here, and a, ver a variation, at least, of the Queen's Gambit declined. Uh, still well-known stuff, but not supposed to be the most critical. Yeah, uh, my understanding is that it's not critical at all, and that uh, all Ali Reza has to do with the black pieces is just support the center, wow. and then this is the problem. The light squared bishop that black has will manage to get outside the pawn chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a very solid start. It feels like Magnus today, he's just trying, trying to avoid any theoretical battles where it's about homework, um, it's about who's kind of prepared harder. But it also feels like he's freestyling, and that's dangerous in speed chess. In longer games, you can get away with, with freestyling. At the critical moments, you stop, you pause, you kind of pull yourself back from the brink. But in rapid chess, whenever I freestyle, it tends to go a bit wrong. Um, I mean, he's, he's just smiling it, looking away from the screen again. Just kind of choosing his move according to his mood, and um, that's a dangerous game. Mm. What do you guys think of this uh, opening choice? Do you think it, the kind of strategy behind it will favor Magnus later on? It will become a slower game at least, uh, no immediate fireworks. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I mean, uh, Ferruja is a, is a very dangerous attacking player, tactical player, so I think fixing the pawn structure makes does make a lot of sense. Um, but you know, I'm still I'm still a bit bewildered. Um, it'd be interesting to see the quality of his play in, in this game. To be entirely honest, mm -hmm. um, this is this is one of the main ideas here, and um, this this tries to stop Black developing the light square bishop to the normal square. But this line is supposed to be equal, but Magnus often doesn't mind that. I mean, he often plays positions where he, which are equal as long as he enjoys playing the middle game structures. And I think that's a lesson to take. You know, everyone should take home. You don't always have to play an opening to get an advantage. You can play openings that just get you positions you enjoy playing. Uh, so I think the main move here is to try and develop, well, there's many moves here, yeah. but it's, it's quite, yeah, early, early days so far. 
Uh, but I'd, I, 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 he must be listening to a podcast, and I really want to know what podcast he's listening to because <laughs> it's obviously pretty funny. Um, and I need to get myself some of that podcast, whatever he's on. Uh, I kind of I want some of it. <laughs> so, um, what must be one of the Good think? Night episodes. Which one is that's the funniest? A, that's a chess David? one, though. I'm yeah? not sure that he would be allowed to listen to a no, chess. We've one. had some funny podcasts in the past with yeah. Nish Geary, with Jordan yeah. Bamford. Yeah, uh, yeah, with Eric Hansen, a few others. Yeah, could be. Could be listening to you. With you, Simon. Maybe it's the podcast we did with you ah, a few months be. ago. Must yeah. be. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised. I did like that tweet earlier on that we saw from Tricky Dicky saying, can Magnus laugh his way to one out of one? And uh, this is the major move where Black simply just forces that bishop to come to the F5 square. And... Uh, very natural developing move from Magnus. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of curious. What is everyone thinking about uh, <laughs> Magnus, uh -huh. Ali Reza? Who are you cheering for? Who wants, who, how are you supporting your favorites? And uh, remember, there's a selfie competition going on. It's a selfie competition. So we do like to see pictures in landscape mode. And remember to tweet us using the hashtag chess champs. How are you cheering for your favorite player? Yeah. And we're especially big fans of Fold Fingers, just so you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Haven't seen any so far. I know. No, I haven't Quite seen good. any yet. But you guys, there. I mean, our viewers at home, they are just so creative. They will just blow our minds. I should have brought mine. Uh, I have two you foam have... fingers. Yeah, yeah, whenever I go to sports in the US, I buy foam fingers. <laughs> Do you have any with Magnus on it? Or... No, I'm f I yeah. have New York Rangers and uh, Chicago Bulls. Chicago Bulls. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hmm. No, I haven't found any chess ones, but uh, we must make them. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Next time for the tour, the, la the last major, yeah. and if it's an in-person event, we can have those fans with foam fingers. Yeah. Or can we even be like pieces? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Queen. We might have to get ones with David on, right? Yeah. Depending yes. on what happens potentially. Just to make you more nervous, David. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> yeah. 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 No pressure yeah. at all. Yeah. Yeah. For anyone who uh, is joining us late in this tournament, uh, earlier we were celebrating David's incredible gold medal in the chess Olympiad. And uh, doing so, uh, our tour director, challenged David to and invited him to play in a Meltwater Champions chess tour tournament. And uh, David will think about it. Uh, I mean, if Magnus promises to play like he did in the first game <laughs> against me in that tournament, <laughs> then I'll say yes, definitely. But um, yeah, it's uh, a lot it's, of preparation to yeah. do to become one of the strong players like these or even to challenge some of the uh, these guys. They're all, they all work so hard many hours a day with big teams behind them. It's uh, yeah. It's their job, right? This is what they do yeah. all yeah. day, every day. Prepare. Uh, yeah, I think people Badly. forget like just how much preparation you have to do yeah. to to compete at this level. I mean, it's it's hours every day. I mean, you're talking five, six hours preparation most of the time. Mm. You know, maybe more for some of the younger guys. Yeah. Day day in, day out. Then you have to play. You have to be in the right mind. There's so many things that go on just to get them into this position, and that's mm. for decades. You know, you do that. So it's it's hard work playing. So, uh, yeah, it's not just turn up and, you know, bang out some moves on the chessboard. Nope. It doesn't work that way. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the game, the way the game's going, it, it all seems pretty, pretty sensible at the moment. I mean, uh, this, this, is one, this is one pawn structure that I think every chess player should know, right, mm -hmm. David? I mean, yeah. this, this is uh, one pawn structure. If you play the queen's pawn uh, on move one, you're very likely to get at some point in your chess career. And what, what are the sort of main ideas here, David? Yeah, so this pawn structure, it's called the Carlsbad structure. Um, there's actually a lot of material out there if you want to research. It's when one side has a structure like this pointing towards the center and the other side uh, kind of has the same, but uh, kind of on the other flank. And um, this just means that I, both sides want to play on different sides of the board quite usually. Um, there are ideas, for example, uh, something we call a minority attack, where whites two later for, uh, march forward to kind of destabilize these three. You could imagine a scenario where, not right now, but later white supports this pawn pushing forward, push on again, maybe a capture, and you weaken black structure in the process. Um, there are often ideas as well of white stepping forward in the center. This is counterintuitive, perhaps, because white will end up um, say black plays a move, white will end up with a isolated pawn in the middle, but 
a lot of open lines in the centre. It's not clear who this favours. That's uh, often in the air too. Uh, but in general, it's just about manoeuvring and it's about whose pieces will be more ready uh, when the action finally does start, whether it's this pawn push, this pawn push. Black often tries to... Um, again, very hard to show, but if Black could, uh, say, here, castle and... Uh, let's say both sides castle their kings. If black could plant a knight in the middle of the board, maybe then black has great control. Uh, this is one of black's most common ideas. Black tries to play on the king side in general, if we go back to the current position, because his pawns are pointing this way, and white plays on the queen side usually, because white's pawns point in this direction. There's plenty of plans. It takes a lifetime to master these types of things. But uh, meanwhile, while Alireza Farusha is thinking, it looks like Magnus, back to his... Back to his laughter. Yeah. yeah, that podcast that he's listening to. Yeah. It's hilarious. Whatever you want to know, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah. Is it, uh, sh should we be a little bit critical of this? Magnus Carlsen, he's in the lead in the tournament. He's fighting to win it. So much at stake with and the here fans there to watch. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, it's bewildering, especially in light of the first game where he did not play up to his normal level. Yeah. And, uh, okay, here... It's a normal game so far, and uh, it's up to the game is going to develop very classically, as David indicated. And yeah, okay, he's smiling, so it's not a it's not a crime. Let's, no, let's that way. I mean, if you have to laugh, you have to laugh. Yeah, you have to laugh. But it, you have to put yourself in a good mood. Yeah. But is he is he laughing again? I mean, he's obviously he's not laughing. focused. Yeah, it depends on how this game goes. If if it follows the same trend of the last game, where he clearly loses. Kind of uh, loses all <laughs> focus on the game. If it leads to mistakes, leads to blunders, leads to getting outplayed again, mm. then it's clear what the cause is. And you, you can't you can't play proper chess if you're in that kind of yeah. mode. I mean, Magnus is really talented, the world champion, so he can he can still play a great game. But you can't play your best if you're not concentrated fully. It's just mm. like it's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're laughing or you're crying or, or something. You just can't. You can't. You got to be chess is a really hard game. I mean, like you know. I, I, you know, it's, it's, so that's why it's a bit bewildering, yeah. I think, you know. And obviously an over-the-board chest, this would be unheard of. Your opponent yeah. is sitting a meter away from you, you cannot be laughing. Here they have a computer in between them, but is it somewhat disrespectful to Alireza Farusha? Will he feel that? I mean, as long as he's not in his direct eyeline, I don't think it will be too distracting for Farusha. And I know Magnus for sure doesn't mean any offence. There's mm -hmm. a lot of mutual respect between these two players. Uh, I think Magnus is just kind of in his own little zone right now and <laughs> he's not worried about the opponents, he's not worried about too much. Um, but yeah, I mean, personally, I mean, if I do end up taking up that invitation to play in the tour, I don't think I'll be listening to any music, any podcast at all mm. because it's just a distraction. It's not that long to have to concentrate. Each game, both players only have 15 minutes. It's half an hour. That's enough to focus. These players have been doing it their whole life. It, yeah. it must be a podcast, right? I mean, just it's something. I think we're, we, you know, we're mentioning this a lot because we've never seen it before. Uh, you know, we've played, <laughs> we've played, uh, you know, decades of chess in tournaments, and we've never seen it. So it is kind of like new, and it's like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> you know, yeah. why, why is this going on? And, uh, you know, back to the chess, I, 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 you know, not much to my eyes has changed. Black should be absolutely comfortable, uh, but, you know, pr pretty even still, I guess, the position uh, at, at this moment in time. Yeah, if you look at the way he was blinking there, he's definitely listening to something where he's having to actually process stuff. It's not music where you can kind of still... Uh, kind of just have it on in the background and then you fo you kind of calculate, you still uh, kind of working out the chess moves. It's, it's definitely kind of the slow blinking there it, and then occasional fast blinking. He's listening, kind of taking in information. Probably it is a podcast after all. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, we need to find out what this is because definitely. it's clearly affecting... Uh, well, be it did affect his chess in the last game. Be good to see a sp uh, Spotify list because obviously the players are allowed to listen to music and I'm just really intrigued now to know what he's listening to. Uh, with Black's last move, this seems like a good move, David. I, I'm, yeah. I mean, it's all about manoeuvring the pieces to the best squares. Uh, Black's going to try to get his king safe, but that knight seems to be on quite a good, quite a good uh, track there, I suppose, to, to, to improve itself. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not critical of what Alarez is doing, but I do find it slightly odd because my understanding of these kind of particular positions, and I played them a lot from the black side, is that you do really want a knight on the dream square of d6. Mm -hmm. If you can get that knight there and 
And in this particular position, where the light square bishops have been swapped off, it's sometimes really good to actually expand as far as you can on the left side, the left side of the board, and uh, secure the C4 square. So that is, whenever I played it, that seemed, that is the optimal setup that I found. Wait, so why does that secure the C4 square? Um, because you're basically controlling all the squares, all the pawn pushes around it. Let's okay. say um, we give each side a few moves. Yeah. Um, yeah, if black can somehow, it takes a while, uh, it's not easy to show on the board, but if, for example, the knight could come round, let's say white continues waiting, if white's not, uh, if the black knight ends up on this square, this mm -hmm. is, uh, I guess, your idea, Yvanka. Yeah. Um, this pawn means that you control this square, white can never push his own pawn forward to kind of challenge the black knight. This pawn is a backward pawn, black's knight kind of sits here. It's not quite an outpost because eventually it might get kicked away, but it's basically an outpost defended, anchored by its own pawn, yeah. and it sits in white's half. It's very annoying, staring at a pawn itself. So, so I, I've had this plan done to me by two uh, women, oh, very, very strong women grandmasters, actually, uh, Humpy Canaru and Maria Muzichuk. And uh, I, I was really struggling with the white pieces. So this is, if we go back to the position, so this is my, for me, my dream position for the black pieces. If you take a look at that knight, it's, as David indicated, it's going to take an age. Mm -hmm. Going to take a, such a long time to get it to the d6 square, which is the beautiful square. Yeah, that being said, this type of position, there are dozens of different mm. plans. Um, I mean, one is uh, was just pointed out by Ivanka here, but I guess uh, his idea is to just challenge this bishop, and when, for example, it steps back, uh, he just wants to get his king castled. He just wants to maybe off trade off these bishops long term, and there's nothing too scary that can happen to black here. The center is closed after all. Both sides have uh, reasons to be happy. I mean, black will happily castle, say white kind of initiates this type of thing. Uh, black can still go for this plan later, advancing pawns. Black can still trade off these bishops. He can still maneuver his knight back to the center, kind of uh, aim for another nice outpost for a knight, another quite traditional one. Yeah, as Simon mentioned, so there's plans for both sides. It's just about maneuvering. There's not going to be any direct attacks anytime soon, most likely unless Magnus kind of uh, is listening to a really aggressive podcast and wants to uh, do something a bit fruity. But yeah, the play will slow down for the next few moves before uh, any more kind of entertaining fireworks. So uh, personally, I quite like it. This is a decent square for the knight traditionally in these types of systems, uh, especially if you want to end up playing on the king side on the right half of the board. But Magnus, he's slowed down. He's been thinking for nearly five minutes now. I mean, it looks like there's a bunch of obvious moves. Well, I was going to, I was going to say any move other than this one. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> First, I thought he might kick back this knight. Yeah. Uh, this is maybe the most obvious move in the position. Kick your opponent's pieces outside, uh, out of your half of the board. Also, you could just castle on this flank, but Magnus... Yeah, Harry the h born marching up. Yeah, yeah, hello, Harry. I mean, it, it seems a bit strange to not move that pawn one square first. If you're going to push the h pawn, then maybe you can kick away Black's knight first. I, I don't like having pieces in my own half of the board. Mm -hmm. and, and a good good bit of advice is, you know, someone does move a piece into your half of the board, like that Black knight is in White's half, give it a kick, you know, give it a little kick away. So I do love pushing the h pawn, uh, and this move is clearly aimed against Black's formation, uh, his pawn formation on the king side. He's trying to he's trying to uh, attack that, but the Black Knight seems to now be anchored there you know, on quite a dangerous square. Mm -hmm. So uh, I also think where, where's where's the White King going to go now? And Black just stops that pawn from going any any further forwards now. Yeah, the reason I'm so surprised is, uh, as you mentioned, Simon, this knight is kind of uh, cemented on a really nice square for a while, but also white has taken away the opportunity to castle himself. It's going to be really uh, tricky now for the white king to castle because this pawn, uh, you just have to always worry about it. Suddenly the white king will not be safe on this flank. Magnus, he does have ambitious intentions, however, he, instead of castling, uh, brings his knight forward. So he's stopping the black knight from jumping to the square one to two. And uh, now he's arguing that his knight is perhaps just as strong as this black piece. Actually, he wants to kick away this black knight by pushing his f-pawn forward instead. Uh, I don't think we will see a bishop capture on this square because actually this would uh, trap the black knight behind enemy lines. The black knight now has no escape squares. Uh, it will simply fall off the board after it's kicked away by a pawn next move. So a small trap as well from Magnus. And uh, there's definitely... There's definitely some idea uh, behind what he's doing. He wants to kick away this black knight. For example, again, if black does nothing, he'll kick away this knight. And then I guess he wants to castle the long way and start f opening the center while the black king uh, is yet uncastled. 
interesting stuff. I quite like it. It's creative and creative in a good way, at least compared to what he did in the previous game, Magnus. Yeah. Uh, Faruja now with some questions to answer. Ah. All right, well, it's uh, not a must-win situation for Magnus, but he has to win uh, at least one game uh, today to take it to tie breaks. And this is so interesting on uh, the tournament standings, you guys. Ferrucia, before this game, is two points behind Magnus Carlsen. If he wins this in the rapid portion, he will be ahead of Magnus heading into the final day in the tournament. And of course, we're keeping close eye on Pragnananda today as well, playing against Jan Christoph Duda. Duda, who won his match in Blitz yesterday to Magnus Carlsen and Prague today. He lost the first game to Jan Christoph Duda. He is uh, currently playing game two, keeping a very close eye on that as well. Magnus Carlsen, he keeps smiling in this game, but it is Ferruja in the move. And Ferruja, obviously, with the black pieces and in the lead, he's going to be very happy with a draw in this game. Yeah, Ferruja would love a draw right now. Um, we did mention, we saw those stats just before the show, Ferruja with black, not doing that well this tournament. Yeah. And uh, whenever I faced him or prepared for him, I've always noticed he's significantly scarier with white. With white, he just always gets his type of position. Mm. Um, I guess that's like having the serve in tennis. You can always kind of plant it on uh, a spot you want. You can kind of force your opponent into a certain type of position. But with black, somehow, yeah, he's... He, Ferruja's style, his attitude, is to always push. Um, it was said that he tries to take, take the draw out of the equation. He doesn't want to play anything simple, doesn't want to play any boring endgames. And with black, it's hard to avoid that type of thing sometimes. Mm. And, uh, yeah, we'll see whether the colour situation here favours Magnus in this game. Ferruja ticking down to six minutes on the clock as he makes his uh, move. Are you surprised by any...? No. no. Just improving the black queen. Very yep. sensible. So we're going to go down to Miami again, and uh, Magnus Carlsen in a, a very good mood in uh, the tournament so far today. Tanya, how is the mood with uh, the spectators? It's pretty intense, actually, and everyone's really surprised with Magnus's expression throughout. I mean, the games are really not going his way. But the thing is, we know Magnus. Uh, I think he is sort of just amused by how badly he's playing today, but he's got to get that uh, he's got to change that narrative because he's got three big games, one is going on and of course he's in the lead and he could potentially lose out. We've got a mother and a son duo with us who've traveled to watch the tournament. Hey guys. Hi, thank you. My name is Vivi and this is Oliver and... <laughs> Oliver, are you having fun here? Um, yeah, I I'm looking forward to playing some games like right over there. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm also looking forward to having a lot of fun in here too. Yeah. Do you have a favorite player? Oh, favorite what? A favorite player. Um, Who do you like? Do you want to oh, eat? a food? No, player. <laughs> oh, player. Magnus Carlsen, He's yeah. nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous. <laughs> I've got to ask you, can you make anything out of Magnus's expressions in there? I don't know. We are excited to see him, so I hope he sees that the fans are here and we are here cheering for him. That's our favorite. We, we also uh, are also like in Giri. We're locals from the uh, US where I'm also from Ecuador, but my little flag. So, um, I mean, we're cheering from the, for the US players, but, uh, for Hans, but, uh, but Magnus is her favorite, definitely. Have you been watching the Hans interviews? Uh, well, <laughs> I know he, no, the, yeah, I mean, we wanna cheer for the locals, but yeah, <laughs> not, uh, they are people too. So they lose games, they, it, it gets into them. I don't like the comments, but I mean, uh, like I said, I'm glad that Magnus is in a good mood because he's very excited <laughs> to try to meet him today. <laughs> Lots of fans here, Kaya, and as they're saying that, you know, bad days happen, well, Magnus, looks like things are not going his way so far. Back to you guys in the studio. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya. Nice to hear that the spectators are enjoying Magnus's uh, mood today, laughing a lot, also in this game. And uh, we had some moves, David. Yeah, we've had some moves. Both sides had knights in the opposition's half, and both of those knights have been kicked back. But more importantly, white has castled first. White has committed his king now to this left side of the board. The white king is very safe there, um, so it makes a lot of sense. And Magnus, he's ready to start stepping pawns forward in the center as white. It feels like Ferruja's position is a bit loose. Black's king has to decide as well what it wants to do. Is Black's king really going to castle over to the right side of the board where there are some loose pawns? You need to get your knight out the way first, of course. If the black king copies the white king, Maybe it's not as safe as, it come, as its counterpart there. Um, I really don't like the, what, uh, the black pawn formation on this right half. It just feels very tender. It feels like the black knights will be tied down defending for quite a while. 
And uh, whose position do you prefer here, guys, just as uh, the evaluation bar shoots up? Yeah. I like what Magnus is doing, to be honest with you. I mean, it has it looks very natural. White's pieces are well placed. And the plan, straightforward, easy stuff. Push forward in the centre. Yeah. Is now the moment, do you think? Would you go for it now while the Black King's in the middle, or would you still build up? I guess White's Rook could be improved in the corner. White's King could shuffle across. That's normally a good idea in these types of positions. Now or wait? Big question. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably play it now. Um, just the Black King's in the middle, right? So mm -hmm. why, why don't we open a line towards Black's King? Um, I don't see any reason to wait here. Uh, I mean, you can build up, but if your opponent's King's in the middle, you want to open up. Mm -hmm. um, and probably want to open it up before the podcast is over or something, you know, <laughs> get, get it done, get the business uh, sealed. But I think this is much more Magnus-like uh, what's happening here. It's been impressive um, so far in yeah, this game from Magnus. Very impressive. I mean, just the way the pieces have moved and this, this move of the H-pawn was actually a, probably the start of this great plan because just look at Black's pieces. Uh, Ali Razor hasn't managed to get that knight next to his king ever into the game now. Um, and I don't know where he's going to put his king. I mean, I really don't like the idea of castling queenside, and uh, this is this is going much better for Magnus, this game. More more Magnus style. So, yeah. It's and like things are just tangled up for Ferruja. Those two black knights look horrible, and OK, he does capture. Maybe he had to, and white takes back with the queen. Uh, usually we would want to take back with the pawn, but this is the more direct attempt. Like you said, uh, Simon, the black king is in the middle. Why not play with pieces rather than pawns? Yeah. yeah, you've got an open file, put a rook on the open file next and just line them up against Black's king. Yeah. So, Action plays itself. Yeah, It does. It and does. Uh, if Black doesn't castle, then uh, Ferruja is just going to... Sorry, if uh, Black doesn't castle, Magnus is simply going to explode open the centre by pushing the d-pawn forward. And, uh, he might do it anyway. Yeah, he's uh, smiling. So, I mean, he keeps on laughing and it, I think it's quite nice to see good mood. And uh, talking about good mood, whilst uh, Ali Reza is thinking about how to continue, can I share with you a few selfies Ooh. of how everyone is cheering yes. for their favourite pl play players? We have Abhishek, who's cheering with their budgie with some soothing mu music whilst oh. watching the FTX Crypto Cup. Apparently the budgie is very interested in chess and music. Uh -huh. And uh, Zero Blunders is actually cheering for hands. He says, when you play with hands, you get no chance, so take your seats and order some Uber Eats. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Very nice. <laughs> and Good finally, one. just a uh, last one, Bob Bryan, American tennis player, sends a selfie and says, let's go, partner. Yeah. Remember, they partnered, he partnered up with uh, Ali Reza Faruja to win the uh, Pairs Cup. Yeah, the Celebrity uh, Cup hand and brain, that is so cool. Bob Bryan following the action, rooting for Ali Reza. So cool, I, I've watched so many matches of the Bryan brothers. Oh. Uh, yeah, super cool. Yeah, experts in double tennis, fantastic. We're excited to have you guys follow. We can see Levon Aronian getting up. That must mean his uh, second game here is uh, over. And uh, what happened in that one? It's a win for Levon against Hans Niemann. A comeback. They are now tied, the two Americans, after two games. And a quite quick win here for Levon. Yeah, they're just trading blows in that one. Niemann won in really brutal style the first game. Now Aronian just crushed his younger opponent. So 1-1 one, one, and hard to predict that matchup. And in this one, the bar is now all the way over to Magnus Carlsen's side with the white pieces in a comeback situation here, losing game one. Much better game by him than I guess this one, and the clock's ticking down to two minutes for Ferruja. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's looking very uh, difficult now for Ferruja. It's actually a bit of a mirror image. If you look at the pawn structure, especially on the left, uh, the left half of the board, we had this exact same pawn structure in the previous game between these two, where Ferruja was white and won very nicely. Uh, it's literally the exact same pawn structure on the left half, and uh, same problems for Black as Magnus experienced in the last game. Black's king. How does it get across to safety? Black's king is cut off. Look at the white bishop just kind of staring down that diagonal on the dark squares towards the black king. White's queen lurking nearby. Do you guys see a defense here for Ferruja? Um, or kind of maybe now or over the next few moves? It's going to be an uphill struggle, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think White's, White's just been dominating this match so far. Uh, Ferruja won the first game very easily. And um, I think now, well, I think this is probably a pawn sacrifice here. Um, for example, Magnus can simply just take that bishop 
and uh, the pawn in front of the white queen will most likely drop. Um, it just looks really bad for Ferruccio this one. He, he was never able to get his king safe, and you know that's one of the one of the things you need to do in chess, right? You need to control the center, get your pieces out, and get your king safe. And he he kind of messed around a little bit too much with some unnecessary pawn moves, maybe as well. That's another little error that is quite common without getting his king. Well, I mean, the king on the queen side is just its just not safe, is it, at all, there with white's pieces and that white pawn in the middle of the board being so dominant. So uh, it looks all one-way traffic for Magnus here. Yeah, this, I mean, this looks very strong, but uh, I don't know, I would be reluctant to go for this pawn immediately because at least now the black king is relatively safe. At least now there might be some ideas of black trying to attack uh, with his rook. Still great for white, of course, with this massive extra pawn, your knight coming in. If this black knight was somewhere else, maybe... Uh, some small chances, but in the current position, um, if we go back, yeah, somehow it just feels like uh, Ferruja, he's hoping, and there we go, Magnus doesn't take, he was hoping to give up a pawn just to survive. Magnus is going for more. Uh, he's saying, okay, I'm going to try and get this pawn anyway, but I'm also putting pressure on your bishop, and now there might be a bishop trade, but it's going to be on white's terms, and we could see the same scenario, essentially, uh, if the bishops disappear, but white will win this pawn, but uh, look at the black knights, they're even worse than in that last variation. Magnus, I think he's playing super well right now. And, this has uh, been a good game. It's good to see him back playing. So clearly, clearly, he's uh, on form in this one, and uh, he's played some very clever ideas uh, and got a winning position easily, really. Yeah, very easily. Yeah. I, I like the fact that he's kind of taken this relatively harmless opening variation and just injected some venom into it. And uh, the position that he's got is just fabulous. I mean, your support for choice. I'm not sure I would take this pawn right now, uh, just because it would walk into uh, potentially something on the open file later on. But uh, okay, I was going to say maybe this pawn is up for grabs. I couldn't see a reason why you can't grab this pawn. Magnus says, okay, I'm not even tempted. I'm not going to be greedy. I'm just going to improve my worst place piece, that rook. I mean, these pieces are just perfectly centralized for white. As soon as you get this white knight in the game, as soon as you kind of force a capture, uh, force a trade on the square, which has just happened, all of white's pieces are perfectly centralized, perfectly active. These pieces for black are just terrible. And uh, still a couple of pawns attacked. Ferruja though, fighting, bringing his knight forward. The white queen threatened. I guess you'll drop back. You don't want to take a pawn because you walk into a nasty pin. But uh, yeah, I mean, wherever you go, as long as you go to a safe square with white, say this one, lining up on a nice diagonal, it looks very, very strong. Ferruja upping the pace though, down to one minute. And yeah, I, it still looks like a glorious position for white. Magnus just needs to stabilize, which he does by defending his knights to great pieces. And it's the world champion's game to lose now. Looking good. I think we all prefer white's position. Black's king is far weaker than its counterpart. And black's pawn's not looking great either. Yeah. What else to say? It's been Magnus in top form. This is yeah. typical Magnus. Uh, if you hadn't shown us pictures of him laughing, I would say this is just a great game. Mm. So smooth, yeah. full focus. Yeah, he's, I mean, he, now he's, he's cashing in here. So you have to cash in at some point your positional advantages and, and change them to a, to a tactical advantage. And by, by taking this, you, you, win, you win a safe pawn because Black's knight in the middle is now destabilized and you, you can win that knight at any moment. So yeah, so typ typical Magnus. It seems like Magnus is back and this is great. So it's gonna be one all, oh. uh, which is what we want really. We want a close match yeah. and, and White is dominating. So um, Ferruja with White in the next round, is he, is he gonna, what do you guys reckon? Is he gonna uh, just roll it out again and smash up Magnus? Is he gonna do the business? I mean, it's funny. Sometimes we look at the stats, right? And we say, okay, there's reasons for this certain pattern it's not going to happen in this game. But we looked at the stats before today. We said Farouge is great with white, struggles a bit with black. That's just happened. Um, yeah. uh, sometimes the players, they forget to look at the stats. They're too busy looking at the moves when they prepare openings. I've been guilty of that myself. But uh, yeah, Magnus needs to play solid the next game. That's yeah. all I know. Yeah. Farouge will go on the attack. He'll do his own yeah. thing. But... And it does seem with Farouge, like one, one thing that could automatically like improve his game is trying to fix his openings a little bit with the black pieces because yeah. he didn't really get the kind... I mean, playing the Queen's Gambit doesn't really seem to fit him. Uh, I mean, you've got to try to play openings that excel your natural talents. So, you know, um, so I'm surprised, you know, he, he he's playing that opening, basically. Maybe he could try something else. Yeah, there are more yeah. active openings that are still solid enough uh, that he could choose. Yeah. And Ferruja's problem, his whole career, he played really aggressively as black because he played lots of open tournaments where you need to win with black. Yeah. Now he's playing the top guys, he's still quite young. 
just yeah. adding that solidity. Maybe something like Jan de Pomnichy just adding the Petrov or adding the Berlin or something uh, solid. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that might help him make that final step. Yeah, Ferruja. you guys are talking about solid and uh, Ferruja's position is anything but solid. I mean, just look at the white rook on the seventh row. It's going to be reinforced by its sibling standing there on d1. Uh, the queen can come in as well. I mean, the position is just creaking for Ferruja. Something is going to give. Yeah, white's a pawn up and he has the positional advantages. And, okay, I traded one set of rooks, doesn't really help. What can you even move for black here? You can barely move the black knight. The black queen doesn't have any decent squares, really. The black rook is tied down defending the black knight. Yeah, I mean, the big thing is that the black queen has got no active possibilities at all. And, uh, okay, I mean, I, I like this move by Ferruja, but unfortunately it's insufficient. Yeah, look at this classic Magnus. He's back to his old self, back to his... Uh, Back to top form, simply, he swaps the queens, heads into an endgame where he can just grind it out with his extra pawn. You don't really need to grind this one out, to be honest, because black's pawn's on the right half of the board. They're just too weak. They're both going to drop off sooner or later. Mm. 35 seconds, and uh, Ferruja's position is so difficult. You know what I would do here, Simon, in this position? He's resigned. He has resigned. <laughs> Sorry, David, he got oh. there first. Yeah, I was, was going to say, say I would resign. It's that time <laughs> of the day. But Magnus yeah. takes the win, an important one. Wow, this is interesting, you guys. Uh, Magnus Carlsen ties the match against Ali Reza Ferruja in uh, 25 minutes. Game three will start. Ali Reza Ferruja will have the white pieces in that one. Not looking happy, the young Frenchman, obviously, losing this game two against uh, Magnus. Magnus has looked happy the entire day. Now he must be very happy. An important comeback in the match. And I really hope he will stop for a comment in Miami. Let's see when he walks towards uh, Svara, if he will stop. Didn't he walk out the door? He has. He's oh. been uh, caught by autograph hunters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Still a smile on his face. Let's see if he stops for a comment. That was uh, quite the quick uh, work back into this match, Magnus. Yeah, it was much better. I think um, uh, he uh, kind of confused himself a little bit, uh, played, you know, some unnatural moves at some point, and after that, I just had to strike in the center and uh, win the game pretty easily. Are there any particular podcasts you really recommend these days? <laughs> No, I decided to go a different way. Um, so uh, I'm uh, certainly something funny. <laughs> Good luck in the never mating games. Thank you. <laughs> I was saying to David here while the interview was running, I was not uh, jealous of uh, Svara having to ask uh, Magnus about what he's laughing about because he never tells what it is. And uh, we have no idea still what it is. Yeah, we know it's not a podcast, yeah. but it is funny. So uh, send in your best guesses. Yeah, at home. absolutely. Now, this is game two between Liam Le and uh, Anish Giri. Liam won the first game and Anish fighting uh, to make a comeback, but the bar all the way over to Liam's side. What's happening? Yeah, it's an uphill struggle for Anish Giri on the board and on the clock. Uh, nearly four minutes for Liam, 15 seconds for Giri, but also on the board. If we do a quick count, white has an extra rook for black's bishop. Black has a pawn in return, but uh, it shouldn't be enough. Also, that black b-pawn, the, the lone sole survivor of black's uh, pawn army on that left side, it's just falling off. White has two potential winners, the white b-pawn and the white d-pawn, and one of them eventually, you would expect, will cost black a minor piece. So. Uh, this is where we do say it's a matter of technique, as long as white kind of doesn't do anything too silly, uh, he should win this game. This looks like a nice idea uh, from Liam. He's going to force a trade of minor pieces. There we go. He deflects away the black knight. Black's knight has to simply capture uh, the white knight now, and then the black bishop will fall. Still some work to be done. Uh, the black knight is still a very, very good piece, but you would expect that Liam will eventually get there. He just needs to improve the white king, maybe improve the white rook right now. Giri, though, he's a good fighter. He's a good endgame player. What do you guys think? Chances to save this one? No, I don't think so, um, simply. I mean, black's extra 
pawn. Well, I say extra pawn, but if you look at Black's pawns on the king side, they're not really that useful. Mm. Uh, I mean, they're, they're good at defending the position, but they don't really help. Black's got four pawns over there. White's only got two, but, you know, so what? Uh, at some point, White's got this dangerous pawn in the middle of the board, which is a pass pawn, uh, which will probably just become a queen. So uh, the normal way to win this, you try to get your rook to the best square possible. So maybe bring it around the side and stop your opponent's king advancing by doing a bit of a force field against it. Uh, or maybe just trying to attack some of your opponent's pawns with that. Then you move your king into the middle. And then once you've got both of your pieces working well, push your pawn, get a queen. And, uh, you know, there we see, uh, well, we see this plan in action now. And there's not really much black can do against that because black doesn't have any counterplay. The knight is much worse than the rook in the ending. And, um, I, you know, it's just a matter of time here, really. Which means Liam, he's going to be a two out two, right? I mean, that's a great start for um, Liam Lee, who's suddenly playing very well now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, a very impressive game from him so far. And I agree with you, Simon. I, I feel that black has got no chance. Mm. Barring a mouse lip. Yeah, barring a mouse lip or a miracle. We and did see and um, sorry David, you were saying. No, no I was just going to say it would be a huge shock here. Maybe the biggest shock of the tournament if Giri holds this one. Mm. I was going to say, because uh, we did see in uh, the talk with uh, Zubair from Meltwater, who's monitoring all social media for the tour, that Vietnam is actually on uh, one of the top uh, countries talking about chess and talking about the tournament. So. Is chess big in Vietnam? And I bet if so, Liam Le is a big chess star. Yeah, it's, it's relatively big mm -hmm. in uh, Vietnam. And uh, one of the interesting things about Liam uh, and his career was that he got to a level where he was much better than anyone else in ah. Vietnam. And so they didn't know what to do with him. So they were like, okay, well, so they, they sent him abroad and he trained in Russia with some Russian grandmasters. Ah. And uh, definitely, you know, when you have a star and someone who's playing in the top levels, it's so easy to build a fan base. It's so nice as well when everyone gets behind him. Because, I mean, take a look at Magnus and see Seaman, Agdestein, together, those two have inspired generations mm. of chess players. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Vietnam does have some other strong players. That he was kind of neck and neck with another player for most of his career, uh, Liam. I remember playing in Vietnam when I was 17, 18 years old, and it was a World Youth Championship. And I think that was the first time I realised that, I mean, there were so many chess fans out there. Players were getting mobbed, and these were youth players at the time. Wow. Uh, including Liam, including um, some of his countrymen. They were big celebrities. Meanwhile, Giri trying to fight. Black's knight has done a bit of a dance into White's camp, going after some of these white pawns. It feels like the black knight should get trapped somehow, if Liam is careful. Yeah, I've, I think it's still one-way traffic, really. I mean, uh, maybe the king can just advance and come to the centre. Mm -hmm. That'd be my, my first way, my first thought here. I don't think you have to worry too much about that pawn, the white knight, the black knight's attacking. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all, it's, there's always tricks, isn't there, with a knight, you know? You have to really watch out. Uh, you, you know, the knights are the trickiest pieces. They can jump around at this level, though. You know, you, you shouldn't fall for anything too nasty with a knight. And uh, White now has managed to coordinate his, his king and his rook. Yeah. And uh, he's got to be careful he doesn't lose that. If he loses the centre pawn, yeah. then, it, then it will be a draw. So you've got to make sure that centre pawn is White's, like, key trump. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's got to make sure he uses that rather than loses it. But, OK, I mean, if you lose a pawn at any time, it's pretty bad news, so... Just yeah. uh, at some point push it and make it a queen, I think, is mm. the simplest way to play this. And I do think Anisha's best chance is perhaps just to run with his B-pawn and just try to initiate some trades. But it's such a big mountain to climb. Yeah, the problem is Black's B-pawn is easily stopped by the white uh, rook. The white king is also going to, at some point, maybe now the white king comes back and kicks away the black knight. But yeah, I mean, this is just a matter of time. Giri, he's trying everything he can. Again, the problem is the Black Knight is not on a safe square. It's not anchored, supported by any pawns. It can get kicked away at some point. Maybe the White Rook can come kick it away now. Yeah, it's, it's getting close, though, for Liam. His technique's been perfect so far. He just needs to avoid any nasty knight tricks. The top players in the world, though, they're very good at kind of dominating their opponent's knights, just walking away from any forks. And uh, here we go. White's rook steps behind the pass pawn. Black has to push it. 
There's one trick in the position. You don't want to move towards the Black Knight with the White King. What if you move towards the Black King, David? <laughs> <laughs> this is, this, these are the kind of moves you just got to watch out for, right? I mean, uh, show this. Yeah. Okay. He pushes a pawn. He's just waiting here, Liam. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned there, Simon, if you move towards the Black Knight, it looks like you're kicking it away. But whoops, check. And the rook is on the same circuit. You lose your rook. And likewise, if you'd stepped forward, nice and aggressive. Again, you walk too close to your rook. It's a check, and you get hit. So just never, ever put your king on the same circuit as your rook, just in case. Uh, so Liam uh, kind of pushed his pawn forward, the black king moved across, and now it's safe uh, in this position. And uh, look how this knight is completely controlled, completely dominated, no more serious checks, uh, especially now, and the pawn drops off. Yeah. And we will see the game end, I think, any moment now. Uh, the pawn has indeed fallen, and although black's knight is back, kind of on a safer a square, it will not be enough to hold the game. As Simon said, this is the key pawn. Sooner or later, it will push forward. And the White King will support it first. Also, a path in. Game over. Wow. Liam is going to win this one. And that means a draw in game three will be enough to win the match. Yesterday, we had three matches decided in only three games. Magnus Carlsen, the only one to take it to tie breaks with uh, Jan Christoph Duda. But is this a sign players are getting a little bit tired. It's been a long tournament. So many games they're playing. Yeah, perhaps it would only be natural, right? I mean, it's really intense mentally, physically, yeah. to play so many games for so many hours. How, how important do you think it is nowadays to be fit um, when you play chess? Because that, that seems to be quite a trend, hmm. um, I'd say, in the last, well, 20, 30 years? Because yeah. if you go back to the old world champions, I mean, they used to be smoking. And, yeah. and, uh, I know we've got the Air Things devices, but imagine giving, putting that next to one of Macau Tao's games when he was <laughs> on his 50th cigarette drawing a game, you know? It would start it, beeping. It would, just, it would alarm, the, you know, it would go red and start. But yeah, but in the old days, you know, they were quite famously not, not particularly fit. And OK, we have a result here, yeah. We do have a result. It's another win for Liam Le on fire. He won his match yesterday as well against Pragnananda and now leading by two points in each Giri and trouble struggling in his match against uh, Liam Le today. One uh, game is still going on in uh, the arena. Prague and Duda playing game two. That looks like a draw and a selfie. He's popular, Liam Le. The fans want a piece of uh, the one today who has won Two games so far, the only player to do so today. Liam Lea, he must be very happy. And Ishgiri, as always, he sits uh, by the computer for a long time, looking over the game. And let's hear from Liam. Wow, Liam, you are really playing good chess right now. What is it that has happened as this tournament has progressed? I tend to play better uh, toward the end than uh, than from the beginning. But I think today, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on good form and also probably not an ish best day. It's uh, looking like you may decide this in three now. You just need a draw in the last game. Is it a little bit hard when you have to defend like that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm certain that he will put pressure in the next game with White. So I have to try to survive. Um, it may look easy, but um, I remember yesterday Duda lost uh, the last two games uh, against Magnus, so it's never easy. Good luck to you. Thank you. All right, I said it was looking like a draw this game too with Duda and Prague, but suddenly the bar is shot up for Duda. Is he about to go up by two points? Objectively, White is winning, but it's still a slightly tricky. Um, there's a nice trap on the board there, actually. Black's knight went to take a pawn. If the White Bishop had come back and taken that Black Knight, White would have lost. Black's pawns would have just rolled down the board. So Duda ignoring what's happening on this left flank, which looks super scary, instead initiating this race. It's just about whether White's H-pawn is quick enough. And according to the computer, it is. Black's knight is just too far away from really jumping back to the defense, from contributing. And it looks like the white h-pawn is going to be the winner. White just needs to move his king out the way now and start pushing Harry the h-pawn up. Where should the white king go? I mean... The big question. That's what Sue is hesitating about. Yeah, I mean, you've got to be careful not to put the king on the wrong square. And by the wrong square, I mean on the same diagonal as the b1 square. If you put it on the light square diagonal, then maybe you'd have to calculate that a pawn could come with check. Okay. Any puts it there. No. I think it's still winning, right? I mean, the bishop always. I don't oh. know. I don't. F 
Uh, well, okay, it's not according to the bar. Oh, right, okay. We will see this race, and first, Black's Knight has to move. You cannot have pushed your B pawn because the Black Knight would have been captured by White's Bishop. Now, White's pawn is two squares away. Black is threatening to Queen first, though, as Ivanka mentioned, with check. And uh, it wouldn't have been check if you'd put your king on a different square. White would have been able to push and win. Right. So now Prague's knight is back in time. Very good point, Yvanka. I mean, just mentioning that it was so... Yeah, yeah, just don't put your king on the same queen in square that allows that extra tempo for black. That was really... I thought they were both winning, but this, is, this could be a great save, right, from Prague, yeah. as the knight is now running around just in time. Uh, and it didn't have to be this way. Yeah, it did not have to be this way. And uh, now that check is coming with that knight, white's king is definitely on the wrong square. I mean, how resourceful is this from yeah. Prague? Maybe Duda was just fixated on Black pushing his pawns and he thought, OK, White's pawns are quicker, I'm going to win this game. But the Black Knight, it was so far away, it was on the other side of the board and it's jumped back within th two, three moves. And he found it instantaneously, yeah. this, this idea. I mean, it's still immensely complicated to my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, but th there's probably no way... I mean, you can try to take the Knight at some point. Is that one way you can try to win this? It's still, it's still a little bit yeah. of complications here, right? It's anyone's game right now. The problem for Black, the problem for Prague, uh, apart from the clock, is that you just don't have that many waiting moves. Black's can, knight is going to be stuck just defending the corner. Can the white king come and take the black pawns? I mean, that, that, that's something, because uh, Black can't really move, right? And uh, the only move you're going to be able to make is putting your knight in the corner. Uh, I think white's king is stuck near its pawns. Uh, it, OK, it does start moving across. Black's just going to kind of put his pawns protecting each other. He's going to move his knight back and forth, back and forth, and he's going to cross his fingers and hope. It definitely is only Duda who can win this game. Yeah. White's bishop holds the black pawns easily. It's still massively complicated, actually. <laughs> yeah, really complicated. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I'm guessing the white king is going to start making his way back towards... I don't think you can. If you go too far towards the black pawns, one of the white pawns will fall. Yeah, OK, and black is just waiting. Yeah. Black's king, yeah, again, if the white king moves away, black's king is ready to come towards the white pawns. What's the winning plan? Maybe there is no winning plan for Duda. Maybe Prague has set up a fortress that cannot be infiltrated, cannot be broken. <laughs> I mean, could he perhaps relocate his bishop? And, yep. uh, and then try to do some funny stuff with the king? And then? Uh, so, for example, let's see um, if White does try to move his king. Uh, there aren't that many possible winning plans. He does move his bishop. I don't think this changes much. Uh, Prague is trying to keep this one in his pocket for later. But, for example, if he plays it, what is White going to do? For example, if you move your king away, I'm just going to give you a check. If you move your king towards the black pawns, I'm going to wait. As soon as you go too far away, I'm going to distract away the, black, uh, the white bishop. And then the black king is simply going to go and take this pawn. And if the white king can't come towards the black pawns, What's your winning plan? Uh, that's the big question. He needs to somehow do the put Prague in Zugzwang. And, OK, Prague doesn't commit with his pawn. He just moves his king instead. That's a decent waiting move, it looks like. Yeah, there's no way to kind of fix Prague's pieces in the corner. If you could fix this knight, fix this king, make them not move, then maybe you win. But It's amazing, actually, because oh. Black's knight, you know, knights are short-range pieces meaning it's very hard to get a knight from one side to the other. Look how quickly that knight came from the queen side all the way over to the corner, to the defensive position. And uh, we can still see that white's going for this uh, zugzwang now. Um, this is the only way. Uh, so, for example, if you could just keep this position as white, mm -hmm. uh, black would run out of moves. Um, so this is still, like, you know, still a little bit scared, but it's amazing defence from Prague so far to get that knight all the way over there so quickly. Maybe White can try to triangulate with his king. Here we yeah. go, he moves his king back. If Black waits, he'll move his king across. He'll just lose a move. And now same position as earlier, but this time it's Black to move rather than White. And Black can't, doesn't really want to move his pawn. He can't move his king because the White King comes in. So are you forced to maybe move your knight? And uh, this was very tricky now because after the bishop captures, uh, we'll see another queen arrive on the board, a queen arrive on the board, and it's just about whether... White is winning this. It doesn't feel like he should be because this pawn is very dangerous too. It feels like this one should be a draw. We could see four queens. Yeah, we could uh, see four uh, queens uh, on I the board. Want, I want to see four queens on the board. I, think uh, I, I, I don't think we'll see four queens. I know, but, you know, we can dream. <laughs> I think I once had a game where I had five queens on the board. 
which was which was a lot of fun against the grandmaster, and of course I lost. <laughs> five queens, five, five queens, five queens. Must yeah, record at grandmaster level. Yeah, well, yeah, it was, it was very interesting, and um, yeah, we just kept queening pawns. Mm -hmm. um, but that is probably it. Looks like Duda's best bet to to try and go for that. It's the only um, bet. It's the only bet. Yeah, there's no other way you can break down defence. Duda's been under 20 seconds now for a while. Pragnananda as well, very low on the clock. But at least Prague's moves are easy, right? Black's just going to wait with his king until he's forced to do something. Duda has, has to find the winning plan. Duda wants to make things happen. Prague just needs to get out of this game, survive by a miracle. Yeah. And here we go. Black's king just yo-yoing back and forth, back and forth. And okay, we've reached that position yeah. that we mentioned earlier, and Black's knight is the only piece that can move safely. There we go. It's a check. We're going to get this ending. I mean, that ending looked very dangerous to black to me. It did. Uh, I mean, the white pawn is, is so close and, it, you know, it's, it's often who, who gets the first move in these, these endings. Oh, um, OK. So we're going to get this now. And... Ooh, a queen. We, queen is... Mm -hmm. Queens are coming. Yeah. And maybe the big question is whether white can give a check now and then yeah. just pick up black's pawn. I'll pick up the pawn, right. No, yeah. You have to go this way with the black yeah. king. Uh, if you'd gone the other way, white's queen would have slid across. There would have been a nasty check, a nasty skewer. And maybe now you just pick up black's pawn and he there has. we go. No more four it. queen endgame. Yeah. This, is, this is actually... Uh, I've had this ending a couple of times and the black king is in a terrible position for this ending. You've got to be very careful about white checks with the queen and you actually want the black king in one of the in, in a corner uh, in this kind of ending to avoid those checks. So my gut feeling is that White should be winning here because of the position of the Black King, uh, unless he's got some perpetual. But I can't see any perpetual because the Black Queen is um, not in the centre of the board. It's it's on the side. You want your Queen in the centre, really, when you're trying to defend this as well. It's weird. You want you want to swap your Queen and King around basically as Black here to give yourself the best drawing chances. Yeah, and uh, the White King has a a good square to hide behind. I mean, he can hide on the F8 square. F7. And in front of your own pawn. Yep. You can use the white pawn as shelter, simply. And uh, the black king is completely in the way. Yeah. Amazing. As you mentioned, Simon, maybe if you swap the, white, the black king and queen around, maybe it would be a draw. For, uh, yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but yeah. Uh, yeah, queen and pawn endgames are the trickiest. Look at the focus on Duda's face. He knows he's winning now. Just needs to convert it. Tuck that king away in front of your own pawn. And uh, God, it's going to be so frustrating for Prague. I mean, he, he fought his way back. It looked like it was a draw, and then and then you lose again. It's like you lost the game twice. So very very frustrating for him. And uh, it's going to be a completely white round. White is going to win every single game from these four. And Ooh. we talked about it beforehand, Kaya. But yeah, with the white pieces, suddenly everyone is uh, dominant today. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Meanwhile, a check. Is it likely now from the White Queen? There's, there's still tricks of falling into perpetual here. I, you know, you have to be very careful. Uh, queen endings are notoriously tough. Uh, you've got to make sure you put your king when attacking on the right square. Um, but I think we showed this in another Champions Tour, the idea of a cross check. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we'll see that idea come to life at some point in this one. Yeah. Um, and now the pawn's ready to, to move up yeah. one square. Black has to just give checks. That's the only way to stop White or take away time from White to push his pawn. The White King's going to try and dance back now. And here comes your idea, Simon. The King is going to step to the e6 square, and if Prague gives a check, there will come a cross check. Yeah, let's show this. There's only one safe check you can give right now uh, because, uh, as you guys mentioned, if you check on the wrong square, this is why Black's King is so badly placed. It wants to be hiding away in the corner somewhere. But now uh, the cross check is this one. White meets a check. Uh, on the last move, this is a check. White meets a check with a check of his own, forcing the queens off. And uh, once the queens disappear, of course, white is the only one who's making a queen. So Prague had to find the right square to check on. He did that. And he checks in the center. So there's no way white can block this check safely now. Uh, so back to square one. OK, Duda goes this way again. So clever. A check is met by a cross check hitting the king. And uh, the queens come off, white is going to win. So you've got to be so careful where you check from. He checks from this angle. Uh, white can block this now, however, maybe with his queen. Uh, this is very, very tempting. You could also make an argument for just moving your king forward, perhaps. Uh, you can move your king in a variety of ways. You can maybe step back. But either way, it does feel like if this pawn gets one square further forward at some point, white is going to win this game. Prague's king is just stuck in no man's land. It doesn't want to be there. It wants to be hiding. And, OK, he does step back. 
We're running out of checks now. For so Duda, uh, what is the Prague. reason Prague is not uh, giving up yet? Is it still very difficult for Duda to, yeah. to find the right moves to get uh, that uh, second queen? Yeah, it's still not impossible. Duda has to find a shelter for his king eventually. There's The way that you draw this position is that you just give checks and white can, uh, cannot find a way to escape. Uh, so he's going to keep checking forever. He's already given six or seven checks in a row. There's another block. Uh, he's just got to hope that Duda doesn't find somewhere safe to plant this king and hope that Duda doesn't, doesn't find time to push this pawn. You should never give up in any queen and pawn endgame unless you're guaranteed to lose, unless your opponent's definitely making a new queen, because there's always chances of what we call a repetition or a perpetual check. The position repeating itself twice, uh, three times. Mm -hmm. Oh, that must be difficult for Duda to constantly have that in the back of his head as well. Yeah, there's also the 50 move rule. Uh, if you can check, it takes a lot of effort, but if you can check 50 times and stop White from pushing this pawn forward, uh, then it will be a draw. White needs to make a pawn move within 50 moves. It's not always easy. The checks, they're very hard to escape from, and sometimes they, it's hard to make them run out. So when was the last uh, pawn move? Oof. Let me go back and check, Kaya. It was... Hmm... <laughs> long, long time ago. The last capture was on move 73. OK. So wow. we've had 11 moves. <laughs> right. He's got 39 more, though, to go. 123. Is that what we're... Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> we're a long, long way. <laughs> OK. All right. He won't have that number in his mind. He just needs to survive move by move. He's doing, he's doing pretty well at the moment. Yeah, he's um, doing well, but yeah, I mean, so. I, I was ex waiting for the king to hide here. Yeah. And the whole idea is that if the queen comes and checks on the eighth row, then you can step up one square and hide and use your own pawn as shelter. And we're going to see it. Yeah, and the pawn's, the pawn's about to advance one square, isn't it, now? Mm. Uh, and this is kind of the process. This is the only way to try and make it difficult, pin the pawn down. But this should be... Uh, a way you can progress here, maybe you rearrange the queen to a better square, and then the king, and then the pawn goes. So yeah, just tuck the white queen next to that white pawn, free up the white king to run if it needs to. Yeah. Um, I think that's uh, normally the technique, but Duda looking slightly annoyed, slightly frustrated that the game yeah. is still going. This well, move does avoid some checks. Yeah, but it gets in the way of the pawn a little yeah. bit. I mean, he's not, he's not making, you know, it's not simple, actually. It's not as simple as I, I had imagined, and Prague is making it certainly as difficult as he can and, uh, to, we have, to finish. We have to remember both players are playing with seconds left on the clock. You, know, you can see Bragg has got 10 seconds, young Christoph Duda 23 seconds. Not easy to kind of calculate your way through these uh, complications. Yeah, but in this type of endgame that only favours the attacker, the defender, it's much, much harder for him with only 20 seconds. If you make one slip, you lose on the spot. As the attacker, you make one slip, OK, you might have to go around a few times with your king, but um, the game just continues. So Duda has the practical uh, side in his favour as well, gives a couple of checks. And also, I find that these, these endings, queen endings, are probably where the biggest difference between humans and computers are. Mm -hmm. um, this is where computers are so much better than humans uh, because they can see all the checks, all the, all the, all the, you know, all the possibilities, but for a human to work out all the checks, it's just not, not really possible to do. Mm. Uh, so there's a, you know, this is where computers really excel uh, in this in this type of uh, ending. And we do we see um, the other players coming into the arena about to start their game threes. Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Farusha are tied, winning one game each. And it's all about the white pieces in that match. And it is Farusha with the white pieces. We will jump right into that game when this one finishes. It is drama for Prague. Oh, I, what <laughs> happened there? Unless we're missing something, I think the evaluation bar will correct itself and okay. go back in White's favour. It's nearly a well, stalemate. Actually, actually <laughs> according to the table base, this is a draw if he plays Whoa. this king move. Wow, wow, Prague, <laughs> if he defends this. I mean, we've been impressed with him so far this tournament, but this is like a hopeless situation almost where you just keep it going as long as possible. But yeah, maybe this is really clever because now the Black King does cause some annoying uh, threats. The Black Queen is just on the ideal square, actually. Normally, we want Queen centralised like White's is, but for the defending side, you want your Queen as far away as possible so you can give check from a bunch of and angles. Prague is playing it so accurately. You know, he's, he's finding all those drawing moves. This was the only square to put the King in order to draw the game. Wow, you had three seemingly 
equal squares and he's found the best one. How can he play how can he play like stockfish in this ending? I mean like no one plays like, no one plays like stockfish in this ending. Hard work. It's, it's, impo it's impossible defending these ones and, and the position's just... repeated itself twice. If we yeah. see this position again on the board now or any time in future it's a draw. Oh. So Duda has to be really careful where he puts his queen. He has to be careful. He needs to push his pawn sometime soon. Yeah. And uh, the problem is if you push your pawn now as white, the black queen's going to come to the center or come up the board. There's going to be checks from side, checks from diagonals. But it's, I mean, it, the computer is not really sure. Okay, it's back to, it's again, so hard to tell, isn't it? Yeah. But for humans, it's impossible to tell, yeah, right? Yeah, it is. I think if I had this position with white, I would still think I was winning. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, uh, the, I, I think the problem that white's getting, though, the white queen was beautifully placed in the centre of the board, and you want your queen in the centre of the board because you cover more squares. But when your queen is over here in the corner somewhere, you're not covering as many squares, and that means your opponent has more checks with their queen against you. So uh, this, this is the issue. But again, if I was defending this, I'd have no idea where to put my king now. I mean, I, I really... Yeah, a lottery. You have a choice of four squares, you choose one randomly. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, once again, Pragnananda chose the only move wow. that draws. You know, yeah. the key is to kind of shuffle the king between those two squares, and Prag just seems to know what he's doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think he's just making calcul kind of um, calculated guesses all the time. He's educated guesses, just trying to uh, hope that his king is near enough the white pawn. I think maybe one of the problems now as well is if there are those kind of cross checks and the queens get traded off, Black's king is quite near the white pawn, so you might be able to stop it. And already, Duda has to be really careful of yeah. avoiding a repetition. Very close to being threefold now. He's tried nearly every square of his queen. He has to push the pawn, but is there now a perpetual check? Because white's queen is a little bit offside. It's not in the center of the board, so now black can check, and it's a lot harder Only for white to escape those checks. Only one way to draw, and guess what? Pragt is finding that check. Yeah. Yeah. That last one was obvious. I mean, there was literally no other check on the board, so he had to find that one, and he did. But uh, it's about whether he finds the next few checks uh, accurately. And, it, and it's all about the white king. Can it escape? And I don't think the white king can escape the checks now. And, and look, Duda. Duda, you can see, he's distraught. Yeah. I mean, how did Prague save this? His king was on a terrible square. He's put it on the perfect square, found all the right checks, found all the right manoeuvres with the black queen. Yeah. Okay, the white king is trying to do a zigzag back, but Duda not looking happy at all. The checks are going to continue from the side now. And as you pointed out, David, if a queen exchange happens now, black's king is in, in range of the white pawn, so uh, black can actually exchange queens in a lot of positions now. Uh, the Black King's done a, a fabulous job of finding the right squares. But, s s I mean, it might not look like these endings are so hard, but they are so hard to find the right squares for the king and the queen, and it's so hard for a human to do this. And They're stressful because you literally have five or six squares every time. Black checked the White King. White's king could have chosen from six different squares. How do you choose as a human with only 20, 30 seconds on your clock? You yeah. just have to guess all the time. Brill um, brilliant defence from Prague. Yeah. Prague has been guessing correctly. He's been calculating correctly. Very important for the tournament as well because, you know, if Prague can come back in this match, he's playing Magnus Carlsen tomorrow. I think we're a little bit excited about that one, maybe, <laughs> uh, just to see how that's going to go. And if he can beat Magnus Carlsen, what a way, what a way to finish off Miami, right? Um, yeah. So this, you know, he's keeping it alive until the till right till the end of the tournament. We could have three players within one point of each other going into tomorrow's final round. Yeah. Amazing. And, uh, okay, the checks continue. Where's White's king hiding? As you said, Simon, the White Queen just cannot jump in to block. She's on a bad square now. Yeah. Going to the top of the board, this doesn't change anything. Black can continue checking from the side. Uh, the Black Queen can step up one square. You could also check on the diagonal now. Diagonal checks are usually very effective. Um, yeah, Prag. He's spoilt for choice, but he's defended perfectly. He just can't take his eye off the ball. The problem is here, Prague has just defended like a lion for 50, what is it, 40, 50 moves. If he takes his eye off the ball and does make one small mistake, he's lost again. So um, that's the pressure of these Queen Endgames. But luckily for him, he just has to keep on checking. Yeah. As long as he doesn't move that king from his perfect square of h6, he is fine. Yeah. But the other fun funny thing is he's had to draw this game twice, right? Mm -hmm. He's had to draw the ending not once, because we had a knight ending before, and he had to draw that, and he's drawn it. He's now drawn the queen ending. It is over after uh, one hour and seven minutes. They finish the game with a draw.
Massive result for Prague. He is still down by one point, but he now has a bigger hope of coming back in the match. They have 10 minutes before the start of game three. Let's see if we can have some reactions in Miami. And you had to go through there. Yeah, I think I probably had a simple draw, but I I went for this uh, suffering, which was just bad, yeah. Does it make you really tired to have to defend for so long? Yeah, it, it does. It then take your break from Yeah, thanks. Massive save by uh, the 17 year old. He uh, still needs to win a game, but it's not going to be a must win in game three. If he lost it, that would have been a must win. A draw and a win in the last game, and he takes it to tie breaks. All right, we're jumping into game three. Ali Reza Vruja with the white pieces against Magnus Carlsen, winning one game each. They are tied. So much action in their match so far today. And we're jumping in on move eight. What's happening on the board, David? So far, just very, very standard stuff from both sides. But this is more like the Magnus that we're used to. He's played a very normal opening. He's played actually probably his strongest opening as black, uh, opening with a Sicilian defense. And he's taking this one really seriously. He knows that Vruja so dangerous with white now. Uh, he just needs to neutralize him. He needs to survive this game, the world champion, if he wants to win today's match. And uh, I guess nothing too much to write home about at the moment. White's king is castled, the black king is castled. Magnus has two choices. He can make the game a bit slower. He can just push a pawn in the center one square, or he can explode things open immediately by pushing a pawn in the center two squares, the pawn in front of the black queen. He can change the nature of the game. He, against Ferruja, you normally want to slow things down. But that's an argument to be made if you can solve your opening problems immediately as black, if you can kind of clarify your task, make the game really forcing, then why not go for it? Mm, and yeah. uh, what do you think, Ivanka, of this opening choice for black? Uh, I think it's a great opening choice. The position is closed. And uh, like you say, you know, he has a pleasant choice ahead of him. I'm also quite hesitant to kind of liven up the position because that seems to favour Bruja at all times. So instead, I would be closing it down and playing the more gradual game, which I think favours Magnus and his style, which is a lot more based on strategy. Yep. So strategically speaking, we're expecting Magnus to just slowly push pawns, develop pieces, no complications, no calculation, don't let Ferruja play on his terms. And uh, for Ferruja, it's kind of the other way around. He's hoping Magnus opens, opens things up. He's hoping that uh, he gets the chance to maybe attack, start playing on the front foot, creating threats on every turn. That's what Ferruja loves to do. And uh, okay, Magnus, after two minutes of thought, yet to move, a bit surprising. I think he just needs to go back to basics here, just keep things calm, keep things quiet. This, mm -hmm. Despite starting out as a Sicilian defence, this one does look like a King's Pawn opening now. And after all, there is no one better in the world at King's Pawn openings with both colours than Magnus. So uh, he just needs to use a bit of pattern recognition. I guess that's what all the top players will be doing here. They'll be just comparing this position to kind of uh, similar positions they've seen in other openings. Yeah. And uh, whilst Magnus is considering what to do, well, Maybe I can share with you some selfies. We are asking everyone at home to show us how you are cheering for your favorite player. And Tosiro says, well, he has an impression of Magnus Carlsen against Ali Reza. And, uh, oh, is that a dog? That's a dog, yay. That's a cute dog. <laughs> That's a very cute dog. And uh, Kawarene is saying, such an honor of being able to watch Magnus cool to chess 24 and look it looks like he's live in miami yes so a big shout out to koarani and uh finally goran well he's playing david's favorite <laughs> game to <Chili> chess <laughs> and work while the games are on that's just showing off goran oh, i'm never challenging you to a chili chess game i promise you that <laughs> Yeah, how did you enjoy that, uh, David? You're not a big fan of spicy food. No, my mouth is still burning a year <laughs> later. But uh, yeah, I did go to India recently and it was it was a challenge. Yeah, I was going to ask that. What was that like uh, oh. with the food? Can I, can I, can I tell Mike? So I, I got there the day before the tournament started and I thought, you know, I've been training on my chili levels and I, you know, I th was really proud of myself because the food was, I felt a little bit spicy, but nothing I couldn't handle. And when other people were going, oh, this is spicy, I was like, ah, no problem. And then on the final day, everybody left because they had to catch morning flights and I was still around because my flight was in the evening. And suddenly 
the food was really spicy. Ah. And I thought, oh no, they'd been playing with us. They deliberately made it mild. Hmm. I was a bit sad. Ah. Yeah, I did hear that uh, each hotel, the chefs had to submit uh, beforehand samples of the food they would cook, sample of the food they would serve, um, just to check that they were at the right levels, not too hot. And uh, the government requested, I mean, the government set a specific menu that the, each hotel had to serve from, and okay. it was much milder than usual. Um, so, thanks to yeah. all the chefs out there. You oh. saved my life. Oh, I, I love a bit of spice, yeah. I do. So <laughs> I'd love to try some of those hot dishes. Me too. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting... I'm getting a liking yeah. for hot food. Well, great to hear that they took care of the chess players. And someone who knows all about Indian food, of course, is uh, Tanya. Tanya, how are you liking the food in uh, Miami for the FDX Crypto Cup? It's actually super good, guys. We just had a massive lunch layout. It felt like a total celebration here, by the way. You guys were talking about chili chess. It's all about the hot and spicy chess action that we're seeing here by the players. I've got Grandmaster Alejandro with me right now. Now, Ali, we've seen massive fights. What a big save by Prague there. Magnus losing the first game, coming back. Your take on the day so far. I think the Alareza Magnus match is really fun because it's back and forth. It's incomprehensible games they started out with. Magnus playing terribly on the first one, Alareza giving the point right back immediately. I want to see how it finishes up, but to me, Prague. What a defense, the way that these kids calculate is impressive. That is an end game that is easier to lose, even when it's technically a draw, than it is to hold at any point. And he just calculated his way out of trouble impressively, never let it go once the draw was in his grasp. I am so, so amazed by the calculating ability of these players. Especially when with such little time on the clock, such precise play. Now I've got to ask you, we are past the halfway mark for the day here. The players are in round three, looking at their form. Make a prediction, Ale, Magnus or Firuja today? Ooh, I have to go with Ali Reza today just because I feel he's more focused. But I'm going to give you a, a big prediction. Prague comes back and wins the match. I love it. All right, guys, back to the chess with you in the studio. Ah, thank you, Tanya and Alejandro. Yep, chili chats going on in Miami today. It's spicy and it's dramatic. Magnus Carlsen tied with Ali Reza Vruja, a big smile on his face. Still probably listening, listening to something funny, but in game two, it didn't bother him too much. He won the game. And in this one, is it normal Magnus chess we're seeing? It's the Magnus we're used to for sure. Uh, if you look at the clock times, first of all, Magnus as black has a couple of minutes advantage uh, on the board. It's very quiet, very calm, very strategic. That only favors Magnus of these two players and their styles, their preferences. I guess the third factor here is that the white bishop in the middle of the board, I was going to say, is attacked by the black knight. You could trade off a knight for bishop. You could gain the bishop pair here as black. That looks very tempting, uh, I think. Magnus, he would love to just snap off that white light squared bishop, which is the key piece in all of these openings. And uh, the game will go on, still chances for both sides, but it suits his style. I just don't see this being a Ferrucia type of position unless he can properly get, get some kind of uh, initiative, some kind of attack against the Black King, which is a mile away still. How about you guys? Am I being biased here? And just uh, again, that thought of the bishop pair uh, that Black can seize? No, I mean, I, I, I agree. Um, you know, we, the first game was totally Ferruja. He got all these active pieces, and Magnus obviously had a bit of a weak king. Uh, the second game, well, Magnus got his positional stuff in, and this game is much more closed, and White's pieces don't have that freedom that they had in the first game. Uh, and I think taking that bishop in the middle of the board seems really natural. I mean, I, I just whip that one off. Uh, it gives Black a better pawn structure. You get rid of um, a weakness, a square that's a weakness. That, that the, Where the pawn is there was a very weak square, but now there's a pawn in the way, so it's not a weak square. And also, you get a very nice majority of pawns on the king side, right? Mm. So you can start throwing your king side pawns forwards and you can get the attack later on, kind of risk-free, it looks to me like. So uh, I, I would probably say Black's a little bit better here. And if Magnus can win this game, then he'll be big, big favourite with the white pieces because Ferruja is, as we know, so much better with white than he is with black. Yeah, and I just don't really see what white does here. Normally, the idea for white would be to kind of establish two nice knights on this side of the board. But as you mentioned, Simon, now you can just step forward. Black's knight is normally the problem piece. In this type of situation, it's kind of dominated by this white pawn. But now it does have a nice square. 
to, to sit on and develop to. Uh, there are also ideas at some point of targeting this pawn, forcing white to make a concession. Just looks like one-way traffic. And um, I guess the only consolation maybe if uh, white doesn't develop is that you can break open the center, you can push forward in the middle, but black has at least two tempting ideas that I see here. You, for example, you could capture and then just push on, leaving white with these kind of weird-looking uh, kind of doubled isolated pawns in the middle. Uh, maybe you can start attacking them. Sorry, uh, you can start attacking them later with this light squared bishop. Um, that's one idea. Second idea, if you just want to be rock solid and not change the nature of the position, not maybe allow Alareza to start jumping in with any knights towards the king. Uh, the other option here would be to, again, just push the pawn forward one square, bring the knight in. Black is super solid. Not that much can go wrong. I just feel that this is going to be the most important piece long term, the unchallenged light squared bishop. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you, Simon. I would just whip this off instantly and whatever the consequences, I think black is ready to deal with them. Yeah, bishop pair, better pawn structure. Everything Magnus loves. Hmm. With the black pieces uh, this time, so would you say Furuja is in trouble so far in the game? <sighs> he's not losing, he's not massively worse, but his opening has not gone right, Furuja, compared to the first game where he was just all over Magnus from hmm. move 10. Uh, this time it's yeah slower pace and that does favor favor the Norwegian here. Yeah, only 19 years old, Ali Reza Farusak, still considered a junior, the top rated junior in the world. Um, what is his uh, style, Ali Reza Farusak? So we haven't seen him on the tour this season. This is his first tournament. Mm -hmm. What is he? What is his style known for? Well, he He's actually a very active, dynamic player, you know, and uh, we saw in the candidates, he was playing to win every single game, you know, he is fearless. And uh, the moves that David and Simon pointed out, it's on the board. And uh, I, I, I think it's a well-rounded style, but here I, I do think that he is vulnerable to, on the positional level, perhaps especially where Magnus is superior. And Magnus actually retreated his knight to the edge of the board which I'm surprised about because when you guys put it on the D8 square, it looked like it looked like a great piece. You know, might not be great there and then, but it had a great future on the F7 square. Yeah, it looked like it at least had potential that Black Knight, and it was flexible if it had gone to the top of the board to go either way. Now the Black Knight is kind of committed to this flank, and the other reason I'm slightly skeptical of this knight jump is that it takes a defender away from the Black King, and I've played Faruja too many times uh, to know that. If you take pieces away from your king, he was just going to come at you and try and checkmate you. And Okay, he tries to take the fact that black has retreated by stepping forward and trading off a set of pawns. Magnus has gone for this exchange that we pointed out in the other variation, though. And black now has a majority. Black's two, uh, especially that pawn that's just stepped forward, is potentially very, very good. And white's pawn's in the middle, relatively weak. Can Magnus profit from that? On the plus side for Ferruja, the two white knights are going to start stepping towards the black king. This last move, the white bishop looking pretty good. This could go either way still. It's uh, still rich, complex. Yeah, it's in the balance, isn't it? Definitely. And uh, yeah, like, like you mentioned, the, the one good thing about white's position is uh, look where the pieces are. Uh, black's king really only has like a little rook and a little bishop defending it. But white's pieces are sort of coming that way. You've got the rook on the open file. The knights are coming that way. The bishop, maybe the queen. And as you mentioned, Frugia loves attacking. So that knight move that Magnus played does seem a bit mysterious. Is it going to be on the wrong side of the board? Quite potentially. Um, so I think a very interesting middle game in store for us here. Mm. Uh, can White generate an attack in this position? If he can, then, you know. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I was had kind a of question for both of you. Like, I mean, what is Black Magnus planning to do with his knight that's saddled on the edge? And I guess Magnus has answered it there and then, you know, the light square bishop develops and perhaps he's going to put the knight where the bishop came from and then find a home for it on the b6 square. Yeah, um, let's talk about the pieces right now while Magnus chuckles to himself, uh, looking very happy, probably with his position this time as well. Um, Yvanka, you mentioned that this knight is the problem piece. If white just waits, then for sure this knight is going to relocate to the newly vacated c8 square but uh, it's got a better, more active square in mind. For example, again, if white waits, then uh, it's got a target. This pawn is the weakness in white's camp. It's very, very hard to defend this guy uh, on a light square. And white has no more light squared bishop. And uh, okay, this is if white gives black lots of time. I guess the most kind of aggressive move would be to move this white knight out to attack the bishop. Now the bishop 
maybe it just sits on a nice outpost in the white camp. It could simply retreat, of course. Uh, it could take, simply take a step back. Decent piece here. But uh, maybe this is going to be a thorn in white side if he plants it. And we're going to find out where Magnus is going to go. But this bishop looks nice and still the idea of the knight coming. It takes a while for Magnus, but if the knight can win this pawn, then, uh, yeah. Oh. Rouge is going to really struggle. And Okay, Magnus does indeed plant his bishop deep in the white camp. And what is White going to do to try and whip up that attack? I don't see it. As Simon mentioned, it's nice having rooks on open files, but these two pieces are both defended by the Black Queen. I don't really see what the rooks are doing. White's queen is very passive. White's knights would love to kind of spring forward and attack pawns, but you're kind of playing with one piece right now. I don't yeah. see an attack. Yeah. I, d I don't see an attack either. Uh, somehow or other, I feel like the key is perhaps to lock the light squared bishop out of play. But uh, that's, again, very difficult to do. So I was thinking maybe to jump with a knight to the g5 square. Oh, okay, this one, sorry. Yeah, first. Mm -hmm. And then with the idea being that the knight can uh, centralize if it's attacked. Yep, so if the knight is kicked away, it can step back into the middle of the board. At least now uh, there's a path for the white queen towards the black king. Yeah. And then uh, the other knight can jump to the f5 square. True. The other knight is coming in as well. This looks very promising. I don't think black's going to kick the white knight back to a better square. That's true. Um, one question would be this kind of trade. Black's bishop is not necessarily that good. Uh, who does it favour? Magnus still chuckling away. <laughs> uh, we could see an exchange. Maybe now the black knight comes round and maybe uh, mm. it's a race where the white can whip up an attack. But if not, then this pawn is just going to drop. Is there, is there any length in white trying to give up the exchange here? Like rook a3? I know it's maybe a little bit over the top, um, but I, my, my, the danger here I'm thinking is that if, if White doesn't do something quite quickly mm -hmm. uh, and Magnus is able to get that knight manoeuvre in, then, then White's just going to be a lot worse because probably that pawn in the middle of the board is going to drop mm -hmm. and you're going to lose without a fight. So I'm just wondering if you can try, and it seems like that light square Bishop of Blacks is a key piece. Mm -hmm. Is this dangerous at all? It, I don't really believe it, I have to be honest, but... Um, you, you kind of feels like white needs a light square bishop to checkmate, but yeah. maybe another idea. OK, he's trying to get the queen over with this move then. That that makes sense as well, right? Yeah. Uh, I like this one, Simon. Desperate times call for desperate measures. If you can, for example, remove this bishop and plant a knight uh, in on the dream f5 square, maybe some chances. But Ferruja goes for less drastic, uh, drastic measures. He does indeed drop his knight back, so the queen is coming. How effective is this? The Black Knight's going to step back now, for sure. What else do you do? Maybe he has the same plan that I wanted to do, but rather than going forward, he went backward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe he jumps into this square, hoping now for the Knight jump, and the Queen jumping out as well. Yeah, this one is really heating up. Magnus has all the long-term advantages, but Ferruja, can he create this storm out of nothing? He Very needs cool. to. It's uh, heating up in the game and uh, remember everyone this is the second to last day we urge everyone still to get their free ftx crypto key you do it by downloading the ftx app you create your account and remember to use uh, the code crypto cup 2022 and uh, then of course very important to uh, join discord the the discord community for the ftx crypto cup and um when you do that, you can earn uh, points by engaging in polls, competitions. There is a bunch of stuff going on. And of course, the benefits of getting your free kip crypto key. First of all, $100,000 in total uh, prize funds. You can earn a lot of that money. And uh, daily drops, NFT drops every day. You can still grab the one today. And there will be a drop tomorrow as well. And uh, we urge all of you to get your free uh, crypto key to get the most out of this uh, this this very fun weekend of chess actually two days to go so get your crypto key on uh, FTX. Uh, I love it when uh, when we say free key because the players are getting free key on the board. Aha! These viewers at home they can get their free key. <laughs> yeah. I never thought about it that way. Free key. Yeah. It's free key in the FTX Crypto Cup and you can get your free key to join the. Freaky action. Oh, I should have made that joke yesterday, Freaky Friday. Yeah, oh, Ooh, that's true. <laughs> oh, I missed my shot. But uh, in the meantime... Magnus... I think everyone at Chess24 and FTX will be uh, upset now because they as well should have made something out of that. <laughs> freaky or... Friday. Yeah. That would have been perfect. I it's know. A classic film, isn't it, as well? Freaky Friday. Yeah. It's a good film, so, right? Good film. With yeah, Lindsay yeah. Lohan. 
Is that the one? Yeah, I think so. Was it the remake? Ah, yeah, maybe, of course. Yeah. Yep. You can have the what do you call them? The four mean girls. <laughs> as <well>. Exactly. <laughs> Lindsay Lohan. I wonder if she plays chess. We do know there are celebrities that play chess. Julia Roberts. Yeah. Madonna. And Madonna. Do you know someone yeah, who's just taken... Oh. Really? really? David, yeah. hit me to the oh, post. sorry, yeah. Ivanka. She's been posting about chess on Instagram quite yeah. a lot lately. Yeah. Nice. She's talking about the Queen. It's a favourite piece. Uh -huh. Aha. She get the board the right way around? Because they often don't. <laughs> I'm just saying, they sometimes don't. Yeah, I think I mean, she's posted with her account on one of these chess websites, and she's been playing a lot of games. She did. So I guess I, she knows how to set up the pieces. So you do find that, like you know, people, tr you know, these quite a lot of these celebrities, they want to act intellectual, so they get the chess board but out. Wait, wait, guys. I'm going to say Kaya's keyword. Look at the bar. The bar has gone like massively up in favour of whites. Yeah, from Magnus' yeah. side. Over wow. to Verusha. That means that there's a tactic on the board. And uh, is, it, is it knight takes pawn? Oof, yeah. Wow, that was not even on my radar, no, Ivanka. it wasn't on mine and either until the bar. Yeah, the bar shot up and Stockfish, there we see White's three best moves. Two of them, they keep the balance in the position, but that top move, you mentioned it, Ivanka, knight takes pawn on the c4 square. we got to jump in and show this because if Ferruja finds this, this is just incredible. I mean... He doesn't have the bar, remember. He doesn't have that kind of signal, that catalyst, to show that there is a strong tactic here. But it looks like the knight can just be captured. If it takes this pawn, it can be captured in two different ways. If the black queen captures, then whoops, white uh, now suddenly attacks this bishop or this knight. I'm not sure which one you capture, to be honest. But uh, two pieces up for grabs. You definitely don't lose material here for white, so you can rule this out. Uh, you can rule out black's queen taking the knight, at least. If the black bishop takes the knight, I guess you have to see that you bring your rook across. You pin this bishop along this file. Uh, big, big threat now of just winning this bishop with a pawn push. And he doesn't find it. This is tricky. I mean, even here, it's hard to evaluate, for example, if the black pawn moves forward. I guess white whips up a big, big attack uh, using his knight. And white is a piece down, but black pieces are too loose. This queen is overstretched. This would have been a massive turnaround. White would have been on top for sure, but uh, difficult tactic there. So, OK, understandably, Ferruja continues with his plan. He drops his knight in the middle of the board instead. And the game goes on. Will this black knight now maybe bring itself uh, to a better square? Yeah, I mean, what a shot that would have been. Yeah. Knight takes pawn in this position, and we might have seen Ferruja win again with white. Instead, the knight moves, and black has time not to move his knight, but brings his queen just to cover this f5 square, so white's, knight, white's other knight cannot jump in. Still, I mean, it's hanging by a thread for both sides. If white isn't quick, Black is simply going to win. These two pawns are going to win the game. If black doesn't defend accurately, the white knights are going to jump forward and go for the black king. Mm, yeah. Such high stakes in this game. Definitely. And it's not like there's a simple solution for both sides either. It's not like white can kind of go, hey, let me just take the pawn on d6. Because black's uh, long-term prospects with those pawns are just going to be crushing. Wow, and the white queen came out. This is a very scary move to face, but Magnus reacted instantly. No more focusing on whatever he's listening to. He's focusing on the board right now. He's attacking this knight. More importantly, I think he's trying to take away this square from the white knight uh, on the g3 square. This knight can no longer jump in. This pawn is protected twice. And how do you run away from this threat? Do you jump? Do you threaten checkmate on the square using the queen and knight? Uh, the problem is here you can be captured. Or do you kind of, uh, after this pawn push... Can't you just take the pawn as well? Ah, oh, maybe. Can you take this pawn? Uh, no, no, the oh, D6 pawn. Oh, this, oh yeah. wow, yeah. Because uh, the, that bad black knight is just uh, on, on the right side yeah, of the board. And now that, now that the F pawn has moved... OK, so, for example, a capture here would result in a couple more trades, and at the end, this knight hangs. So white gave up a piece but wins it back. It's still super complicated. I mean, if black can start pushing this pawn, maybe you offer a trade of queens at some point. If you can get the queens off... Oh, well, I'm not sure about here, but... Uh, I don't know, white's rooks are coming to the seventh yeah. rank. This is how Duda beat Magnus a few days ago. Oh, yesterday, sorry. Um, yeah, Simon, maybe you're right. Uh, this is the key. Can White take this pawn safely or not? Getting very tense now. I mean, uh, the time situation, they're both uh, down to about three minutes. Um, Farouche is just going on to three minutes. It looks, it looks like that's the most obvious move where White is still going for the attack. But black has this long-term trump of the queenside pawn, uh, getting quite near to touching down. I mean, you, maybe you could throw the knight towards black's king as well. Uh, there's moves like this which are available, but 
Uh, you got, I, think, I think White's got to just try to keep the attack going here, really. Yeah. Um, and even move the knight in towards the king looks quite scary, doesn't it? Very tempting, yeah. You know, with the queen capturing and the other knight coming in, whatever. So uh, key moments here yeah. for Ferruja. Which way is he going to go with the knight? Yeah, I just um, feel Magnus... It just felt so unnatural to put that black knight on the edge of the board. And all of these... There we go, your move, Simon, on the board. All of these tactics, they're working in White's favour. Um, this one and the one that Ferruja missed a couple of moves ago, because that black knight is so weak on an open file, a target for White's rook, he needed to bring that knight back to a better square as soon as possible. And, uh, okay, it's still in the balance, this one. It is a pawn that White has just won, but it's not the best pawn in the world. White still has those kind of weak double pawns on the d-file. How does black continue? Okay, Magnus does trade off. And now does he take the bishop or does he move the rook, I guess, is the only other option. The problem is both black's rooks are attacked. He, so has, to he take, has to take it. He has to take, take it. it. And, uh, okay, and rook is going to appear on the seventh. And, uh, well, white is threatening to double up along that line. I mean, it looks so dangerous. Yeah. Very scary. I'm position. really wondering if black can just push his pawns right now. Oh. Do you just push the black pawns <laughs> and if the white rook appears on the seventh rank, give up the black queen, just try and promote, try and make a new queen. Yeah. The idea occurred to me as well. I was like, like a light bulb going on in the head. But it's so difficult to give up the queen. It's not necessarily that instinctive. And, uh, this but is of so course, good at calculating, though. These I mean, players will find it. That's the first thing Magnus will look at, I can guarantee. The top players, when they calculate, they look at the forcing moves first and the, or the most ambitious moves first. And Black's most ambitious move is to push the, one of those two black pawns. So that's the first thing you look at. If it doesn't work, you've ruled it out. You move on to something quieter, less ambitious. But, uh, it looks quite logical, up. doesn't it? I mean, you're, you're trying to play as actively as you can as well. You don't, you don't really want to... There's not really any easy ways to defend this position, so you've got to go active. Um, I don't know if it's good or not, but it's the first move that Magnus will consider. And now down to around two minutes, it does become about instinct and those quick, kind of short, sharp calculations, two, three move tactics. Okay, maybe we can see what the computer suggests because black is walking a tightrope. How does black fight against this threat of white's rooks on seventh rank? Okay, the computer does give three decent moves. So uh, Magnus isn't forced to necessarily push one of his pawns. Pushing one of those pawns is the third best move according to the computer. Activating the black queen is the top choice. The black queen can come on a diagonal. I don't think that's easy. The whole idea of this top move the computer suggests is that if the white rook at the bottom of the board ever moves up, the black queen can somehow come down to the first rank and deliver checkmate. White's king is not safe after all. But I don't know if that's not necessarily as human as maybe the second or third best... Uh, what do you think? Do you think he's going to give up there? his queen? We've seen Magnus do it before. Mm. Well, I mean, I don't think White can bring the rook in, can he? Isn't he just yeah. losing if he if he brings the rook in? So, so I don't think it's even. Push, a, so he's well, going to push the pawn. Well, I don't think it's even a sacrifice that that mm -hmm. line because I think it's just losing. But he's. he's what's he going to do it. after the queen exchange and the rook coming in now? Okay, he's got and his he bishop. Just ignore it. Yeah. He's got his bishop. Okay. But. Okay, so we have to jump in to show what happened. Uh, what might happen now, uh, as you mentioned, Simon, um, this queen has come off. If the queens disappear, then. White can occupy the seventh rank. It looks like there's a checkmating idea. So if black pushes his pawn, this is a very well-known checkmate pattern. This is check. The other rook follows up, and this will be checkmate. The two rooks together trap the black king. But uh, as you also mentioned there, Simon, uh, in this position, when the rook does kind of attack the seventh rank, black can just push a pawn. And now this bishop saves the day. The bishop covers the important square, the important check. Still, this is very complicated. Who knows who's better here? But uh, if you can't trade off the queens, then what else do you do with white? You can't bring your rook to the seventh rank yet because what, uh, black comes down, swoops in with a nasty check and a back rank checkmate will occur. Oh, I mean, it looks like a good move to me, but the computer really doesn't like it. Um, what else could white try? Could you just uh, decline the offer of trading queens and just move it back yeah, two squares? Back. Keep an eye on the bishop. Yeah, so now you keep an eye on this bishop, so the black pawn that wanted to push can no longer do so, it's tied down defending its bishop. Maybe this is best. And Ferruja does love to keep the queens on if he has an option. Huh. Uh, by process of elimination, yeah, he knows he's weaker than Magnus in endgames. Uh, Ferruja, when he's lost to Magnus over the board in classical games, and it's has happened several times, it's always been an endgame. Uh, so, yeah, maybe the queen keeping it on the board, that's the key. Let's go back to the players. Will Ferruja go for the endgame? He does keep the queens on the board, but he puts it on the square. Still keeping an eye on the bishop, very sensible stuff. 
Uh, very natural, the computer, OK, doesn't approve. But Magnus now challenging for the open file. It's hard to call this one. It's uh, definitely in the balance. This game, I think, might decide the whole tournament. Oh. Uh, it's just that tense. Both players actually playing really, really well. High level game so far. Yeah. All right, well, buckle up and uh, find your popcorn. David Howell saying that this game, the drama going on right now on the board, could decide the whole tournament. Imagine if Verusha wins it and takes the lead in the match. It's going to make him a favorite to win the FTX Crypto Cup. And likewise, if Magnus wins this one with black, with white, he could just lock it down. If he takes a victory in today's match, Magnus, he goes into, into tomorrow's match against Prague knowing that uh, he just needs to draw the rapid portion and probably he'll win the tournament. Uh, Prague would need to win today's match yeah. and tomorrow's match, which is no easy feat. So, OK, a rook trade about to happen. Oh, the more pieces come off the board, though, the more I like those black pawns. Those two black pawns on the left. Feels like things might be turning in black's favour. The white knight is dominated right now. Still tricks in the air. OK, attacking the white rook, first of all. It's, it's so hard to call every move. There's so much choice. That white rook needs to find a safe square. And 30 seconds for Ferruja. Yeah, yeah, he's very short time. I mean, he'd, he'd love to get the queen in the game now, slide it over one square, and then jump with the knight towards black's king. But I think this is really, you know, like, the more pieces get changed, as David says, the, the stronger black's pawns become. So... OK, and now he's. if he gets the chance to push the other pawn mm -hmm. at the right stage, there are only but two squares from cleaning. They can be blockaded the way that he's advanced them. I mean, if a piece sits there on the C3 square, those pawns are busted. They're just not going to move. Very oh. passive defence, isn't yeah. it, though? I mean, this seems like the right way because you're maybe threatening a rook check and maybe, yeah, this stops the pawns, doesn't it, for yeah. now as well, so very logical move. I love the idea of moving the knight forwards as well, not taking the pawn necessarily, but just getting it near Black's king. It's very tense. One minute each, roughly. Well, no. I mean, for just 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. cool. This is a clever move from Magnus. He's created an escape square for the Black King, so if there are ever any checks, even if the White Queen ever gets in, the Black King has a hiding place now behind this Black Pawn that's but moved. Can he throw the knight in now? I mean, that yeah. just seems so natural. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean... OK, he's made an escape square for his king. Can't criticise Harry marching forward, Simon. Oh, I don't think I ever have done in my life, so probably shouldn't start now, should I? But, but you're right, yeah. maybe time is the most important factor here and the white knight jumping in might have been yeah. a bit yeah. more direct because now black can try and force yeah. the queens off. If the queens come off, black will win. Those two pawns are just too scary, too dangerous. Definitely. But, uh, the, I mean, no, 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 not this move. He, I thought he had to give a check with his rook and, and uh, then trade off queens and then get behind the rook. Uh, the pawn, and uh, instead, I, I don't know. I mean, what's he? What's he? I going think he's for? got to keep the queen's pieces on to go for uh, for attack I mean, here. I mean, this it seems like the only way. I'd say, you know, go go for the black king. You're kind of an all-in situation now. Wow. And but these pawns are marching. Pawns are quick. Talking of all-in, though, Magnus is going all-in too. I mean, yes. he's banking everything on these pawns, but the black king is abandoned. I know. I mean, if the knight was already on that square, you could now yeah. just launch the attack. But I don't know who's going to get there first here. It's, it's really close. Look it's at that incredible, move. Incredible, this move. But giving wow. away the white rook. But if the black queen goes and takes this white rook, the black rook is falling to the white queen as well. Black's queen wants to defend her own rook. She can't jump back. I mean, maybe she has to go and capture this rook. What a resource. I mean, the fact that the computer says it's just equal is <laughs> just beyond me. It looks yeah, like yeah. one side is going to win for sure. I'm literally, so wild. I'm sure. literally holding my breath <laughs> with the excitement and anticipation. And I, I don't know what's going to happen here. I mean, the, the players can't think it's equal. they just got to be like, right, I've got to find the best move. You know, I expect they both think they're probably winning uh, at the moment. Yeah. I mean, do you get rid of that rook? It looks to me like you have to get rid of that rook. I mean, you could even try to get another queen. There's at least a perpetual check then, though. How do you get rid of the rook? Because queen, the queen... Just take it, yeah. The queen okay. takes rook. I mean, uh, why not? I mean, let's do that because your pawns, you're still going to have one very strong pawn there. That rook looks too strong to allow, yeah. you know, to keep on that area of the board. White does have that massive threat of bringing the white queen up to the f7 square next to the white rook. Check, and that will end in checkmate. So, yeah. I mean, I don't know if Magnus is considering anything else. It would just be suicidal to leave that rook on the board. Magnus frowning. 30 seconds. Yeah. 30 seconds now. And, you know, even though the computer says it's equal, it really, it, any result possible here. There we go. The rooks do disappear. Both sides gobbling up those rooks with their queens. Black's king, do you go to the centre or do you go and hide out in the corner? Hide, surely. Get away from the checks. So it would be the... So hard to call. But then your bishop might be taken with, with check as well. So 
He's gone for another option, trying to get the queens off. Wow. White's got to keep the queens on, surely. Yeah. Yeah. Take I'll that pawn. Queens. Take that pawn, but how are you going to prevent uh, the C pawn from marching? You just can't. And it's all about the quality of those pawns. Uh, maybe the white knight has to jump back right now because yeah. wow. uh, otherwise that pawn is going to promote. You have to give up your knight yeah. sooner or later uh, just for, this, for that pawn. 19 white. seconds. Yeah. 19 seconds he's got. No, that, oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, I it. know you guys found that move, but that's such a hard move to find. Yeah. Such a hard Especially move. Especially with 10 seconds on his clock. Mm -hmm. uh, what is this ending? <laughs> it's just crazy. <laughs> what is this? You White got... could also throw in a check here. White's central pawn does step forward, yeah. discover check. White's queen hitting the black king now. I mean, Do what a move to spot there. Doesn't White have more practical chances here? I mean, you've got four pawns for the piece, but, I mean, you might be able to bail out to some draws. I mean, it looks like White's pawns are very scary here, even though you're a piece down. I think I'd take White at this moment in time. Okay, I then. don't understand the 0, 0.0. <laughs> I mean, how can this be a dead draw? It just it just doesn't seem right, you know? Yeah, look, so. look at this. White does have four pawns, but it's the White D pawn, <laughs> just two squares away from yeah. promotion. Black can never win this game. Even if right. White loses all his three pawns on the left half, I think that might be uh, very close to a draw anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now, all Ferugia needs to do is create the threats, keep all his pawns intact. White's king much safer than the Black king. But, th but this is a very clever move by Magnus. You know, he's put his bishop on a square that controls all the advances of all those pawns. Those three pawns, they're kind of somehow useless. He's got a great blockade, hasn't yeah. he, on the light squares. I mean, the queen can just slide over and always have an internal blockade. This is the internal blockade. As you yeah. say, Yvanka, none of the white pawns can move without being captured. So white, I mean, black can just sit here, I think, and not do anything. How does, uh, how does white make any progress? It's probably, probably is a draw now, <laughs> right? I don't know. I think it probably is. <laughs> Anyone want to back me up there? I think draw, it's a draw, draw. Well. We're going for a draw now? With best play, <laughs> but <laughs> Ferugia at 10 seconds, yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I would still take white here if I had to, but yeah, yeah, yeah draw is the most likely, I think, at this point. Magnus has just defended so well. He's going after some pawns now. And, but can you try to budge Bishop away? Well, like he, ha he is, but now the Queen comes back, yeah. keeps the blockade. Mm -hmm. and you, can't, you can't break this blockade, can you? And White can't bring anything else into the attack. Um, so it should be a draw now. You just keep the blockade. I mean, Here we go. We might see that yeah. result, the position repeating yeah. itself once. Ferruja, though, is he going to play on? He knows White. Having the white pieces is such a big advantage for him. He will be reluctant to let this game disappear. But here we go. Magnus can force a draw immediately if he gives a check and brings his Queen back. You can't win this one with black. Take no. the draw, Magnus. Uh, that would be the logical idea. I mean, there's no way. You, you, I mean, like you said, David, if you, even if you win a couple of pawns, it, it's very likely to be a draw here. Um, and this time situation, OK, he's still got a minute, so he's having to think. Probably a wise, wise idea just to see if he can create anything at all in this position. Yeah, he does have a small time advantage, but it's not too relevant in this position. White can always gain a few seconds. Run the Black King up the board, you know, <laughs> try to take some pawns of it, you know. Try to lose, if anything. Yeah, that's a good way to lose the game, but, uh, I mean... I, I it looks think... like he's going to play on, body language-wise. Yeah, it does. Yeah, he's is not... that such a practical decision? And uh, no, he gives a check. It. Looks like he's going to take it. And the position <laughs> will repeat itself for the third time. is ready to get out of there. Magnus, will he bring back his queen? Yes. There we go, it's a draw. And uh, for the first time, Magnus Crossan actually doesn't look too happy rushing from his computer. It is a draw. They are still tied after three games. The fourth game will decide the match. But if it is a tie, we will see blitz tie breaks between these two. What a match between two of the top players in the world. Magnus Crossan against the teenager Ali Reza Ferruja. Will we have reactions in Miami? They do have 15 minutes before the start of game four, looks like. Magnus Carlsen will stop for a comment. Goodness. Yeah, I did. Uh, I think I was doing pretty well, but then I, I missed a couple of crucial details and it, it just became a total mess. It's probably losing at some point, but you know, he uh, spent a lot of time. Uh, then I felt like I was somewhat taking over, but it wasn't clear at all. Uh, and I couldn't couldn't find a win, so I stood the game towards the draw. Do these kind of games make you tired before the remaining match? No, not at all. It's it's fun. Good. Good luck. Thank you. Well, we do love hearing that Magnus Carlsen having fun in his match against Ali Reza Ferruja. This was such an interesting and tense uh, game. So here is today's FTX exchange.
And this clash between Alariza Ferrugia with white and Magnus Carlsen with black, it's probably one of the highest level games, the highest quality games we'll see in a long time, full of fireworks, full of tactics, and full of surprises. And uh, we reach this position in the late middle game, it's chaos. Black is running with a couple of pawns down on this side. These two pawns very close to promotion. White, however, going for an attack against the Black King, which has no defenders. And Ferruja here found a nice way to steer the game towards safety. He found a nice way to exchange a set of rooks. Here, Black's rook looks like it's defending the eighth rank. It's very nicely protected. It looks like Black's queen defending from afar along this diagonal. But Ferruja threw his rook forward two squares, threatening the deadly queen f7 check, which would have led to checkmate. And Magnus decided, OK, you have to allow the exchange of rooks. This rook is actually left on an uh, on a vulnerable square. It was captured, but now the Black Queen has been deflected away, leaving her own rook on prize. And after this rook was captured, Magnus offered another exchange, the exchange of queens, and Ferruja wisely dodged this. If he if he exchanges queens, the Black Pawns will promote, so he's, instead he found safety by dropping back, capturing a pawn, and the final exchange of the game. White's knight now is definitely worth this pawn. This pawn is too dangerous, so he gave up his knight, Ferruja, giving up this piece in order to get rid of this black pawn. As we saw, the game fizzled out towards a draw, but what incredible tactics from these two great players. Quality between Magnus and Ali Reza. Game still going on inside the Miami arena. We're going to jump into some time trouble in game three between Anish Giri and Liam Le. It's a must win situation for Anish Giri. With a draw or a win, Liam Le will take all three points in this match and the bar is all the way over to his side. Any chance for Anish of winning this game? <laughs> this one's hard to call as well. Uh, so many imbalances in all of these games. I'm just doing a quick count at the moment. White Anish Giri, he has a rook in return for Black's knight and two pawns. And I guess the computer prefers Black because not the Black knight is just so active on a nice outpost. Black's pawns look more dangerous than White's remaining pawn. Who would you guys choose here? All three results still possible, or is it mostly about black? I think probably just black. I mean, uh, we have to remember that black only needs a draw, uh, and in this situation, that is well, that's quite a move there, isn't it, from uh, from a niche? But there's there's so many perpetual checks uh, with the rook, knight, and bishop here. So uh, I would have thought you could get a draw, but I, I, it's a mess. It is still a mess. There's no obvious way to get perpetual now, and I love a niche's move with that bishop. That seems like a great move. I say there's no obvious perpetual. <laughs> is he now going to go for the perpetual? Force a draw here. Oh, uh, maybe. Some checks, maybe. Uh, okay, maybe this is just the perpetual yeah. that we were yeah, mentioning, and I, I think this is it, right? Yeah, and if Liam wanted to win or needed to win, then he might play on, but here the White King simply cannot escape. There's nowhere safe to hide, and yeah. there we go. We have a result. Liam secures today's match. Wow. He's uh, on fire, Liam Le, winning yesterday's match against Prague and today's match against Anish uh, Giri. Some fantastic chess uh, by Liam Le, Anish Giri. As always, he stays by the computer to look over the game. Let's hear from the winner of the match. Wow, Liam, this is a truly spectacular chess by you today. Yeah, I'm very happy with my games today, um, except the first game, which could have gone either way. I was losing and then winning was a very messy game. But um, the last two games, I think I played really well. How is it to be a chess player when you find that rhythm, when match after match, game after game goes in your favor? Yeah, I mean, it gives you confidence um, when you're playing well. So I think it will, um, it's, it's very good, yeah. You're performing so well in this rapid format. Do you think that also gives confidence for tournaments going into classical play later on? Yeah, for sure, for sure. But um, we have to adjust a little bit because playing rapid and classical are different things. But um, yeah, I think any tournament win, any tournament victory, um, and especially in big tournaments like the Champion Chess Tour and against the top guys like uh, Anish here today, I think that's, um, that means a lot to me. Congratulations. You're f really shooting up in the tables, and that is well-deserved. Yeah, thank you. Another three-game match win for Liam Le. Two days in a row he's done that. Tomorrow he faces Hans Niemann on the final day in the tournament. Massive ending to the tournament here for Liam Le. If he can keep up uh, the winning tomorrow. We're jumping into Pragnananda against Jan Christoph Duda. This is game three. Game two was a very long one. And uh, Duda, he's still in the lead in this match. 
Prague. He has to make a comeback. He has to win either this game or the next one. And he cannot lose. If he loses this game, it's over. That will mean zero points. And the bar, though, it's over to his side. We're coming in at move 30 in this game. Yeah, and Prague is a one pawn up. Therefore, the evaluation bar says White has a nearly plus one advantage. And it feels like the momentum in this match has changed. Prague has outplayed his opponent. I was looking at this game just five, six moves ago, and it was level, looked very balanced. Prague has won a pawn. And uh, what do you guys think? There is an attack against White's extra pawn, that B pawn. Chances for Prague to save that guy and uh, save that foot soldier and match it up the board maybe later on? Yeah, I guess it's all about that pawn, right, David? I mean, uh, Black's threatening to take that pawn. Uh, that seems to be the only dangerous pawn for Black, the B pawn. Um, so it's not clear to me how you can save that pawn easily. Um, and I think, I think Duda's drawing chances are still pretty high here. There's not much material on the board. Um, can you win that pawn or not? I think that's what it will come down to. Prague's last game with the white pieces, so he's got to push this one as much as he can. Of course, he's got a chance in the next game of black, but he is a pawn up. He's got, he's got to push this. Mm -hmm. How does he guard that pawn, though? That's why I'm wondering. So he puts yeah. his rook behind it. Yeah, it seems natural. Yeah, yeah, natural. It's not the move you want to play because the white's rook is very passive, but maybe it's the only move to keep the winning chances alive. Um, as, as you mentioned there, Simon, it wasn't easy to find an alternative. And OK, Duda, he loves playing actively, especially uh, in these difficult positions, especially in endgames, and he pushes a pawn forward. That pawn is actually very weak that he's pushed, but it's more about improving the black knight. The black knight wants to jump to the square that that pawn previ previously sat on, and that would be a bit annoying. So, OK, Prague creates a double attack, hitting the black rook in the corner, hitting that black pawn in the middle. How does Duda activate his rook? Yeah. Very tense. Very tense, yeah. I mean, the, the rook can slide over one square, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have a, an exchange, of, and he has played that move. Now you might have another exchange of pawns. If that happens, it's going to be three pawns versus two, or one area of the board. And those tend to be very drawish, because it's very hard, unless you've got to win another pawn in those positions. So uh, I think Prague will try to avoid that ending. You, of course, you still got chances. Yeah, so he has. So he, he's kept his past B pawn. Um, and that but, makes sense for now. But Duda's kind of quite insistent. He's like, well, move that uh, knight away. And still the question remains, how is he going to save that pawn? Perhaps he just has to put the knight on d5 and uh, block the light squared bishop. Oh, but then the black knight might jump into the yeah. centre. It looks a bit shaky for Prague. Those white pieces on the sixth rank, they, yeah, they're just loose, and loose pieces drop off. Uh, so you have to be very careful now as Prague where you put this white knight that's threatened. There's a lot of tactics there, aren't there? Yeah. With that black knight ready to jump in, you can see the white king could actually be a major target. That black knight is on quite, a, quite an attractive route in to check the white king, maybe of a rook coming around. So what, this is why white has gone on the offensive. He'd love black now to swap that knight off, getting two bishops, but mm -hmm. I don't see Duda doing that now. No. At the very least, right, um, unless I'm missing something, Duda could just take yeah. this pawn off the board. And it goes down to that end game that you mentioned, Simon. Um, we okay. might see a trade of rooks. Uh, so the danger will have gone for Prague. He'll take all the risk out of the position, but uh, it's just about whether these three can beat Black's two uh, over the course of the end game. Still enough pieces on the board to maybe think there is some chance, but. Uh, still, he's going to have to grind this one out for a long, long time if he wants to win this one. Prague. It's uh, intense inside uh, the Miami arena. It's all about chess in Miami with spectators in the arena as well. And we're going to go down to Tanya in Miami to see, uh, I think, some birthday chess. Kaya, why should the players have all the fun? We've decided to bring the action outside the playing arena. And here I am taking on a challenge where I'll be playing with 30 seconds with... Tejas. Tejas, where are you from? San Francisco. Okay, so Tejas from San Francisco, who will have a minute on his clock. Uh, and to break down this chess, Ale, will you take over? Okay, should we go? Yes. All right, guys, let's do this. Wait. One minute against 31.6 seconds. Birthday girl not giving the 40, 30 second advantage. We haven't even started. You're already flustered. D4, whoa, 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 pick up your pieces, guys, come on. This King Sindian delayed a variation. Oh, same-ish, learning her lessons from the Olympia, Tanya. Too soon to jump. Too soon to Look at this, Tanya's so fast. She's so fast, she's taking a pawn. She's taking another pawn. 
Guys, it looks like she's going to do it, but she's already wasted 12 seconds on the clock. This is all going to go down. Wait, wait, guys, guys, you gotta make a move before you press the clock. <laughs> what is going on? Don't yell at me, yell at the board. <laughs> all right, it's, the clock is evening out, but the position, it clearly favors black. Sorry is no good enough. This knight, this knight is hanging. Oh no, the decisive advantage is here. But it doesn't matter when the clock is this. Wow. Rook takes f6. Tanya smells blood. I don't know where it is, but she's trying to find it. This sneaky check on c4. This queen's going everywhere. Who knows what's happening? Oh, oh, wait. Tanya, Tanya's coming. Tanya's on the attack. Tanya is on the offensive. This check is coming. The king is here. Oh no, the king, guys. Oh my god. <laughs> Relentless. Tanya, how do you feel after that great victory? We're gonna party like it's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, enjoy the games. <laughs> you deserve it, Tanya. Party like it's your birthday. A uh, great win with only 30 seconds on the clock. I'm impressed. And uh, David. Are you impressed by this game? Uh, yes, I'm impressed that Pragnananda even got to this stage where he's got a safe extra pawn and has some chances to convert, but I'm also impressed by Duda's uh, defensive skills so far. Um, it looks like he's been defending very well. Okay, this knight jump looks like it's holding things together. It looks a bit scary to allow White's knight to jump forward with a check, but uh, the Black King will move towards White's light squared bishop. We will see this happen. And uh, Duda just taking a sip of water there, so calm. A lot of time on the clock as well. The problem is you can't trade off too many pieces. You can't trade off light squared bishops because at some point you need to push white pawns forward onto the light squares if you want to win this game. How do you create a past pawn, guys? I just don't see it. I think you've got to win another pawn, haven't you? you have I, mean, uh, pawn, yeah. I mean, Black's pawns are, are quite far advanced. Black would probably like to have those pawns back because they could be a little bit overextended, I feel. Um, but you've probably got to win the base of the pawn structure. So when you're looking at your opponent's pawns, you can attack in chess. You normally can't attack the one that's defended easily, but at the base of the pawn structure, the one on the Harry file uh, can't be defended. So, uh, so I guess White's got to try and pick that pawn up somehow. That's the only way I would foresee winning this, this ending. Well, one thing that I do notice about this position is that, um, yeah, you know, Black's Knight looks great, but on the other hand, it's a little bit awkward because yeah, after Prague's move, the knight is in a pin. Ooh, and there's, and a, uh, there's a big threat of bishop takes knight on the board. Yeah. Mm. For example, if you try to get out of this pin... Um, is it, is mean, it a threat? <laughs> maybe it's oh, a threat. threat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a knight fork. You, we could see a situation where uh, white is, in, is a pawn up. Normally, having a knight versus a bishop is quite a good thing when you're a pawn up, but here, maybe the white king is just too stuck in its cage. The white king unable to join the battle. It's very funny, this... this position we saw in the game, Aronian, uh, Aronian's game from the last tour, I think, wasn't it? That bishop stopping the king coming out. Yeah, so. And uh, we thought this was a threat, but actually that final position there looks like it was a draw. So uh, Duda is happy to just allow any exchanges. And that's White's problem, unless, as uh, Simon mentions, unless you can somehow later kind of go and win this pawn, then you just can't initiate these exchanges. They help Black guide the game towards a draw. And you can't use that square right now with the White Bishop. Your knight is attacked. But you can move the knight, you can move it to f5 and uh, try to go for th that golden pawn. Mm. I mean, at, at the very least, I guess black can give a check here mm. and uh, this forces an exchange. White can go for this pawn, but uh, yeah, everything's just working for black. You hit the bishop, if the bishop moves, the pawn could push on. Uh, I don't know, it feels like black... Uh, what, uh, sorry, white is running out of ammunition. Uh, black is holding. It's kind of by a, by a hair's breadth. It's kind of by the skin of his uh, teeth, but yeah, he's going for your move, Yovanka. He's still got ideas. This knight check is a threat, picking up Harry the H-pawn. I very much like your knight move there, David, because if you can get rid of that light square bishop, then mm. your, your light square bishop is fantastic. So that, that variation demonstrated here. So you want to keep it simple when you're defending, as simple as you can. You want to exchange off if it favours you. So why not force the issue with a check here? Um, it seems so obvious. I mean, there's other moves. You could bring the light dark square bishop out. There's probably other good moves, but forcing the issue is is always the best way to draw, um, if you can. Yeah, and Duda, just like Prague in the last game, defending really well, mm. and a draw is the most likely at this moment, despite Prague trying his hardest to break this down. Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Rusa, they just started 
game four. They are tied before this game. If we have a winner in that game, that player will take all three points before the final and last round tomorrow. If it is a draw, then they will decide the match in blitz tiebreaks. And uh, you guys, let me know if this game is a dead draw then we can jump over to that one. But of course, it's very important for the tournament situation. What happens with Prague? If he loses this game, it's over zero points. He needs to win a game. He needs to, and yeah, Duda finds that move. Gives a check. Also very natural. Uh, there was this exchange, and yeah, I think unfortunately for Prague, he's just running out of, uh, running out of ideas here. Still got a chance, hasn't he? He's got to win the next game. Yeah. Um, to level the match and mm. get in the playoff to try to keep in tow with Magnus. But this is, uh, I, I think this is dead draw now, really. Right. Um, so should we jump over then? Get the action from the start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. All right, we're going to do it. We're going to jump into game four. Magnus Cross and Oliver Reza Ruja. It just started. Magnus with the white pieces in that game. He uh, He's going to want to win it because uh, if it is a draw, then Blitz tie breaks and he can only hope for max two points, one point for the loser in tie breaks if he wins in the rapid portion. Three points if he loses in the rapid portion, zero points. Ali Reza Faruja is also in contention to win the FTX Crypto Cup. This is a huge matchup and I'm very curious to see what Magnus Carlsen has gone for in the opening here. We're coming in at move seven. Yeah, we're coming in at move seven. Not too much has happened. It is the Catalan opening, and it is a quite a well-known variation of the Catalan. Uh, this is something that Magnus played during his World Championship match against okay. Lugan de Pomnishi. He prepared it specially for that match. I think pretty much all the World Champions have played the Catalan opening. Um, yeah, it's just so solid for white. It's very hard to get active as black. It's very hard to create winning chances as black, and I think that favours Carlson. If we talk about styles, Ferruja wants to be active. It's very hard to do that against this opening. However, Ferruja has gone greedy and grabbed a pawn. So temporarily in the current position that we're looking at, black is a pawn up. And uh, Magnus, he ends up choosing one of the older main moves, uh, this bishop coming out. Uh, there are many, many options on this last uh, move for white. Ferruja defends the pin. And this is just a very solid pawn push. White's getting ready to move his queen to the square that this pawn previously sat on. White's rook next to his king will slide across. White's going to try and play in the center. He's not necessarily going to try and win that black extra pawn on c4 anytime soon. He's just getting his pieces ready. And this is still a theory, as far as I know. Yep. Opening theory. It is still very much theory. Late, last game that was played was actually played between uh, two female players, Vantika against Kostanyuk. And that was a win for Kostanyuk. But that was, if I know, it was a rapid blitz match. Um, and uh, Kostanyuk was which colour in that she game? She was black. Okay, so a win for black in that game. Now the dark squared bishops are coming off, uh, off the board. Black recaptures with his knight. And we do have a draw in game three. Prague, do that. That means Prague in 10 minutes. Game four, black pieces. Has to win that game to take it to tie breaks. He can uh, most hope for two points today, Prague. He cannot take all three points. Duda on fire, winning against Magnus yesterday. A favorite now to win his match against Prague. Is anyone else kind of hoping that Hans, I mean, Hans is down to the last game now. Yeah. They're one and a half all against Saronian. I'm kind of hoping that, you know, Hans gets something, mm. you know, from, from today's, because, you know, it's not just about his character, but he's been playing some great chess. Yeah. I mean, like, he's been winning a lot of games, but losing the matches. So he deserves to be able to afford to pay that Uber food bill, definitely. <laughs> he needs that money. He needs to get his lobster in tonight. Come on, Hans, just draw it. Yeah. And take it to tie breaks. Oh, but, blitz yeah. with Hans Niemann. That must be a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Totally. It would be nice, actually, to see Hans get off the scoreboard because... Absolutely. Like Simon said, you know, you know, his, his play is so much better than the score. Mm. And it's just somehow... That's kind of an unfortunate result of the kind of match situation. Things haven't been going his way. And uh, Magnus jumping in with his knight. And, uh, well, Ferruja playing very quickly, which suggests that he's still in, within his prep preparation and uh, defending the pawn and Magnus challenging that pawn on c4. Yeah, so now it's a proper pawn sacrifice. Magnus doesn't want to regain his pawn. He's happy after this pawn exchange to just play the position. And uh, I guess black will castle, black will try to get developed. The compensation that Magnus will have as white is firstly 
white to light squared bishop, just a fantastic piece. Also some dark square holes in the black camp, um, especially the c5 square, maybe ripe for a white knight later on. But uh, this is ambitious. I was going to say as well, the Catalan opening, it's a very good choice in general. It's just one of the best openings out there. But Magnus will know that Ferruja will have prepared hundreds of hours for this uh, in preparation for the candidates tournament. So you're kind of playing into an area that your opponent can predict, mm. but it is objectively a correct opening. So it's kind of, uh, yeah. I guess, yeah. that kind and of I, way up. And I have an interesting uh, point, actually. In my database, I have a game from 2017 between Magsud Lulu against Ali Reza Farouja. Ah. So uh, maybe Magnus is aware of that game. In that particular game, Farouja actually picked up the C pawn and uh, challenged the center by playing C5. Okay, his mouse, if we're looking at Farouja's uh, screen right now, his mouse, his uh, cursor was hovering over that c5 square. Um, he, normally, though, you would pick up the pawn and drag it to that square, so maybe that doesn't indicate that he's going to play that move. How did that game end up, Yovanka? Ended in a, well, draw, in a draw. Okay. He was with a white piece of Max Su. <laughs> Max Sudlulu. I can't Sorry, pronounce his name. No, no, I like Sudlulu. Sudlulu. Max Sudlulu. Max Sudlulu. I would. You don't want me to try pronounce it because it would be horrendous. <laughs> but um, Parham. Parham, yeah, yeah, great guy, fantastic player. Okay, yeah. oh. Now the Iranian number one. Now that Farouja has moved oh. from Iran to ah. France. Very strong, but yeah, I struggle a lot with pronouncing any names, but especially that one. <laughs> um, but I, I have to say, the Catalan opening. I mean. Uh, the more I'm looking at it, the more I'm thinking, I've got to learn this. You know, I've got to play the Catalan because, uh, you know, it just seems like you often sack a pawn, you often get compensation. That's right up my street. Mm -hmm. It's very it's very fashionable now. Um, what's the best way of learning it? I mean, Chessabullet must have a course on it. Do you guys know? Yeah. I don't know which course they got. Yeah, but they, ha they have a, a course. Um, right. I think it's... By an Indian Grandmaster. And in an Indian Grandmaster. I want to say Sathiraman, but I it might, be might, so might, might not be. Right. I'll have to be... look it up. Yeah. Okay, well that's yeah. I'll, I'll look that up later. So chessable course Aaron. on the Catalan. Mm. I need to I need to go and get that course after <laughs> this. So definitely. Yeah, it's an interesting game this one. And game three with Duda and Prague ended in a draw. Let's hear from the two players after that game. Prague gave us a draw in this game. How would you summarize? I think I had great chances in this game, but uh, yeah, I, I just missed it at some point. What is your feeling before the last one? Uh, not great, but I'll try my best. Good luck, man. Yeah. It's been a very interesting day today, Ansu Stuff. You've had special chances in the second game. How, how did you feel after that one? Yeah, it's too interesting, uh, to be honest. Um, no, I mean, the second game was a disaster. I um, kind of blacked out at the end. And um, also, I, I think I was winning by four later on, but even this Queen and the game is completely winning. I, the thing is, I um, just uh, was missing a lot of stuff, like a lot of checks. And uh, at the very end, I um, put the queen on the uh, G file, which was completely stupid. But I was afraid because I was earlier on giving some random checks and I was afraid not to blunder uh, free fall. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I mean, it was a disaster yeah, because otherwise the match would be almost over. But um, in this game, I was worse, but um, after F5, uh, I had a feeling it's it's going to be okay because I, I was getting some activity and it wasn't wasn't trivial to uh, for him to convert. Uh, you've been playing very good in the start of your matches. Now you need a draw in the last one. Based on previous experience, will you try to play a little more aggressive now? Uh, I think he will play aggressively, so I will just you know hopefully come up with that. Good luck. Thank you. Bad experience for uh, Duda yesterday. He won the first two games against Magnus and then lost the two next ones. So it went to tie breaks uh, where he eventually did win. And uh, Magnus here, he is uh, fighting in game four to win this match and take all three points. The bar is now slightly over to his side. Yeah, and for Magnus fans, that's generally a positive. Magnus is, after all, a pawn down. And if the evaluation bar thinks that you're doing quite well despite being a pawn down, it tends to mean you have a pretty good position. And uh, Magnus just improving his queen there. Uh, I just like the control that he has on the position. So despite Black's extra pawn, uh, Black's position full of holes, remember, maybe we can jump in just to show uh, what the plans might be for either side over the coming, coming moves. Um, so the main compensation White has for the pawn is that he has a beautiful outpost for his knight. 
And uh, he could use this over the next couple of moves. For example, if black takes a timeout, the white knight might jump in, attacking this bishop, keeping an eye on this pawn in the corner. I just don't see how black is ever really going to challenge this piece. Also, white does have this kind of majority in the center. At some point, you might consider pushing forward. You don't want to rush this. Your position might become a bit loose. But later on, you have the kind of lever, the key to open up the center, kicking away black's knight. Ferruja now brings his queen across just to defend his bishop. There was, after all, a pin along this diagonal. And uh, Magnus, I'm expecting him over the next few moves to bring his rook across, line it up with a black queen. Uh, maybe jump his knight in. Okay, he jumps in immediately. And yeah, it's just strategic compensation long term. Black's extra pawn is this one after all, and it's not easy to push. Uh, even the square in front of it, this uh, a5 square, is controlled by white. And there we go. The bishop moves, and Magnus says, I'm going to create some pressure. Ah, this just looks so beautiful for white. If white had an extra pawn, uh, well, if white wasn't a pawn down, then you would say strategically winning for white. It's just black having that one pawn to cling on to. Is that enough? What do you guys think? Would you take the pawn or would you take the position, essentially? I, I would take the position. I mean, this looks like a great uh, game for white. You know, such natural moves, such pressure. I mean, what is black going to do? I mean, black doesn't even have an active plan. And if black is just simply reduced to, like, twiddling around with pieces, making small moves here and there, it just feels like white has the luxury of just building and that's so so difficult i guess black could maybe play for bringing his rook to the center eventually breaking out with this pawn uh, black could maybe aim to at some point move this knight out the way i'm not sure whether you can do it safely right now for example move it out the way try to trade off these bishops uh, if black can exchange off a few pieces maybe at some point try and trade off this knight as well some hope for black but uh, it feels very loose uh, it is a magnus type of position as well especially kind of post-2019 Magnus, who likes to sacrifice pawns here and there. Um, yeah, inspired by Daniel Dubov, of course. Magnus loves to give up those pawns as, as a kind of dominance positionally. Yeah, it's tough to call. Yeah, I think Ferruja won't be very happy either. I mean, we're talking about Magnus and all, all his side, but you've got to think Ferruja. I mean, he, he likes having the initiative, right? And uh, here, he, he's he's got to defend. And uh, I don't think he really... That's that's an area of his game he's, he's not as keen on um, being a pawn up and defending. He'd much rather be on the white side of this. I mean, it's not terrible yet. You do have the extra pawn, and, and uh, if something goes wrong, that extra pawn will count later on. And I expect a lot of players would take the black side here, but practically speaking, it's just easier for white to play this position, and that's a big bonus. And we now see this rook d8 move black, potentially trying to get active right with that pawn break in the middle after that move. Whoops, not two squares, just one square. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, it's always uncomfortable for the opponent if uh, your rook uh, stares down at a queen. Uh, here we have this standoff between the black rook and the white queen. Still some stuff in between, but likewise, the white rook and the black queen. Both sides feeling a bit uncomfortable. I wouldn't be surprised if Magnus here just moves, moves uh, this piece out of the way, mm. just to prevent any tricks. Magnus uh, thinking now for 30 seconds. Uh, this is a massive game in the tournament. If Magnus wins this game, it's so likely he will win the tournament, right? Yeah, I mean, especially if Prague doesn't make that comeback, Magnus will... Wait, could he win it here? He could win it now in this game, right? He's one point ahead of Prague. If he gets three points for the match win, he'll be four points ahead if Prague loses. And there we go. Magnus could win this tournament in this round. Yeah, that's true. Okay. The Russia will be five. Yeah, I mean, it was so bunched behind. up. It was so close. We didn't even consider this. No, that's true. Especially after he lost the first game, Magnus Carlsen. But uh, yeah, he could start the party early with a win in this game. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, and that's looking quite possible. I mean, we'll have to kind of keep an eye on Prague's game as well, won't we? Just to see how that goes, because Prague, Prague needs to get a win to, you know, keep in touch with Magnus at the moment. Yeah. Talking of a Magnus win, though, I don't really like this decision he's gone for. He's trading off a bunch of minor pieces, and black was a bit cramped, so normally when you have more space, if your opponent's struggling uh, to kind of find squares for their pieces, exchanging things off, not necessarily a good idea. Now black's extra pawn might become a factor. Yeah, I'm not so sure about what Magnus is doing, to be honest. I mean, it still looks very nice, very pleasant, not in trouble with white, of course, but uh, in terms of trying to win, 
black. I think Ferruja will be very happy that he's managed to make those exchanges, especially the light squared bishops. So the tension might go on. We okay. might not see Magnus win <laughs> <laughs> the uh, tournament in this game. Yeah, for the excitement in the tournament, we are actually now hoping Magnus Crossen will not win this game, but how impressive it will be if he does and takes all three points in this match and takes the tournament victory. Wow, impressive stuff. It is all the rest of Russia. Thinking now, let's go back to uh, Miami. So many fans in the building there today. Guys, we're outside the playing arena, and as you can see, it's not just chess inside, but even right here, we've got games on. Our spectators are having a fun time here, and we're joined by a very special guest. It's Women Grandmaster Yanyat who's joining us. Hey. Hello. How are you, everybody? Yanyat, it's so nice to have you here with us. Now, Yanyat is from Miami, and she runs a chess club. Tell us a bit about the chess scene in Miami. Okay, we try to have more people playing chess and I like to, all the kids try to learn chess because it's really good for our kids. Then it's my goal to grow up the chess in Miami. And then this tournament is a really, really nice marketing for chess here. I was actually gonna ask you, what does it mean to have all these top players here? How inspiring is it for the kids at the club? Oh my God, this is a good inspiration for us and have this big tournament here with all the players. It's like a party, like a big chess party here. Thank you so much, Yaniat. Indeed, it is a celebration of chess here in Miami this weekend. Fantastic. Maybe the next uh, world chess champion, maybe not the next, but <laughs> a future world chess champion will be from Miami. We also uh, yesterday talked about the critical thinking movie based on a uh, Miami uh, high school chess team. So chess is big in Miami and uh, Magnus Carlsen is uh, right now fighting not only to win the game and the match, also the tournament if he wins this game and Prague does not win the game that just started for him against Duda. Game four, it's trouble for Hans Niemann as well. He is tied with Levon Aronian before game four and the bar just shot up for Levon in this game four. We are hoping Niemann will uh, stack up some points. He is still on zero points, but it's looking hard right now. Levon, what a player, such a strong American player. Yeah. It's, uh, it's looking bad for Hans Niemann. And uh, here Magnus is doing Magnus things. So, you know, <laughs> just improving. Doing the... Simon things. So, yeah, oh, sorry, some... Alaresa Frusha doing Simon things. <laughs> yeah. What, <Well>, losing? <laughs> no. oh, oh. I was thinking about Harry. <laughs> yeah, little, little use of Harry there. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I just like the way that Magnus is just uh, relocating his pieces just to apply pressure to a different point, the A6 pawn. And it's so nice to see Tanya in Miami with all the support. And uh, we are asking everyone at home, you know, for our selfie competition, how are you cheering for your favorite player? And Ahmed said, well, they're cheering from Budapest. And uh, take a look at this. There's a lot of chess fans in Budapest. And uh, there we oh, go. Oh, how big cool. hello to you, Ahmed. And uh, look like at a that. watch party. I know, it's super cool. And uh, Thomas Lehman says, Go, Magnus! Amazing games and sends us all the best wishes. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for sending in your selfies and keep them coming. Show us how you're cheering for your favorite player and remember to tweet us using the hashtag ChessChamps. Yeah, and especially if it's uh, Farusha or Prague, they need the energy from around the world right now. Magnus Carlsen, if he wins this game, he'll win the tournament if Prague does not win his next game. Drama happening in Miami. Yeah, and uh, Yvanka, you mentioned that phrase, Magnus things, and this is kind of classic Magnus. He's just regained his pawn now. It's level material again after White recaptures this rook. He's going into an endgame where he has a strategic advantage, where there's pretty much no risk. I mean, is Ferruja just going to lose a pawn? That white knight is just beautiful. The black knight looking pretty good as well, but having less influence. Uh, Ferruja needs something active and something soon, because otherwise he's just going to walk into this bind where Magnus is just going to turn the screw, torture him forever. Also, look at the clock times, five and a half extra minutes for Magnus right now. Despite the evaluation bar, it just feels like it's all gone in white's favor. Uh, the last few moves, the whole game so far. How can black fight back? 
We can't give up hope for Ferruja. Ferruja as well, he'll be looking for positives in his position. It just feels like he's been outmaneuvered. He lost his pawn back. I guess the big issue is uh, do you suffer and just take the queen or should you try to break out or move the queen and hope for some more active adventures further along down the line? Yes. But okay, he's gone for the queen trade. And uh, it does feel like Magnus can simply now start to grind. And I'm going to hand it over to our <laughs> chief. <laughs> I was going to say grinder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, a grindmaster. Grindmaster. That's my favorite title. OK. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just that type of position where white can sit on it forever. There's zero risk. Um, when you talk about grinding an endgame, you want to remove all the risk from the position. You want to improve your pieces step by step. Magnus has a pretty good knight right now. It doesn't need to retreat it yet. It has a nice outpost later. White's rook perfect. The king is the piece that's uh, first to be improved. Black's king, I guess, is going to do the same. Going to centralize itself. And then it's just about when to kind of pull the trigger, when to start advancing white's pawns. Maybe on the right side of the board just to gain a bit of space for the end game. Maybe you kick back Black's knight in the center with a pawn. Uh, it's just kind of step by steps, all these small mini plans. We filmed one video, myself and Magnus, about accumulating small advantages. And here, he's accumulated a few advantages already. Better pawn structure with white, uh, especially in the center of the board. He's got a better minor piece, a better rook. And uh, he just needs something a bit more concrete now. So uh, mm. whether that's the way pushing pawns uh, or whether it's uh, tactics, we'll the, see. I mean, the way you've described it, David, I mean, if I had this position against you <laughs> with the black pieces, <laughs> you know what I'd do? <laughs> Sorry, Simon. I'd resign. <laughs> so, I mean, it, OK, it's not that bad, but it, it, it is pretty grim. And uh, I think everything you mentioned there makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's that idea of creating two weaknesses, though, which I think is very important if people are looking at this position and they're thinking, how, how, how do I actually improve this? Well, you want to tie your opponent down to one weakness. I think it's quite clear what that is. It's this backwards pawn there. Uh, then you want to try to create another weakness somewhere else. I mean, black is kind of threatening to guard that weakness at the moment. But, OK, you can see Magnus now trying to create... Um, you know, a weakness somewhere else, and you can move his knight now to yeah. keep that pawn tied down. And then I, I love your idea of trying to advance on the king side. That's where you want to get the second weakness, I feel. Use your pawns to create some weaknesses. Once you've got the two weaknesses, your opponent becomes... A bit, well, their, their defences are too stretched, right? So this this seems like a very, very nice way to play. And I really don't... I. I I think Magnus has got very good chances of winning this. Really good chances. Especially with five extra minutes on the clock, especially because Ferruja hates these types of positions in general. Um, as Magnus, I would probably just move the White King to the side and then decide which one uh, to push. I mean, in an ideal world, this girl gang, the mean girls here, uh, will have five members. And uh, for example, here, you could start pushing everything forward and then decide later what to do with them. I'm not sure what <laughs> these pawns That's are doing, crazy. but they look nice at least. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is the type of thing where you just don't want to commit yet. You want to grind, you want to kind of make your opponent crack under the pressure. And uh, it's just difficult. For example, in a position like this, it's difficult for black to activate his rook. Um, you can't really activate it now because white just steps back and will win a pawn. Um, if you defend this pawn with your king, you're always walking into potential checks later on. White will save this one for later. Um, this square as well, not safe. This is a beautiful outpost for White's knight anyway. White would love to occupy the open file with his rook later. And uh, yeah, if, White, if black is stuck for plans, why not just kind of shuffle the king across, uh, protect your pawn in the center of the board. Um, yeah, another idea that I wouldn't be surprised from Magnus would be to kind of push one of these pawns, but it's not clear yet which one you want to push and in what order. I mean, I mean, the position, actually, the way that you've kind of made it seem, seems like it's quite desperate for black. Mm -hmm. Is now the time, if black were to get, okay, so he retreats the knight to attack the pawn, the king has to move over. I mean, is black looking at making, like, desperado moves, like pushing the F pawn forward just mm -hmm. to challenge in the centre, just to give the knight something to do? Yeah. Um, Maybe. I mean, that's why, not right now anymore, but uh, I would have loved to put the king on this square, part partly to defend this pawn, which is undefended, but uh, also just to be able to kind of maintain the integrity of white's central pawns. But Magnus, he's being a bit more direct. This is where we had some kind of uh, back and forth debates in our uh, Grind Like a Grandmaster course about when to go for it, whether to be really direct if you have the option. Uh, Magnus dropped his knight back and gave a check to the black king, forcing the black king back. and. 
would you say Magnus is more direct than you, David? Yes. Obviously, after doing that course with him, yeah, he um, must be very interesting, you know, to work with a world champion on anything. But you're more patient build up than mm. than Magnus. I mean, definitely. Uh, and right, it's interesting that I just like you know find find. Do you think? I mean, he's a more universal player than me. I think simply he's much more confident when kind of attacking, taking risks because he trusts his calculation maybe a bit more than I do. Yeah. Um, so even if he goes forward, even if it doesn't work, he'll he'll kind of regroup. He'll step back and then he'll try and grind again. Right. Um, Interesting. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So no, it's no, always no. every player has different kind of preferences, right? And he did mm. mention in a few games we analysed there that I was a bit too patient occasionally. Right. Yeah, a bit so. too sadistic. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> but, uh, I'm expecting yeah. Magnus at some point either to bring his rook to the open file or to centralise his king, just improve all his pieces and still uphill struggle for Ferruja. Meanwhile, the bar inching towards Pragnananda's uh, side in uh, game four against Duda. Prag, he has to win that game to take it to tie breaks. Magnus currently thinking, and we're going to go back down to Miami. Chess going on inside the arena. And I guess also outside Sweater. It's not only in front of the computer screens that our chess players are really, really impressing. Tanya Satchtev, she's fresh off a uh, Olympiad medal. And now she's playing 10 boards at the same time with simulation chess here. It's uh, just getting started, I can see here. And uh, I'm going to ask one of the players here, how do you feel you're doing against Tanya so far? I think I'm doing really good. This is just the beginning, but let's see. And Tanya, she is uh, definitely trying to keep her focus here while at the same time hearing that I'm talking about her. So we shall see. It's, it's the birthday <laughs> woman, Tanya Satchtev, playing against half the room right now. <laughs> Go Tanya, that's intense, playing uh, that many games at the same time. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I've never celebrated my birthday, let's say, <laughs> playing that much chess. Uh, but yeah, Tanya, she's been in great form lately, both at the board and in the commentary, of course. And yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it's going to be an honour for those players to play against her. Um, she'll hope for some birthday gifts, though. Yeah. She'll want to win those gifts. I know Tanya, she's a... <laughs> Competitive. Uh, she's a winner. Yeah. yeah. And what is the biggest number of uh, simultaneous games you've ever played? Oh, I once played around 60, but it took... 60? It took hours and hours yeah I, I think in general you want to play about 20 something at the same time but i took part in this kind of record attempt to play uh it was a bunch of grandmasters i think 10 of us and we were all playing as many games as possible i think it took me four and a half hours or something oh whoa and i did lose a few so well <laughs> no tiring. wonder it's tiring yeah that's intense and uh, what's going on in the arena as well it's tense alureza is he now fighting for his life in this game or what's the situation for him yeah, um, as Simon mentioned as well, black is solid enough for now. Um, he only does have that one big weakness on the C6 square, and also he does have ideas of trading off pieces. And, okay, what's happening here? Magnus has just traded off a set of knights. Ferruja is indeed fighting for his life, but if he fights successfully over the next few moves, he could just eliminate all the danger immediately. And, okay, Magnus, oh. has, Magnus looked up and he's reacting, frowning. He's surprised by this. If it's possible, if all the rooks disappear and that endgame is a draw, then Ferruja has just worked out everything perfectly, but it's a big gamble. King and pawn endgames, assuming the rooks get traded off now. King and pawn endgames, the hardest endgame in chess. And, uh, okay, white's pawns on the king side. It's all about this right side of the board now, whether Magnus can break through there. If he can, he's winning. But uh, it's so hard to judge. I mean, this is partly calculation, partly just instinct. Magnus thinks it's winning, judging by his facial expression. And, okay, White's King can't break through on this left side of the board. That left side is going to get completely blocked anytime soon. Um, so the King goes the other way. And Ferruja, I would hate this position as black. It's, oh. it's a two-result game. It can only be a white win or a draw. Uh, but Ferruja, he's going to have to find the perfect setup for black in order to draw this one. Just judging by the evaluation bar, it should be a draw with best play, but black is cramped. If you look in the center on the E file, white has a bit more space with this pawn there, meaning that he has the advantage in the same game. Uh, but this is one of the ones that we can work out. There's a definite objective result here if both players play perfectly, which is a draw, but objective, uh, kind of in practical terms, so difficult, so unpleasant to defend. Yeah, definitely especially with all that lack of space and working out how many extra pawn moves White has. 
Oh, anxious stuff here in the between Magnus and uh, Ferruja. We do have uh, Mahdi cheering for Alireza Ferruja. He's going to need it because he is fighting for his life in this game and uh, in the match. If this is a draw, we will see blitz tiebreaks between Magnus and Alireza Ferruja. And I think the whole world is hoping for that. These two amazing uh, blitz players. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping for it to go to Armageddon. Because yeah, <laughs> then I don't know. I don't. I honestly don't know who's going to win. You know, I guess the player who has the white pieces, who has the extra time, is just going to nail it. But who knows? And uh, meanwhile, Black has five minutes here, and it's a crucial decision for Ferruja. Does he allow the White King co to continue stepping into the uh, up the board into the Black Half, or does he prevent that? Um, you've got to be really careful how you commit your pawns in these end games. He just keeps the tension, just moves the Black King across. And now, if I were Magnus, I would be moving that white king to the edge of the board. Doesn't look great, but uh, at least once the king is there, you can throw pawns forward. Um, you're more flexible. I'm just worried that if white's king doesn't take the opportunity to step forward now, it might not get a second chance. So it's now or never. <laughs> <laughs> might be a draw anyway, but uh, we'll see. Uh, Magnus, how does he want to win this endgame? One thing that surprises me is that Magnus frowned so much and mm. then kind of was shocked. But it does look like it should be a draw. I mean, black doesn't have any weaknesses, despite what's extra space in the middle of the board. Is it a sign Magnus is feeling confident in the game, that, that, that facial reaction? Either that or maybe he just assumed that this was a win and kind of wrote it off. Hmm. And uh, now he's having to calculate. He's realizing it's not so simple. Simon, you have uh, thoughts here? Maybe you should have been more patient, David. Yeah. You know, I, maybe I maybe, <laughs> maybe you got that to teach Magnus, you know, from the course. It's not just Magnus teaching you. Maybe like if he'd have just taken his time a little bit more, he could have had the the second weakness on the king side already. Mm. I mean, of course he's pushing for the win here with his active king, more space and the pawn breaks, but black is very solid. Black sh probably should be holding this one. Um we're also hearing I, I you know, just to give you an update on the other big match which is gonna you know, uh, if this is a draw and Prague wins, for example, well, that, that's going to lead to probably the, the most exciting match tomorrow, right? Oh. Uh, and it seems like Prague is a little bit better in his game, but... The bar on that one. Yeah. Yeah. All so, of the way on Prague side, black side. Which is probably wow. a good sign for the entertainment of, you know, leaving it to the last day. We, we kind of all want it on the last day, really, Absolutely. don't we? Last day. I mean, if Prague just wins this, next, wins this game, he gets at least one point. He will have a chance tomorrow against Magnus. Yep. Uh, yep. I mean, if he beats Magnus, he'll, even if Magnus wins this game, he'll catch up. Uh, if Magnus doesn't win this game, Prague wins tomorrow against Magnus, he'll yeah. leapfrog him, win the tournament. What a big game this is. Um, I looked over as well, dude is playing some weird stuff, so uh, Prague punishing him. Yep. Oh. Which is good for the tournament, yeah. I think. Yeah, we might good. see two tie breaks. Oof. Oh. We'll be here all night, guys. What do you, what do you think? Yep. There was a tie break between... Uh, Pragnananda and Duda. Well, I'm thinking it's, uh, it's a great way to spend Saturday, you know, time breaking yeah. up. So I'm, I think that, I mean, to be honest, uh, the energy seems to be with Prag after he held that, after he held that ending. You know, it seems to be on his side a little bit. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I just can't wait till tomorrow as well. Prag versus Magnus. Everyone, remember, that is the big one tomorrow. Yeah. Make sure you all come and watch that. It's going to be fantastic. Set your alarms, yeah. yeah. I mean, if Prag wins that and wins the whole thing, I mean, That'll be news around the world, won't it, in the chess community? Yeah. I mean, it'll be yeah. ginormous. Beyond. I mean, in India, he'll, yeah. he's already a celebrity, he's already a hero, but yeah. and that'll be massive. And if Faruja wins this encounter, say in the tie breaks, mm -hmm. because I don't think he's going to do it here at all, then it will be anyone's game. Yeah, mm -hmm. if yep. he wins the tie breaks, yeah, he will yeah. be tied. No, Magnus will be up by one point right. only. Yeah. Two other eyes of Russia. Wow, what a finish it's going to be. Uh, we have to admit, we're kind of hoping Magnus won't win this game just for the excitement in the tournament on that final day. But of course, the best man has to win. Yeah, and meanwhile, heartbreak for Neiman fans. He oh. has fallen to defeat, so still <sighs> not off the scoreboard. Uh, Aronian just he got a great game there. You've got a feel for him, haven't you? Because he just yeah. get it's always he's so close. He wins the first game. He's a great player, Neiman. <laughs> he's going to be one of the best in the world. It's just 
tough week. Yeah, it's you know it's really sad, and he, he's not cashing in at the moment. So maybe maybe one of the other guys can buy Zubrits today, eh? You know, mm-hmm. and. Well, I mean, I, I think Black is holding this now pretty yeah. pretty well. Uh, I don't see White. The only way White's going to win this is if he creates a way in for his king. You you can't win this unless you get your king into the position or maybe get a pass pawn. But I just can't see any way that that White can do this. So he's trying a pawn push. He's trying to make some weaknesses in Black's position. But I think Black is so far remaining very solid at the moment. I mean, but if Black just simply blocks it off yeah. by pl- making this move, mm-hmm. is there's no way in. Dead draw. Dead draw, Total. yeah. Dead draw. White's king will never, ever step beyond the fourth rank now. No matter what you do, if you capture a pawn, you step your white pawn forward, it's just all blocked. I think, I just have a feeling, Magnus, when the rooks came off, he assumed that the white king could go to the left side of the board and break in there, but maybe he just forgot that this pawn structure now that we see on the left completely shuts it down. So even if the white king does a journey, that left side is blocked. Uh, I just have a feeling he assumed he could get through on that flank. But uh, here we go. We yeah. will see a draw any moment now. The position is going to be completely blocked. We Nothing have... else to play for. The kings can't get through. And this is the Lego move I was talking about. When someone pushes their pawn, you move their pawn next to it. So, yeah, I mean, this is, yeah. You can play for 100 moves here, but <laughs> it's going to be a draw anyway. And there we go. Tie breaks. It's a draw. Yay! We will see blitz tie breaks between these two speed demons, Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Fruja. That will start five minutes after the final game in round four is finished. And that game is uh, Prague against uh, Duda. First of all, we're going to stay by these two to see if we can get some reactions. We see the arbiter walking up, and that is to hear the choosing of colors, I suspect. And it is Magnus who is the highest ranked on the tour, who can choose colors. But here he is, walking out. Will he stop for an interview or will he start preparing for a faster time control? Blitz chess with only five minutes on the clock. Let's go to Miami. How do you view going into the tiebreaker here now, Magnus? Um, no, it's, it's okay. Uh, I tried to press a little bit. I probably played inaccurately at some point because I think I had some advantage. Then like, I had some slight hope that the pawn ending could be, there could be chances there, but obviously there was nothing. Uh, but overall, um, with the way things were standing, draw was a good result for me. Yeah, because a loss would have taken destiny out of your hands, right? Yeah, no, I know regardless of what happens now, I, I will win the match if I win tomorrow. So that's that's good news. Uh, but obviously, um, I uh, I will try my very best now to, to gain that extra point. Good luck. Thank you. All right, Magnus Carlsen, he seems uh, focused, motivated, ready for a fight in the Blitz, which will start five minutes after this game finishes. Prague has to win it to take it to tie breaks. And the bar is liking it for uh, the young Indian. Yeah, I mean, what a congested board this is. All the pieces uh, still on. There's only been a trade of one set of pawns. What are these white pieces doing in the center? Those two white knights, the white queen, they look really uncomfortable. I love Black's queen. Uh, I think Prague has just placed her there on the last few moves, staring down at the white king. And look at Prague. He just had his head in his hands a moment ago, calculating he wants a breakthrough. He wants to win this one and decide it immediately. Maybe he doesn't need to. The black rooks could maybe be improved. The black dark square bishop could have been improved. He does trade off a set of one knights. Um, okay, I was going to say don't trade off. White was just a bit stuck there. He needs to keep as many pieces on the board as possible if he wants to win. But what do you guys think? How big is this advantage? It's definitely an advantage, Black. I mean, uh, again, two ways to evaluate the position. Generally, the pawn structure and the pieces, and the pawn structure on the queen side is is in Black's favour. That little pawn on the side of the board is doing a great job of just uh, holding down a square. Um, but, I mean, the, the computer gives this as plus one to Prague, which is the same as a pawn. I don't really see it as being plus one, personally. I think this I think this is not clear as clear as the computer is indicating, um, because... White's pretty solid, you know. Uh, there's, I don't think there's a, a clear tactical way through. Black's definitely better, but it's go, it's going to take some something else to win this position, some break, some something to happen. So it's not 
maybe not as clear as it, I, I say that now. Is Black actually winning a pawn here? Now I'm looking at this. Um, not quite. Not, not quite the knight sure moves, because the maybe. knight is going to move. Well, the knight could have defended. Okay, there was well, a threat of checkmate. This pawn pushing forward. Yeah. Okay. There are a few holes around the white king though. It's, 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 cer it's certainly very nice of Black because White's king is bad. Black's piece is a great, greatly placed, but something. Well, I think there's still something else that needs to be done to win this um, at the moment. I mean, how, how would you how would you go about um, improving the position here? When in doubt, pick up Harry the yeah, H pawn. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Black's H pawn yeah, definitely. Black's H-pawn does. It could act as a battering ram towards the white king. Um, yeah, I would love to improve the black rook somehow. Black's dark squared bishop isn't maybe doing as much work as some of the other pieces. OK, keeping pieces on the board. I approve of this one. Um, hitting the white queen, forcing her back to a bit of an odd square. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you're right, Simon. It's still very hard to break through. White's got everything covered for now. And uh, Prague needs a second wind. He needs a second kind of wave of attack. I, I was a bit surprised just as we joined the game, he traded off one set of knights. But white is so cramped right now that I think that really helped Duda. I think if Prague had kept that set of knights on the board, just kind of started pushing pawns, uh, pushing Harry the H-pawn towards the white king, improving his dark squared bishop, he would have had just complete control. Mm. But now it's the type of position where if knights disappear, if bishops disappear, it's probably just level. So it's an advantage, but it's not maybe as long-term as he would like, Prague. All right, Prague uh, fighting to win this game to uh, take this to tie breaks. Let's uh, go back to Miami. Svada out and about uh, the Eden Rock Hotel. What's happening, Svada? Well, I'm actually standing here with what I think are at least one, probably two big Prague fans. Because, Harshil, you are creating content for Chess Best India. Yes. And you're also uh, really cheering for Prague. Absolutely. I, I mean, after the first four days, I was like so excited that this is the perfect time to come and I hope that he can convert his game against Duda right now so that Prague versus Magnus tomorrow will be the, the a spectacle, just a spectacle. And, and uh, here's the story. I mean, this is the wife of a chess fanatic. That is the whole idea. So they're creating content, but Hayusha here really has to fo uh, follow Hajel and it's really quite the struggle, isn't it? It definitely is, because there was a time when I knew nothing about chess and I woke up in the morning listening to Sagar's voice on uh, everyone saying, Sagar, OP in the chat, OP in the chat. I literally knew nothing about chess. And today when I see these players play in a magnificent environment, it is so now wrecking and I just love it. But I gotta ask you guys, how big is Prague in India right now? Right now, I mean, the Prime Minister, I think Sachin Tendulkar, who's like the biggest sports person in India, he tweeted when Prague beat uh, Carlson, if I'm not mistaken. So I think that next step, as soon as he was able to beat Magnus the first time, it was like everyone in the world recognized him, recognized him. And now this Champions Chess Tour has really helped, you know, make him the player that he's, we know that he's going to be soon. And, and the Olympiad, I mean, he did so well in the Olympiad as well, the bronze medal on his board for Team India. We actually took the phone away from Ayushi prior to starting this, but there's actually 5,000 people who are following right now on their stream. So it's one of those meta situations where they're watching us do the interview, but at the same time watching the broadcast in India. This this is how chess is really is yeah. in India. We have the CEO of Chess Base India live here and 5,000 people watching. So thank, hi Sagar, we're, we're glad that we get to do this for you and we hope that you reach your 1 million subscribers soon. So guys, please subscribe to Chess Base India YouTube channel. Or you can watch here at Chess 24 and play buttons as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's it's a win-win situation. We're also, um, because we speak of Prague, we're trying to do this uh, with Chess Base India. They're trying to raise money for a scholarship, but everyone can go sign up on the Crypto FTX website. And that's a big win for them so that people who in India really require those funds, we can promote chess and bring everyone together and help them learn more and get some tutorials. There you got it. But now I think the most important is Prague getting a chance to play for her tiebreak. Absolutely, Svada. We uh, love hearing from Chess Base uh, India, a uh, great page for chess. And uh, we're huge fans of what India is doing for chess and how big it's becoming. Well, it's been big for a long time with uh, Vichy Anand, but Prague and all these youngsters, Gukesh, well, they're making it massive. And Prague, he is in the running of winning the FDX Crypto Cup, but he needs to take it to 
tie breaks. He needs to win this game, and the bar has shifted sides. Yeah, and maybe it's because of a move like this. It's really tricky, really creative from Duda. It looked like this move was actually impossible, but there is uh, a trap involved. If the Black Rook now gets greedy and captures this White Knight, it looks like Black is winning two pieces for a Rook, which is a big gain, but White will not capture the Rook, uh, giving Black the advantage. Instead, White would push his pawn forward with a double attack, and maybe this is something Prag missed. Duda leaning back looks pretty help, uh, happy with himself. Suddenly the White Knight, if it can't be captured uh, due to this variation, then what do you do about it? Suddenly there are ideas like, such as the knight jumping back and leaping into a nice square. Uh, suddenly there are ideas of white's bishop coming and attacking the rook. Um, yeah, if this pawn steps forward attacking the black queen, the momentum might change. Yeah. I have to say, you know, I, I think this is all a consequence of Pragnananda's pawn push in the centre of the board. You know, he had a very nice position. I mean, white was almost in a bind and then suddenly white is kind of unfurling himself. And uh, I think the momentum's changed. You know, I think that maybe White is going to start to turn things around so that he, he will be better in the next few moves. And objectively, uh, that shouldn't be the case because Black's position is fine. But psychologically, when you have had a grip and control for so long, it's so difficult to let go. Yeah, I mean, Black still has this great bishop. Black's knight looks nice and pretty. But, I mean, other than that, uh, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't think you can push forward in the centre now. This square is covered sufficiently by white. White would just capture a pawn, win a pawn. It does cross my mind that you can trap white's rook. You can actually trap this piece right now. Uh, but it feels like there will be some consequences. Uh, white can step forward with this pawn. White can jump forward with his bishop. I'm not sure um, exactly here. It just feels a bit wrong for black being a bit too materialistic here. But uh, that'll be on Prague's radar. Maybe getting greedy, going for this piece. Uh, what else? As you mentioned there, Ivanka, White's Knight has suddenly found an active square, the first active piece Duda's had in the whole game. <laughs> and uh, now Prague's actually lower on the clock. Oh, this one still could go in any direction. Prague, it feels like he deserves to have the advantage, but Duda, with this last really clever move, uh, yeah, fighting back. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to work out what, what the scenario will be. Like, let's say Prague loses this, well, draws this game, loses this match, and if he beats Magnus tomorrow, can he still win? I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll bring up the scores he can. If he well, wins tomorrow, he will win, do we think? Yeah, because Magnus yeah. can now take two points maximum. So, and if Prague loses this, Magnus will be in a three-point lead. And if Prague wins the match, they will be on the same score. But I'm 99% uh, sure then it's that uh, direct encounters between the two players on the same score. Right. And obviously, if Prague wins. Okay. Well, he will be the winner. But we can throw in Ferruja into the mix That's true. as well. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, if Ferruja wins the tie break, then that will take him to 13 points. One point behind Magnus. One point behind Magnus. And uh, one point ahead of uh, Prague. Yeah. And even if he loses, loses and takes that one point, if he then wins with three points, and suddenly are they... My maths is bad. We could see a scenario where all three players end up on the same number of points uh, on the final day. And remember, uh, Prague beat Ferruja on day one. Ferruja would have had to beat Magnus in the tie breaks. And, and oh. Prague beating Magnus. But then it's, uh, I think, a number of uh, either match wins or game wins, I think, is the next tiebreaker. Ooh, By the way, have... We, we have another blunder, I feel, oh. uh, potentially um, it, on the board, because uh, I think what's occurred is that... Um, this move you pointed out, F4, is not going to be as strong in a lot of variations um, oh, wow. because the, there's a hanging piece on D3. So I think uh, I think Duda has actually Whoa. done a minor a minor blunder at least uh, when he didn't he didn't need to try to swap pieces off as quickly as he did, David. Yeah, yeah I mean so, we have to point this out, Simon. That's a really nice spot because um, it's really hard detail. Uh, it's a really easy detail to miss, but a hard one to uh, spot at first. Duda just brought his bishop to trade off. Prague immediately swapped it, and normally you would want to take with your rook. Um, this looks fantastic for the rook, but this tactic that didn't work earlier, rook takes knight, uh, because of this fork you mentioned, um, now black can sidestep and attack the loose piece, hitting this rook, which is un, uh, undefended, and after the black rook falls, the white rook also falls, black emerges with an extra knight. Therefore, Duda could not recapture with his rook. Um, if we go back to the game position, he had to step back with his great knight. Uh, that great piece forced to retreat, and suddenly things opening up along this line towards the white queen. There's a pin, but this attack met by a counterattack is still chaotic. Um, the evaluation bar really loving Prague's position now, but 
dilemma. What do you do? Where do you move this rook? Or do you move this rook at all? Um, you could definitely make an argument for capturing this bishop. Uh, after all, this rook is defended by black's queen. And uh, we could see a situation like this one, where after a rook trade, he doesn't go for this. Uh, we could see a situation where black has two pieces for the white rook. But this one, it's unclear. Black's king is a bit open. Uh, instead, Prague just retreated. And Duda, he's begging for a bishop exchange now. I like Prague's decision, just keeping the tension. He will get a better pawn structure, or maybe even win a pawn. Yeah, white. I mean, I'm not sure what I would try to do here as white. So many options you could take. Uh, this rook, you could take uh, this bishop. You could just capture it a pawn. <laughs> what do you guys think? Is Prague still better? Yeah, I mean, Prague, advantage? Prague must be better now, definitely. I mean, uh, he, he can probably be a pawn up if he wants to, as you mentioned, but maybe maybe just keep the pressure. And I love this queen takes. Yep. Um, Black's knight looks very strong, and it's just a pawn in the middle of the board. Mm -hmm. Fantastic pawn there. So yeah. he is better. Is it enough to win? I, I, I'm not sure yet, but um, he's keeping the pressure up, and they're both under three minutes. Yeah, Prague with the advantage. And he's quite good at these positions, right, uh, Prague? Every time we've seen him, not only is he super accurate, but... When he's got a small advantage, he just kind of steps it up, steps it up, and then pounces when he gets the opportunity. And yeah, this white pawn now, isolated, weak uh, in the center. Maybe we trade bishops, maybe we try and get the black knight back into the game somehow. Still a lot of hard work to be done there yep. in order to convert this. It's an advantage, but it's not a uh, kind of long lasting one. It's now or never for Bragg. Yep. Under two minutes. Under two minutes, and the tension is just rising. And uh, whilst the players are thinking, do I have time for some selfies? Am Ooh. I going to ruin the mood? No. Uh, go for it. Okay, oh, no, well, no. I'll quickly say Naksh Deep Sandhu, well, he's sending 2,545 endgames to Prague via tele telepathy. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> and uh, maybe Prague can uh, get that one. And then I'm going to go on to Ryan Capstick, who uh, actually came up with a song for Hans Moki. Now, who's good at singing? You. You. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well <laughs> you voted yourself in there, Ivanka. So off you go. Off I go. go. Yeah. Okay. So okay, quickly. So it's it's he's Hans Moki, not a joker. He's a Magnus smoker playing chess in the Miami Sun. Uber eater, not a cheater. Sooner world beater. Some people call him the space cowboy. Very nice. Okay. I love it. I kind of got the tune a bit mixed up, but I'm quite turning red. But okay, back to the game. <laughs> Very impressive, Yovanka. And look at the bar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> look at the White King as well. It's going to come under heavy fire. Prague has planted his knight deep in the White territory. That rook is coming now. He's won a pawn. I would be terrified here if I was Duda. Ah, the Black Queen is maybe going to join the uh, join the attack as well soon. Look at Prague, he's so ready. He's got under two minutes, but he was hovering there. He's got his mouse over his rook, uh, maybe ready to move, ready to react as soon as Duda chooses what to do. Black, the white queen can go and grab a couple of pawns, but it's all about the fact that the white king has minimal shelter now. White has only two pawns protecting the white king. Black has three pawns. Black's king much safer than its counterpart. Oof, predictions here. Wow, Black's just going to do it. Gonna yeah, win. I mean... He's going to do it. Black's a pawn up, attacking. White King too weak. Time up now. Yeah. I mean, this is this is a... And, he, and you know, the other thing is, Prag's just as cool as a cucumber, isn't he? Mm. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't, like, freak out too much. If it was me, I'd be freaking out here, but, you know... <laughs> so that, close now. I'd be like, yeah, it's just like, you know, I'll be all over the shop, but this, this is not me, it's Prag. Oh. Prag time. This uh, White King move, mysterious, I've got to say. Yeah. Um, walking away from any black knight checks, but this white king is on an open diagonal, so you can't do it right now, but if the black queen can ever land on this diagonal that the white king sits on with a check, it's just going to be game over. Uh, so you need to find a safe square for the black queen to use eventually uh, to check. And you, and you might just be able to like, start creating some mating patterns here, get the knight out of the way and put the, I don't know, I mean, knight near the king. There's yeah. there's a lot of ideas here that Prague can start generating with his pieces and this looks good. And I think the Black King is very safe here, you know, because and he and he and he plays the this very natural move because I don't think White can grab that pawn because the Black Queen comes in. And um this is called the Arabian mate. I, I'm sure Yvanka knows that one. Yeah. One of the apparently the oldest checkmate ever recorded in history, okay, that one is, yeah, with the knight and, yeah. knight and queen or rook like that. Yeah, we good, Simon. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, the old research. That, I think that was in the first ever chess book. <laughs> that check, mate. So it's also sure. important here yeah. that uh, in this position, white can give one check of his own, but the black king can just hide. And uh, for example, white has no more checks. If the knight jumps in, the black rook is ready to swoop back and uh, capture. So, yeah, you guys are right. This last move is the killer. This uh, knight closing the door around the white king. I mean, not only do you have ideas of getting the queen later to this square or maybe the rook down to the second rank uh, later, but you also have the king on the diagonal. Wow, dude is just dancing with his king. He's just spent two moves now with his king in such a sharp position. I mean, one thing I would be tempted to do at some point is move this pawn and then kind of try to use this diagonal. And, okay, do, uh, of course, Prague finds something even stronger. I feel he brings his rook across, attacking the white queen. Next move, he's just going to eat up this pawn. Uh, maybe he's got something else in mind. Actually, how can the white queen keep in touch with this square? She can't. She can't. Wow, wherever the white queen goes, if, say, she takes a pawn, check, and the game will end. Prague, he's on the brink now. Wow. He's going to checkmate or win material. I think it's guaranteed at this point. Yeah. 45 seconds for Jan Christoph Duda. <clears throat> He uh, lost two final games against Magnus yesterday, losing his advantage, and uh, it had to be decided in tie breaks. The same is about to happen today. He had his all in his pocket, but Prague about to win in a must-win situation, taking um, it to tie breaks. Winning with black on demand. So impressive. Very, very impressive. And uh, the queen has moved, but of course there is there's still some hope. You know, this is a good defensive move because it does allow the white knight to come back. So Duda still holding on for dear life. Still fighting Duda. Um, we saw that Prague, he kind of dragged his queen forward. He lingered for a second or two, double checking that he wasn't blundering, and then he made the move. And that's really professional uh, from the youngster. You don't want to make a move too quickly. We've seen that backfire for players in the past. You don't want to kind of mouse slip by just moving it all in one motion. You just want to hover and then you unclick and make the move. That's a really good kind of online chess strategy, yeah. technique. And uh, I'm wondering whether the rook can actually swing across to the e3 square and just pile on the pressure. Yep. Um, another That's move very strong. would just retreat the, to check, check the knight, to check the king, sorry. Yeah, okay, That's but the rook it. has uh, moved. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this white knight is the only thing holding the fort and whoa, <laughs> dude, uh, he's giving away the white knight. The black knight might fall, but that can't work. They can't can't work. work. They just can't work. The king work. cannot live like I mean, that. White king surely won't last very long. No. Duda shaking his head. He spotted a way for black to win. Can Prague yeah. spot a way for black to win with under 20 seconds? You can take that white knight yeah. with the black rook. Yeah. The white king will not survive in the open. I think Look you can at just the keep checking. It's 11.7. .7. That means there must be a mate or, a, you know, white has to give the queen up to stop a mate. And he's going for the ending. Wow, okay. Prague. That, that is, I mean, this is an easy ending because you're two pawns up, but... Yeah. Maybe maybe the other way was even clearer. But the thing is, you see one win. Yeah. You don't need to even find a better win, do you? And uh, this, is, this is a very easy win. Look at Duda. He knows this is hopeless. Black has two extra pawns. It will take time, but the game is pretty much over. And Duda, I think he's just going to get out of here and resign mm. from yeah. his body language. This is really professional from Prague. I mean, he had a bunch of different wins there, but maybe some of them were complicated. He only had about 10, 15 seconds on his clock, so he made a few quick moves, got rid of all risk, and... We've seen Prague's end game skills. Yeah. He will convert this as, like asleep. Is it default. time, David? This game. Is it time here in this game? <laughs> Is it time to resign? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Just resign, Duda. Do the right thing. Simon, <laughs> Simon is the new uh, Mr. Scheibel of chess. <laughs> no, sorry. You resign now. You resign now. <laughs> I don't think I know Mr. Scheibel. Who, who, who's, who's it should be a feature on the, on the chess 24 play zone whenever like the bar is saying this much. Simon comes up. Just resign. Yeah. <laughs> Just get it done with. Duda, I thought he was going to let his clock run out. He uh, went down to two seconds there. And now Prag can even go three pawns up. And he's just going to yeah. take this pawn. He's going to go back for White's remaining A pawn. And Duda's had enough. Yeah. Prag's still so focused, though. Oh, he's still going. He's still going. He's going to be th only three pawns down. <laughs> <laughs> just resign, Duda. Come on. But, I mean, look at Prag. I mean, I'm so in awe. Like, most people here would be relaxing. I would be breathing out heavily. The job is done. The hard work is done, but he's still so focused. And Duda can't even look at the screen. You know, he's that disgusted with his position. There's just no hope whatsoever. And he's just going through the motions until he just works up 
that will to resign. Yeah, he's getting himself ready psychologically for tie breaks. And there we go. There we go. It's over. Prague in a must win situation. He takes it to those tie breaks. He is definitely still fighting to win the FDX Crypto Cup. And the spectators in the Miami arena today, they, well, got value for their money. They're going to get to see two Blitz tie breaks in the arena. Five minutes and the Blitz tie breaks will start. I bet you know, Christoph will just go back to his lounge and uh, prepare. Probably same for uh, Pragnananda. Only five minutes to get ready for those Blitz tie breaks. Ali Reza Vruja and Magnus Carlsen will also play Blitz tie breaks. And we have a reaction. Right back, you're still in the fight here to win this tournament. Uh, yeah, I'm just very happy to be back in this match. I didn't really expect uh, going to going to this game, so I'm very happy. Are you happy with the game and how you played it as well? Yeah, I think... Uh, I think I played quite well. Uh, I put him on a lot of pressure uh, on the clock as well in the starting. So, yeah, I'm quite happy. Good luck in the playoffs. Yeah, thanks. Ooh, wow. In four minutes, the drama continues. Oh, David, what do you expect? Two blitz tie breaks going on at the same time. <laughs> I don't know what to expect. There have been comebacks, there have been blunders, there have been just bizarre moves, and uh, I just want that to continue. I want the players to continue surprising us, and no matter what happens now, we're guaranteed an exciting finish tomorrow. Definitely. We have to take a look at the results, you guys. Two matches have finished uh, in uh, Miami. It's a win for Liam Le in only two games against Anish Giri to take all three points, and eventually a win for Levon Aronian, winning two games against Hans Niemann to take all three points. But Magnus Carlsen, a disastrous start to the day. He lost the first game to Alireza Ferruja. He came back with a win, and after two draws, they will decide the match in blitz tiebreaks. Pragnananda, a massive comeback in the fourth game, must win situation to take it to blitz tie breaks it's gonna be even hard to decide which games to follow but uh well we will follow the first game with magnus Carlsen and ali reza Ferruja to speed demons and uh before that happens we can hear some reactions from the players who have finished for the day let's hear from levon aronian i was just uh i told to myself before the game just to play with an instinct without really calculating much and it worked out is that something you sometimes do that makes you play better chess? Yeah, when you're not in a good shape and you're blundering a lot, I think at some point you just have to rely on your instincts. <coughs> you now take a win with you today. How much of a chess player's life and his mood is affected by the score of his games? Um, sometimes, uh, like, uh, you know, it's extremely important. Uh, of course, it's extremely important for me as well here. But uh, generally, I have a different approach. Uh, for me, rapid and blitz is more fun. So even if I lose sometimes, I, I'm fine with that. I just have fun. But uh, the classical is the thing that, that when I lose in classical, that's when I'm really upset. <laughs> Is that a little bit cheating the system playing tournaments like this where you get four, well, three or four rapid games against top players in the world every day? Do you feel like that is mainly just very, very good practice for when you start playing classical again? Yeah, of course, it's a great practice, but it's also very tiring. Uh, it's normal uh, because it's not just one game and, you know, there's uh, emotions are multiplied. Thank you so much for taking the time. Always, Levon, stopping by us. It's a pleasure to follow you, and we are really appreciative that you are here in Miami. Thank you very much, and I'm back to 50%. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Levon Aronian, always looking sharp. Now, these are the current standings in the FTX Crypto Cup, and especially interesting. Magnus Carlsen on uh, 14 points. That's the least he will have after today. Prague will at least have 13, and Ali Reza Ruzia will have at least have 12 points. And that means it, it won't be decided after today, you guys. It's all going to come down to tomorrow with Prague against Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Ruzia even can take the win in the tournament. We're gonna go quickly down to Miami before it all starts in the arena. What's happening, Svada? <laughs> It's a chance here for chess fans to meet their real heroes. If you want to join me, there's uh, actually a queue that is lining up all the way 
very far into this area with different chess fans. And what they get to do right now is to meet uh, two other heroes. It's uh, Levon Aronian and Liam Lea, who are right now standing, and they get a chance to really greet their heroes and, uh, and get a bit of a chat. They take a picture. They get to go live on Chess24 broadcast while taking the picture. And I'm not even sure if this gentleman who is in the picture knows that he's at the same time as taking the picture going straight live out to the broadcast. Thank you so much. And this, yeah. is, this, did this make you nervous at all? Uh, not at all. I mean, these are like cool super GMs. So I love being here. So thank you so much. I, I want to just join them for a quick picture as well. And uh, so being one of the guys who get to meet and greet, we'll go back to you, Kaya. <laughs> oh, that looks like a lot of fun. And how cool by Liam Le and Levon Aronian to uh, take the time to meet the fans in Miami. So many people have come out to watch the FDX Crypto Cup and they are getting value for their money. It's so dramatic today. Two blitz tie breaks and all three players fighting to win the tournament is in those blitz tie breaks. We will follow the game between Magnus Carlsen and Ali Reza Vruja. Magnus has chosen to start with the white pieces. Does that surprise you in any way, David? Um, to an extent, maybe the last game with white there wasn't maybe Magnus's finest effort. He did have pressure though. Um, it's his strategy from yesterday, essentially. He did the same against Duda and it nearly worked there. Mm. So um, white, black, the players just have to adapt to the new time control. Absolutely. And I don't actually think that Magnus or uh, Alireza has arrived the arena yet. But they have to come soon because uh, the tie breaks are about to start. Remember, two blitz games now to decide the match. The winner will take two points in the match, the loser one point. And let's hear from Magnus. Else, how do you feel about it? It's, um, it's going to be interesting. Um, this uh, result could potentially be, be crucial, so I need to give it my own. You don't feel any nerves, do you? No, obviously I feel nervous. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. <sighs> He's a human. Imagine that. Magnus Carlsen feeling nervous before this battle with Ali Reza Ferruja. If they tie the Blitz uh, match with the two Blitz games, each with white pieces, then it will be decided in Armageddon, which is so exciting. Magnus with the white pieces here in the first Blitz game. Only five minutes on the clock, three seconds increment after every move. It is so much faster. Who do you hold as a favorite, Simon? Well, I did say um, Feruza, um, huh? I thought was going to be the favorite if it came down to this time limit. I'm not really sure why I said that, <laughs> to be honest, but uh, I, I honestly think this is just a throw a coin. They're both amazing Blitz players, so it, you know, it really is 50-50, I think. Yeah. Here we go. The Blitz has started. It has started and it's the English opening. Uh, Black's Bishop coming out now. White just pushing a pawn forward. They'll just get developed. They'll get their pieces out into the center and transfer the battle to the middle game. Very sensible strategy, especially in Blitz. You don't have to think too early in the game. You just develop. You just kind of yeah, control squares, control the center. And what do you guys think about this choice? Ferruja, if I remember correctly, actually used this opening in the Candidates tournament against Ding Loren. Uh, so Ferruja sticking to something he knows. Magnus, of course, knows everything about the openings, about all of them, pretty much. I think it's a wise choice by Magnus. I mean, I, I, I think uh, the English is a good opening, but this is more like, you know, try to get a small advantage, keep all the pieces on the board um, and just push. And here you get a space advantage. This is uh, quite a nice structure generally uh, for white to have. But of course, black knows his stuff as well here, creating some problems with that pawn. But I don't know, I, I, I like being white in these positions uh, personally. So I'm a bit biased in white's favor. Yeah, and uh, I'm not sure, Yvanka, is this game still it's, following Ding Loren against Alarita Ferruja? It still was following and then I... Yes, no, not anymore. Okay, white so. pushes a pawn, defending the center. But either way, I mean, the whether or not Ferruja uh, is following that game, he will have studied the ideas from the black side. Uh, look at black's clock time as well. Barely spent a second. Ferruja up to this point continues pushing, trying to destabilize white over there on the queen side, on that left flank. And Magnus, will he react, I was going to say, by pushing a pawn, blocking things up, or more dynamically? Getting the white pieces into gear. And Simon, you like this because white has more space, white has slightly better development right now in the center. White's knights look pretty good. 
Yeah, I mean, they, they call it, it's a bit like what they call a Moroxy bind setup, which is where you get this light square bishop pointing towards the middle and uh, controlling the middle with a bit of extra space. And uh, um, white is also, as you, as you mentioned, a bit better developed here. Black's got to get those queenside pieces into the game. Um, and I can also see white having a half open file, a weakness that black has in the middle of the board, that pawn being a problem. I mean, these are just little things. Black's got obviously good pieces and counterplay as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's still in the balance, really. Early days as yet. Yeah, definitely early days. And it kind of feels like white has the slight, bet slightly better long term prospects. And uh, black, of course, has a very solid position and active pieces. And I wasn't expecting this move from uh, Magnus. I was expecting the, the B pawn to push itself up one square forward. Yeah, I mean, Magnus is not scared of uh, basically doing some damage to his pawn structure here because if Black ever takes um, with his pawn on the side of the board, he's going to have the better pawn structure in the long run. So all he has to do is go pawn takes pawn and, and White's pawns are then separated and they can never connect as we see here. So long term wise, actually, Black has the better position structurally here. But piece, pieces are all on Magnus' side. So yeah. it's a bit of a double edged situation at the moment. Yeah, and Black's pawns compromised as well. When Ferruja allowed that trade of knight for bishop, Magnus kind of frowned, he grimaced, he was like, oh, that doesn't look good for you, mate. Uh, <laughs> I've seen that face before when I've made mistakes, blunders against Magnus. <laughs> Must be so off-putting. Yeah. You know, you play a move and you get the grimace. Every move I've Magnus, made, Magnus uh, is like, oof. Uh, but, but uh, either way, uh, White's got full control. Yeah, I mean, look at the dark square bishop, I was about to say, I mean, this is what, you know, the grimace, White's dark square bishop is just cutting across the board now. Uh, and it looks like a fantastic long-term piece. I mean, yeah, it, it, something went wrong there for Black, definitely, in that little uh, excursion. Yeah. And uh, he actually has the option of getting the bishop pair as well. Um, and, uh, well, Ali Reza is desperately going to try to double his rooks along the A-line just to attack a potentially weak pawn. But is, is this kind of enough to offset everything else that's wrong with his position? It doesn't look like it. It looks like the real action is actually going to happen towards the Black King. As Simon mentioned, White's dark square bishop is the unrivaled minor piece. It's pointing towards that Black King sooner or later. White also has that four versus three pawn advantage on the king side. They'll step towards that Black King. They'll create some real problems. And uh, it's nice to keep it kind of in your pocket. Capturing that remaining Black Bishop with the White Knight would see two bishops against two knights. Um, that imbalance, it's unclear who it favours in general, but uh, when it's this open, probably the bishops. First Magnus, though, he wants to play on both flanks, both sides of the board, activating his remaining piece. Some threats at some point of that dark square bishop jumping out the way and White's rook hitting some pawns. And he's just being greedy here, Magnus. He wants the positional advantage and he wants kind of the dynamic advantage of his pieces being marked. All right. Remember, there are two blitz tie breaks going on inside the arena. Duda and Prague also playing. And let's quickly hear from Prague's coach, uh, Ramesh, about Prague playing these tie breaks. Ramesh, coach of Prague Nanda, um, Prague isn't necessarily as comfortable with the faster time limits, is he? Yeah, he's uh, been getting used to this uh, shorter time control. Uh, we have been, uh, before the lockdown, we are largely focusing on playing standard time control. But uh, since the lockdown, uh, we have been focusing uh, on uh, rapid time controls as well. So he's getting, uh, with each tournament, he's getting better, I guess. And do you feel it's good enough to compete in this format? It's uh, too early to judge, uh, make a judgment call on this. He's still an upcoming player. He has not yet uh, reached his peak, I believe. So only when he's reached his peak, probably we should uh, judge whether the peak is enough or not. I still believe he can grow. This extra point is really important now for the total standings. Are you nervous as all, at all as a coach? No, I'm not really worried about the standings as such. Uh, to just compete uh, at this level, and uh, prove his worth. That's what I'm uh, more focusing on, rather than the standings. Thank you so much, Ramesh. Okay. And the bar is all the way over to Prague side with the white pieces in the first blitz game against Jan Christoph Duda. As Svade says, that one point, it can turn out to be very important. Two points for the winner in blitz tie breaks, one point for the loser. The bar is also over to Magnus Carlsen's side. Do you think he will win this first game, David? It's beautiful for white. Uh, White's rooks look great right now, better than the black rooks, which are staring at a very well-protected white pawn. 
White's minor pieces we've mentioned, the White Knight, the White Bishop's beautiful, the White Queen now joining the action. I, I just don't really see how Ferruja is going to hold this. It looks like tactically as well, the Black Knights are very poorly placed. I have a feeling that Magnus is just going to rearrange his rooks mm -hmm. and move them away from the left and uh, maybe place them in the centre yeah. and get ready for the, that uh, king, kingside action. Yeah, exactly. Magnus can do pretty much anything he wants right now. He does eventually trade off his knight for Black's bishop. So now it is two bishops against two knights, but it's, it's clear the bishops are better pieces, both on their longest possible diagonals. Black has those two knights stuck, sadly, defending each other, especially the black knight at the top of the board. Bad piece. Better pawn structure for white. Everything's in white's favour. But we have seen Magnus struggle to convert advantages in the playoffs against Duda yesterday, for example, in the Blitz. Clock time's ticking down as well. Ferruja needs to survive until they both have around 30 seconds, and then it might get a bit more random. But right now, it's just full control for White. OK. Yeah. Simon, oh, what do you think here? Looking good? Yeah, just, just the same as same as what you said, basically. <laughs> um, it's it's looking great for White. I mean, you've even got ideas of bringing the, you know, the Queen in at some point. You've got everything. I mean, uh, you've got the two bishops, you've got control of the open file, um, and Black's knights cannot find any good squares. You've always got to look at your opponent's pieces, see their potential, and if you look at Black's pieces, they don't really have any potential to improve. Think where those knights can move to. They can't really they don't have any outposts, so um, it's a position which you would have thought Magnus would convert, like, um, over to stats person, but I'd say 95% of the time, you think, uh, should we say? What do you reckon, 95? Are you 95 on white side? 95%, 95. yeah, Let's go to nice Ferruja at this point. <laughs> yeah, it may, maybe is, but you got 100% score with your stats yesterday, Ivanka, so yeah, be more confident with your stat uh, predictions, I'd say, but... Um, but I think David mentioned the time uh, is is one of the only factors I think which could uh, you know go against Magnus here. He is down to one minute twenty seconds now. So yeah. Magnus um, smiling. Meanwhile, is that because of the position? Because it's so beautiful right now. Or is yeah. he still listening to something a bit humorous? Must <laughs> he headset? must be listening to something. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it doesn't seem to be distracting him from his play because again, he's doing everything perfectly. And uh, the great thing about this position for Magnus is that there's really no way for Ali Reza to kind of mix things up. The position is not that many minor pieces on the board and there's no way to attack because yesterday we saw things go wrong when there was so much activity on the board. And uh, Magnus, just look at that. He's just steam rolling with those pawns on the right. Uh, that's a pawn storm incoming. Yes, I mean, the position is very easy to play, right? I mean, you, you literally just, well, look at that. I mean, he, wow. even, he even leaves his queen on pre. Uh, <laughs> he, he's enjoying this a bit too much, I feel, at the moment. So uh, those pawns are killers. And um, I mean, this is yeah. unnecessary, but it's uh, flashy and probably strong. Yeah. yeah. If, the, if the white queen is taken by the black knight right now, then the black queen falls and yeah, that only favours white. The black queen looks like she has to run away. Maybe she swings herself across the board, or maybe she steps back one square, but that will only give Magnus a free hand to continue the attack. Mm. Yeah. Looking very, very good. Ferruja now below on the clock, about to tick under one minute. He's a speed monster. He can just he can play 50 moves in a few seconds, but in this position, it's just about whether he survives that far. Magnus did make big blunders in the Blitz against Duda yesterday. Is this a different Magnus we're seeing today? A lot more sharp, maybe? He looks focused. Mm. Despite the smiles uh, occasionally. The one thing I will say about Magnus, okay, Black's Queen getting active, there are some threats now. Uh, but Magnus lately in tie breaks, he's not been doing so well. He lost against Duda yesterday in the tie breaks. Norway chess, he lost nearly every uh, tie break. I think he lost four in a row, mm. uh, four in a row Armageddon matches at some point. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's not been great for him, not the usual kind of ruthless nature that we're used to. But here he's just so direct, going for checkmate, going for that Black King. Yeah, Magnus is in his element in this type of position. Yeah. He's just, uh, all his pieces are working. And uh, now just take a look at that pawn on e6. It's just bulldozing open the black position. Yeah, I mean, the black king is devoid of any defenders, really. And there are tactical issues as well with black's knight at the top of the board. It's hanging by a thread. Does Magnus take back with a pawn here? OK, I wasn't sure about this. It does allow black's pawn to move out the way. There's some defense maybe with his rooks on the seventh rank. No, I thought he would take with the Queen. Yeah, but... I think he'd take with the Queen. Looks very straightforward, but uh, still very strong. 
Or can do uh, can Ferruja fight back here? He's given a check. Gives a check. The White King m will move to the corner, and now Ferruja has to. I mean, the one one thing is that if it does get complicated when they're both under a minute, you mentioned it. Yeah. This is where Ferruja might might have his good chances. You know, he might actually uh, excel over Magnus in these comp quick complications. He doesn't have much time, though. He's played it. He's, He's played it. The Rook defending now. Oof. But so. uh, maybe you can just leave the Queen on this square in some Ooh. scenarios. <laughs> Not sure whether you want to, as Magnus, do you want to complicate things. But where does White's Queen go? If it retreats, the best you can get is a Queen trade. So I think Magnus has to give his Queen here if he wants to win this game. And I wonder what the top going on with the time, because uh, it does say that Fruz's clock has run out. I, I'm pretty sure that is not the case, but... Um, it would have been... popped up on the screen if it had. Yeah. Yes, it t would have said. OK, but he's very short then. They're both getting yeah. under 30 seconds. We know that now. Um, but what's he got to play here? He's either got to give up the Queen, which is just instinctively risky. There we go. Well, he doesn't care. He doesn't yeah. care. He's done it before. And uh, Ferruja, seconds left on the clock. It's getting complicated. Yeah, it's getting really complicated, oh. this. Coming in. this. This is messy. This is really messy. I mean, you can take so many pieces here. It just guys at home, don't look at the computer. Try and calculate this position for yourself. It's 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 a lot to calculate. Yeah. Uh, black yeah. knight is coming in. If you allow that black knight Oof. to come to f2 and check you, you will lose to what we call smothered mate. Yeah. Okay, he gets rid of the knight. That was important. Yeah. And now Magnus does give, give up, up his, his queen. queen. Wow, oh. what a variation! And he's got bishop takes here, and it looks yeah. like uh, this is the the key move, right? The killer move. That black rook in the corner is trapped. Has to give itself up for this pawn. And now Magnus will simply take this rook. It's two rooks against a queen. Normally that's imbalanced, but here it's all about that remaining white pawn. Yeah. And uh, also, checkmate will end the game. That knight drops. It's two rooks and a bishop against the queen. It's too many material, too many pieces. This one is going to be Magnus. He can give a check with his rook here. Yeah. Rode a pawn. He can just move this rook that's attacked out of the way. And uh, the, bis the bishop does a great job, doesn't it? Stopping any checks. You know, yeah. white's bishop is, is a key piece, and this is forcing uh, the win now. Yeah, Magnus makes a new queen. He's two rooks and a bishop up. One rook drops, but it won't be enough. White's king will run to safety. Got a cross check here in a lot of positions. We talked about the cross check earlier. Uh, we might see that here. Black's trying to check out of trouble, but um, it's not going to work. No perpetual here. Yeah, the checks will dry up. They'll run out in a couple of moves time. The bishop jumps back to defend. White's king will move next. The white queen will jump back and defend. And there we go. Magnus takes the first blitz game. Wow, he now takes the lead in the match. Magnus Carlsen, Ferruja, in five minutes. Blitz game number two. He has to win, Ferruja, to take it to an Armageddon tiebreak. Wow, this is a dramatic match. This one still going on. Game one, blitz with Pragnananda and Jan Christoph Duda. White pieces for Prag. The bar was uh, over to the side earlier, but it has gone down and 20 seconds for Prag. Yeah, Prag, he's always below on the clock in these uh, blitz, these rapid games somehow against Duda. It's level material. White is better. White has the advantage due to his superior rook. White's rook looking good. But maybe it can be neutralized. Maybe it can be traded off uh, in some scenarios. OK, Black's rook trying to get active as well. What do you guys think? You would choose white here, or...? I would choose white, like, 10 times out of 10. But uh, I do feel that Jan Krzysztof does have re reasonable chances of holding this. The worst is behind him, maybe. Mm. Uh, black was in trouble a bit earlier. The, yeah, the black bishop and the black rook, they combine very well in general. Rook and knight combining slightly less well. White's rook is, is lovely at the moment, though. I mean, I, I'm wondering if black should try, try to offer the exchange of rooks here, possibly, because mm -hmm. you can't allow your opponent's rook to be on that rank, cutting your king off. Uh, and if uh, so, I, I, I would also prefer to be white slightly here, but uh, time situation, they're now both on 25 seconds. So, yeah. what is Jan thinking of here? Yeah, I, I guess there are some issues. You, no, there's no issue actually. I think you should just offer that trade because so. otherwise the white pawn on b4 will kind of step one square forward and try to act, gain a square for the white knight. Jan's style though, he will want to kick away this white knight from the center using a pawn. He doesn't do that. He prefers more active moves. He, knowing him, Duda, he'll want to try and win this game. This, this though, in the long run, now if the rooks come off, it's, it's really bad, right? Because you get a horrible ending, uh, you know, now. Maybe yeah. White just wins a pawn as well. Right, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Black's bishop tries to go active. Can Prague get away with just gobbling okay. up this pawn? Do you see his body language there? Jan again is, is being very 
uh, dramatic and uh, with his language there. And White's king defending everything right now. Prague has got everything covered. He's pocketed a pawn. Yeah. Just activate the white rook now. Improve that white rook. This black rook looks active, but it's not actually doing anything. Bad positional decision there by Jan to not uh, awfully exchange your rooks here. And uh, yeah. this, is, uh, with, this is looking now like a Prague win. And uh, this is nice strategy from Prague. You know, he just centralizes his knight, and now the knight is so aggressively placed. Yeah, some threats maybe of rook checks uh, for black, for Duda. So hope is not lost, but Prague under five seconds retreating his knight. What happens if the black rook checks now? Oh, it's still yeah. anything Very happen. complicated. It's the king complex. takes a step back to attack the bishop, and I'm guessing bishop takes pawn. You might as well. <laughs> might as well. But now black's kingside pawns come at the fire as well from the white mm. rook, so white is aiming to capture them. I mean, it still seems like it's going white's way, but a uh, very strange move there, moving the king. I uh, don't understand that one. I guess uh, there was a big threat. White's rook was actually threatening to check, and uh, the black rook would have been vulnerable in some scenarios. Uh, but, OK, Black is clinging on. He's about to go two pawns down, though. And uh, yep. the players with seconds left on the clock. Oh, this is so difficult. Oh! oh! No way! Prague just blundered into checkmate in one move. What? He was winning. What a move. Unbelievable. He trapped his own king. He was winning that so easily and Turn he just around. checkmate in one. He fell for a mate in one. He self-mated himself there. He had it under control. He was oh, a pawn up, two pawns no. up, and he allowed Duda to checkmate him just with a rook and bishop. Incredible. Oh, that's heartbreak. How does he recover from this now, Prague? Will he stop for an interview? Oh, wow. Yeah, let's hear from him. Yes, sir. Yeah, looking forward to the next game. Good luck in the following game. Well, very polite. He does stop, and it looks like Duda winning this game will just stay in the arena five minutes before a blitz game number two, which will be must win for Prague. But checkmate? Oh, yeah. What happened? Can you show us, David? Yeah, we have to show this on the board. Uh, Prague was winning the end game. We mentioned Duda had misplayed it. Prague was a pawn up, he was, had a winning position, and it all started around here. Uh, maybe this, there were simpler ways. Prague decided to capture a pawn, black gave a check, the white king stepped forward, and here there's plenty of ways to win. I think you can even just step this pawn forward, step it forward again, and actually the black king is in the mating net. White's rook at some point will just step to the top of the board and game over. Uh, Prague would have won this game, but maybe one of the few losing moves. Instead, he went after this black pawn in the middle of the board. He retreated the white knight, thinking he's about to go two pawns up, but he's forgot about a simple check, and it happens, unfortunately, to be a checkmate. The white king now just trapped. Black's rook, black's bishop combine, and checkmate on the board. The white knight getting in the way of the white king's escape. Just heartbreak, tragedy. Luck for Duda, but uh, Prague now, he still has a chance to bounce back. He has to win the next game to take uh, two points, uh, or actually to take it to Armageddon. Oh, look at that devastation for Pragnananda. He was about to win the first Blitz game, but it's an immediate win for Duda. Insta instead, checkmate on the board. And that means Duda, with a draw or a win in the next Blitz game, will win the match. Uh, Duda still inside the arena. We are waiting for uh, Magnus and uh, Alireza to arrive for their second blitz game. Magnus in the lead. We see Alireza ready for. Is that Alireza Bruja? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It is. Looks he like is it. ready. Magnus, he has stopped for an interview before this game. Let's hear from him. So among this, you claimed a little nerves going into this game. Instead, you saved the craziest complications for the least time control. <laughs> yeah, sure. It was um, it was uh, very complicated there for a while. I mean, I was bossing most of the game, but then it sort of became difficult. Uh, and uh, I think I was probably always doing well, but it wasn't so hard to to calculate. But you know, good result. You feel it's close to a flawless blitz game? Mm, I don't know about that. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, seems so confident today, Magnus Carlsen, and uh, obviously in the lead in the blitz here. What do you think Galareza Ferruja is thinking about that now, David? 
He's probably trying to pick an opening, yeah. or at least try to get himself in the zone. He knows he's capable. He knows he has the white pieces as well. He's much more dangerous with white, Ferruja. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's still got chances. He's beaten Magnus before with white. He can do again. He just, uh, yeah, he looks very, very focused. Barely blinking there until that last second. Yeah. Deep in thought, what opening will it be in a must-win blitz game for Ali Reza Ferruja? Looking over his shoulder, does that mean Magnus Carlsen is arriving? Well, here he comes. Confident Magnus Carlsen, he is in the lead. If he only gets a draw or a win in this next blitz game, he will take two points in the match before that final day in the FTX Crypto Cup tomorrow, where he will play Pragnananda. It's gonna be Ferruja with the white pieces in the second blitz game. Headphones on, and we're good to go. Here we go. Okay, Kingspawn opening. Ferruja nearly always opens this way against the top players in the world. Are we gonna see an open Sicilian? No, we see White's Bishop come out. And this is something that the two players debated earlier today. And, uh, okay, slightly different take on that previous game. Still a well-known position. White's light squared Bishop saving itself. And, uh, yeah, Black's Knight coming out. Black needs to get the King castled. It's all about fighting for the center. Ferruja is going to try and break out. But Magnus, meanwhile, just trying to stifle the smile there. <laughs> uh, he's going to castle his King to safety. This is Magnus showing he means business. He's playing all his best openings. No more kind of freestyling, no more experimentation. And OK, Duda takes a bit of a... Uh, sorry, not Duda. Ferruja takes a bit of a slower approach. Yeah, I mean, Ferruja likes these kind of setups, doesn't he? I mean, he, he's one of the um, leading players, as we mentioned before, under Raul Lopez, the Spanish opening. And I expect him now to start shoving his knight over to the king side. Uh, but Magnus has a nice space hold in the middle of the board. So he only needs that draw. So he's just got to hold the position. Uh, a bit of a similar structure to what he got in the last game in some ways. Yeah. Um, can Ferruja break out? Here comes the knight and things heating up for, well, I expect a very interesting middle game. Uh, Furuza's got to bounce in the middle at some point with a break yeah. uh, to liven it up. Yeah, and uh, I think both sides are going to be happy with how this uh, opening has panned out. Magnus, you know, he's got that space advantage that he so loves on the left. And uh, he's actually keeping the position relatively closed and uh, so much tension on the board. So many possibilities. Anything can happen. Yep, anything can happen. Ferruja, meanwhile, redevelops that white light squared bishop to a slightly better diagonal, staring down at the black king, pinning a pawn. Maybe the white bishop will go into the centre of the board. We saw a very similar pattern uh, a few games ago between these two. It's just very tense. I think Ferruja's chosen a decent opening attempt, just keeping all the pieces on and maintaining the tension, just hoping that Magnus maybe gets impatient. But Magnus, in this scenario where he needs a draw, he's happy to trade off pieces. Will those light squared bishops disappear? Ferruja, one kind of good winning attempt in these must-win situations is to, to change the pawn structure. He could trade off these light squared bishops, double whites, uh, double the black pawns now. Or will he just leave things as they are? The white rook on the open file, on the A file, I quite like, but hard to achieve much with that. He just looks very relaxed, the world champion. Yeah. It does, yeah. He seems very relaxed in this tournament in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we were talking about him laughing in the first game, uh, and he's just been really chilled in the interviews as well, which is great to see. We saw the bishop go here in that other game, didn't we, quite yeah. funnily enough, but in that game, Magnus was able... I think he caught, captured it with his knight, didn't he? Yeah, he did. did. So it's a similar idea here. And, yeah. And Magnus got a very nice game from, from doing that. And, uh, well, he must be equal now. He's got all his pieces developed. He's got a bit of a space advantage. And... Um, uh, not any problems for the world champion here at the moment. Is uh, White going to do anything with this excursion on the A-line? Just looks like a one-move threat. Black's knight on that left side is threatened. You can just defend it with a rook. Uh, you can make an argument for moving it if you really need to. It is one open file, but if that's it that Ferruja can uh, kind of claim as activity, then it shouldn't be enough. I wouldn't be surprised if the rook next to Magnus's king kind of swings across. It's actually very difficult to find a plan for Ferruja because any pawn breaks, doesn't, they don't really help his position. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, David, it's not, diff it's not easy to kind of take control of the A-line and do something with it. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, Magnus probably has a relatively straightforward plan. 
and that is just to consolidate and then maybe at the right time push forward with uh, f7 f5 <laughs> Yeah, it's such that point ever. Ah. Really? I mean, I, I would have thought he, he could do the similar plan we mentioned before, take the bishop, move the knight back and, and throw the f-pawn up the board, no? I mean, isn't that a Maybe if you nice take way the bishop, if, uh, if he wants to play for the win, then this is what he would do. Yeah, uh, and now... He needed I, a draw, I'm surprised he's taking risks. Though. Yeah, but now the f-pawn at least is ready, I mean, mm. to go. I mean, yeah. this, this, this looks quite, quite normal, I guess, in some ways, though, I mean... Yeah. But you'd be a bit scared about this, would you, David, just for changing the structure? It doesn't look great. And now it's easier for white to control the A file. I mean, it's still, there's nothing wrong with it, clearly, for black. Uh, objectively, it's just a matter of taste. But it is risky. It's riskier than just kind of sitting on the position and doing nothing, which Magnus could have done. And lower on the clock, Faruja, almost one minute up. Hmm. Needs to somehow get the white pieces active. As you mentioned, black's pawns are coming, so you need to get those white minor pieces rearranged at some point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe the white queen can swing across to the corner just to completely dominate the A-file. So tense. Yeah, Magnus is happy. It is him against the teenagers now, and it is Magnus in the lead. If he only gets a draw in this game, he will win the match, and it's... Uh for Prague as well to make a comeback against Duda. But the bar actually right now yeah. over to Prague's side in that game. And the bar now shifts side in this one. I was surprised by this move because I thought Ali Reza's last move with the queen actually prevented this pawn push because now there's like maybe ideas of playing bishop takes pawn and uh, unleashing some uh, hidden attacks. Yeah, a lot of calculation to yeah. be done. Faruja, can he go for a direct tactic? And uh, maybe while he thinks here while he calculates this, shall we... OK, we will see a move from mm -hmm. Faruja. OK, this is odd. He, we're looking at Faruja's screen right now. It looks like he's clicked his rook in the middle of the board. It looks like he's about to swing it across the whole way to the left, maybe. Tr trying to guess his move here. He needs to move quickly because he spent a lot of time on this one move. A minute now, uh, almost, for Faruja. And he's going to go for the tactic you mentioned there, Yavanka. He does give up the white bishop temporarily. This bishop will be captured, otherwise Magnus has just lost a pawn. And then there will be a discovered check. Uh, white's pawn in the middle. OK, Magnus did blunder this. I think Magnus just took his eye off the ball for one second. This is the type of thing I just... I don't know, it feels like Magnus is playing for the win, but he only needs the draw. Mm. Taking risks. Yeah. Well, the position suddenly has gotten a little bit wild. So many things to calculate. And... Uh, so... that white queen on the same diagonal as yeah. the black king. Like, he, I don't know. He could have tucked his king in the corner. That's what I would away. have done. <laughs> yeah, that black king now is vulnerable. Yeah, and the more tactical it gets, obviously, the better chances white has. I mean, uh, yeah, if it looks like you're right, David, this, this idea was a bit risky. I mean, but the last move was actually just a blunder, I think. Mm. And uh, uh, Magnus not, not happy with the way things are gone. You don't want to, even if black's OK here, you don't want to enter into complications um, in these types of positions against especially... Uh, Ferruja, so uh, it's a chance of a playoff coming up here, maybe. And here we go, Ooh. tactics on the board. Chaos, and no, White is it one piece down. He did unleash this discover check with his queen. He just sacrificed a second piece, uh, but now he wins the black rook. And what is the material count? Black has a bishop and a knight for White's rook. There are pawns all over the place. This knight jump, suddenly a discovered attack. Black's rook is hitting the white queen. White's Oof. queen can move, though. A few choice of squares. Very strange material imbalance here. I mean, uh, Farouz has got to risk it and he's got to be happy with uh, sort of imbalanced material because you need that when you need to win. I mean, you could maybe even swap the queens off here when you've got a lot of pawns on the queen side, but mm. don't underestimate black's pawns as well. And black's got the two minor pieces against the rook, which can coordinate extremely well together. So uh, what do you do with the queen here? I, I, I you know, I, I, can you give the queen up somehow? I can't see how you can give the queen up. I think you just got to, you know, play it in front of the rook here and, and do something like that, maybe, or... Yeah, maybe mm. or yeah, step it next to the black queen, yeah. uh, offer a trade in that way. I mean, it's so complicated. Incredibly complex. Yeah, I mean, Magnus, did he blunder this or did he calculate it? Uh, either way, it seems to have worked out just about all right for him. And uh, Ferruja now under on the clock. But this is the most he could have asked for, <laughs> Ferruja, from the position he had. Just chaos, just tactics. It's normally suiting his style, this type of thing. Yeah, this position is uh, just insane, actually. I'm not even sure who is better, to be honest. I mean, anything can happen. The, the white pawns can get motoring up the board. 
the black pieces could coordinate very well. But uh, either way, one thing for sure, probably white needs to trade off the queens. Yeah, yeah I mean, black pawns in the middle can be very dangerous yeah. soon as well. So, you, you, you know, when, when little things like this happen, tempo is so important. You don't want to lose tempo in these little exchanges uh, if you can help it, because uh, every tempo lost gives your opponent that chance to gain the initiative. Okay. Um, so I don't know where the queen goes here. Why has Ferruja clicked on his rook at the bottom of the board? Uh, you can see the piece that's highlighted is his rook at the bottom, but his queen is attacked on the top rank. So he can't move that piece. Why has he clicked on it? It's bizarre. Unless there's some crazy tactic that I don't see. Well, it's, I'm, it's I'm a bit worried also about his clock time because he's ticked to under 45 seconds. Yeah, he needs to move that white queen. Nothing else to do. He's he does it. finally he's retrieve his white queen. Yeah. Okay. Black bishop attacked. <laughs> he's just, yeah, he's just clicking on the rook randomly. Yeah. It's, a, it's a bit bizarre. Why did you do that there? Yeah. Risking mouse slips there. Yeah, mouse slips horrible. Maybe this is a good choice of square. Yeah. The white queen, uh, yeah, helping to attack the black pawn next to her. And what a mess this position is now. I mean, uh, there's a material imbalance, and there goes another pawn in the center. Um, who, who, who's got the better? Is the rook stronger than the knight and bishop, or are the knight and bishop going to coordinate? That pawn looks incredibly strong as well. <laughs> God, two squares from queening. Uh, these guys, they, they have such fun games. <laughs> I can it's see why. Boring between these yeah. yeah, I can see why Magnus wanted to play Ferruja in the World Championships because yeah. you can imagine the chaos that would uh, would erupt in those tactical encounters. Imagine commentating on that. That would be so fun. Yeah, be brilliant. Under 20 sec 15 seconds actually for Ali Reza Ferruja. You need to keep an eye on that dangerous pass pawn that black has and gosh this position is so crazy it, it looks like white's now centralized and white's maybe got the better control here right i mean he's keeping an eye on that black pass pawn if that pawn goes and surely white's better white's rooks are uh, roaming free as well and black's minor pieces they can't really move right you can't move the bishop that much, I don't think. I say that, so <laughs> I'm not even sure. You can't move the knight that well. So I, I think white is now uh, the favorite in this one. Could be going to the Armageddon. And look at the clock. clock time, three oh seconds. Three and seconds, wow, I didn't see that. <laughs> so. uh, he did not lose on time, <laughs> Ferruja there. Three seconds, okay, the queens are just coming off. There's a big threat of checkmate if black's rook comes down to the bottom of the board. But no, white's king now has breathing space. Really nice move there from Ferruja, creating breathing space, trying to undermine the defender of the Black Knight. I mean, we know that Ferruja is so good when he's got no time on the clock, but he's the only player I think you could handle having no time on the clock. No one else in the world could play this position with seconds no, on the clock. Especially not against Magnus. So the material count right now, White has a rook and two pawns for Black's knight and bishop. So White has a small material advantage. The rook and two pawns worth seven, the knight and bishop worth six but it's chaos. And look at this from Magnus, mm. pushing pawns, giving up more pawns. White now has three extra pawns. And, uh, OK, yeah. where's this knight jumping to? Some nasty knight forks threatened. But I, I reckon that he's, his whole idea with pushing Harry up the board is he wants to set up a dangerous mating net. He wants to put that king under pressure. And suddenly, you just see he's just up the pace. Yeah, and White's rook retreating. The black rook is now going to try and get active. And uh, I just like where the knight and bishop are right now. They're great uh, on great squares. They can't be kicked around, but it's all about those two white pawns. is just running with them, sprinting with those two up the board. They might decide this game. Yeah, yeah has black got enough counterplay uh, against white's king? I don't think so. And here comes the b-pawn. Uh, Barry is coming. Barry mm -hmm. is going to queen himself. And there's a knight fork in the position, but that is easy to run away from. Um, Black Knight, if it centralizes, it feels like Magnus was trying to hustle Ferruja on the yeah. clock, but Ferruja survived and now has nearly 20 seconds. And the, and the plan now for White is very simple. You just try to queen the pawn, push that pawn, get a queen. So Magnus has got to go for these tricks as such here. Um, but I don't know, those pawns looking too good now. Yeah. Barring a massive turnaround, we are heading for Armageddon yeah. in this clash. Look at the two White Rooks as well, combining. Barry the B-pawn is just running. How do you stop it from yeah. marching up the board? You it's can't. You have to try to set up some counter-attack, but that's very difficult. And so Magnus is trying. So his idea is to relocate the bishop to the D4 square so he can attack the pawn. But that is not going to work. Yeah, it's not really going to work. White's rook retreating. Bit of a mysterious one there. 
A uh, bit of an odd choice of square. Now Black's bishop most likely. Oh, look nice. at the bar! Yeah, yep. I think maybe that was a mouse slip from Ferusha. Yeah. It would have made sense to bring yeah. the white rook to this square immediately. He lost a move there. It could be. It could be. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, he's lost a very important tempo there. Because if it's his move now, he can move the other pawn. But yeah. can Magnus create more problems here? I mean, can he do something with the knight now? Maybe. Potentially. The bishop and rook are very well placed. Um, start attacking the knight. And here he comes with the knight, and the knight is now ready to jump in, maybe opening up the white king a little bit more. Magnus is back in the game yet again here. That one little mouse slip there. That knight now jumping forwards looks like the natural move to play. Ah, oh, I mean, it's so tense, but okay, he comes another way. So, surprising. Odd. Okay, he's really going for this white rook. Uh, Ferruja, sneaky there, lifts his rook to the top of the board, and oh, this could win a piece now for white. Both the black knight and black bishop are attacked. Magnus had to give up his bishop. Now, pawns on the same side of the board. This should be a win for white. It should. Black's pawns are just too loose. Yeah, and you've got, you've got two rooks here as well, haven't you, to, to annoy Black's position. And, uh, um, yeah, this is this is simplifying somewhat, but this has been up and down, hasn't it? I mean, Armageddon looks so lightly now. Oh. Rooks are off the board. Black needs a miracle. The Black Knight needs to find a better square before it's too late. Yeah, this yeah. one should be a win for white. White's rook be. is clearly better than that Black Knight. Still some hope because knights are very crafty pieces and it can jump forward to give a check and that's what's happened. Has he just lost his pawn? Yeah, he has. Look at Ferruja, oh, wow. he just leaned back and put his hand on his head. What's going on? He just lost a pawn for free. Oh, Suddenly, yeah. no more easy <laughs> win. This is a fight. How He just gave away a pawn for free. Walked into a check. It was the clock, I think, that played a big factor there. Black's king will step back. White's remaining pawn is under fire as well. This one... Oh, wow. wow. This is oh. so hard because the, the knight is actually separated far away from the king. Mm -hmm. This and is a very nice move. I mean, you've got to, yeah, like you say, Yvanka, the way, the way you've got to try to win this one is keep the black knight away from the black king, right? But it gets back. The black knight is coming back. It's going to use its pawns to protect it. And suddenly, who's playing for the win? <laughs> suddenly, <laughs> Magnus, if Alareza Ferruja doesn't kind of pull the handbrake, uh, Magnus has chances. Only. I think that he's out of danger. There was a checkmate threat there. Black's king, as long as he doesn't walk into a checkmating net, he shouldn't lose any more Magnus. He just needs to get his knight back into the game. Still some chances for white, though, because the, the black knight is sidetracked at this moment in time. The black king is also stuck on the back rank, so you, 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 you can certainly push for the win here. Uh, if you can just get that knight, of course, it's going to be winning for white. Uh, but... Here it comes, back towards the king. This is what Magnus needs to do, and I think he's going to do it. If he gets the black knight next to the black king, it's a pretty simple technical draw, and I think he's done that now. He's got the black knight next to the king. There you go. This is, this is a draw. The, the king can just look after the knight now. You can see he relaxed there, body language as well. Uh, Magnus is obviously very confident in this position. Um, keep the knight near the king. The king can defend the knight. You've got to watch out for, obviously, the obvious blunders, but... It's, uh, he, he's held it yeah, remarkably. The, the problem here, the reason white can't win is you can never get your king opposite the black king. Black's knight will always check your way. As soon as you go one way with the white king, the black king will go the other way. And yeah, the black knight is just a perfect defender. Look how it blocks the checks, stopping the white king from moving. And there we go, it's a draw and Magnus takes today's match. Wow, what a fight between these two, a handshake. And it's over, Magnus takes the two points, he wins the match, one point for Ferruja. We also did see Prague lose his match against Jan Christoph Duda. But it's still gonna be dramatic tomorrow, you guys. Nothing is decided. It can still be Magnus Carlsen, it can still be Prague Nananda. It can maybe also still be Alireza Ruja. Trying to do the maths, yeah. I don't think he can catch up. We'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah. Magnus, you, you said at one point that if you were to play a world championship match, you would hope it would be against Ferusha. Is this the kind of match, or these the kind of games that you would hope for then? Yeah, um, not really, because I was under pressure the whole time. Um, I, feel, I, feel, I feel like I've had the same thing against him like a couple of times in Norwich's already. Um, either Blitz games or in that case Armageddon games that um, um, that just get, get way out of hand. Um, 
Actually, I just blundered early on. Um, I thought I didn't see that he had um, knight takes c4 when he uh, when he did. I thought he had to take with the pawn. Then I moved the bishop, and whatever the evaluation may be, I thought it was just a very complicated position where it's at least playable. Uh, and uh, yeah, after what happened, I thought it was quite a bit worse. Uh, and after I exchanged queens, I was hoping I was surviving, but then he wins the third pawn. I couldn't see how to to get on after that. Uh, and uh, at some point, I was just dead lost. Uh, but, um, you know, <laughs> you fight till the end. Games with a lot of complication, is it motivating? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, it's not maybe the kind where I have the biggest edge sometimes but you know right now I enjoy it a lot strive towards complicated games most of the time and I'm successful at least um, enough to be leading the tournament you have your destiny in your own hands you play Pragnananda tomorrow what do you think about that match uh, I don't know what happened in his last game like he he won he lost, he lost the tie break uh, he lost the tie break so that means he has to uh, so that means if I make it make the tie break tomorrow, then I'm beating both Alareza and uh, Prague. So that's good to know. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, Magnus has uh, done the math, but basically has it own in, in his own pocket now. That's what yeah. we need to know. So in the rapid games, if he makes 2-2, two -two, uh, whatever happens in the tie breaks, Magnus is the winner. Yeah. Uh, Prague just needs to beat him in those four rapid games. Yeah. And uh, it is uh, a little bit thanks to uh, young Christoph Duda, who was able to win his match against uh, Pragnananda today. Let's hear it from Duda. It ended up being extremely dramatic in the playoffs here, but how would you summarize it all? Yeah, it's pretty disgusting. I can win the one match. I mean, getting to tiebreak is something that's uh, I, I mean, today and yesterday as well. I mean, it's. Um, no, it's uh, it totally sucks, but um, of course it's nice to um, to win in playoff after such blows. And what was the feeling when you saw Prague blunder at the end of that first extra game? Uh, yeah, it was very unfortunate because it was basically the only blunder, like a serious one. So yeah, but it happens. Like um, it's a big game after all. You looked very, very frustrated at the end of game four. You were sitting almost laughing in your chair. Um, how is how do you come back and play the Blitz games after being so so saddened about your game? No, I was indeed very annoyed because, um, OK, I got very, um, I, I mean, crap after the opening. But um, still, I, I thought I sort of managed to um, you know, to escape and then, I mean, played one stupid move and which didn't work tactically and, I mean, my game was busted. Uh, and, um, yeah, it was, it was, of course, very, very annoying and um, there is no solution, you know, <laughs> how, to, how to approach, I mean, such, such state mind, um, state of mind, like, um, but in Blitz, at least, it's short time control, so it's um, it definitely benefits me. No time to dwell. Congratulations, Jan Shisa. Thank you. He's a strong finisher, Jan Christoph Duda. Won his match in Blitz tie breaks against Magnus Carlsen yesterday and today against Pragnananda, winning both Blitz games to take the two points. One point for Prague. And uh, Magnus Carlsen, well, he's a demon in Blitz. Winning the first game against Ali Reza Vruja was enough to take the two points in the match. One point for Ali Reza Vruja. So, after six rounds with only one round to play in the FTX Crypto Cup, this is the situation. Magnus Carlsen in the lead with two points to Pragnananda on 13. And these two play each other tomorrow. Alireza Vruja is three points behind, but uh, he will not be able to win the tournament. It is Magnus or Prague, and they are up against each other tomorrow. Look at that. All eyes will be on that battle. 32-year-old Magnus Carlsen against 17-year-old Pragnananda to win the FDX Crypto Cup. Oh my wow. Simon, what do you expect from that fight? The winner of that match will be the winner of the tournament, basically. Yeah, 
That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, what more can be said? It's going to be a, a brilliant day yeah. tomorrow. I mean, Prague was my tip at the start, so I've got to, I've got to stick with that. And if it is it, again, it's in his, his hands now, which is what you want. You don't have to rely on any other results. You know, if you win, if you play your best chess, you might win. You can win the whole thing. You can beat. I mean, what better way beating the world champion? to win yeah. that that is the way you want to win right so uh tomorrow is gonna be great oh, yeah looking Brilliant forward to day. it and we've seen magnus be a little shaky these two last days uh yeah, what definitely. chances do you give prague um I, I yeah i think prague has very good chances but he just has to contain his excitement his nerves and he has to not worry about the result and just go there and do what he does yeah. best play fantastic chess what a day it's uh, going to be. These uh, players will need all the support they can get from around the world, from their fans. And uh, you guys were great today on Twitter supporting your uh, biggest idols. And we have to pick a winner. We do have to pick a winner, unfortunately. But thank you to everyone that sent in a selfie. And we have to announce the winner. It is Thomas Lehman. He said, go Magnus, amazing games. And also said like amazing commentary. And uh, thank you for cheering for Magnus. And and you are the winner for one year's Chess24 Premium Membership. Yeah. Great job, you guys. And uh, keep them coming tomorrow. Final day of the FTX Crypto Cup in Miami. It's going to be Magnus or Prague. And they face each other in the Miami arena with spectators following the drama. We are ready, as always, at 5.45 CET. We'll see you then. Thanks for following. Bye.